Good morning, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Catfish and Crappie. Today, we are doing the Catfish Co-op. I want to welcome everybody for showing up. Uh, real quick, let's see who's in chat. We got, uh, let me see, go through the participants. Uh, looks like we got Lyle from Catfish Weekly, Mo Creek Fishing, James Dockery. Uh, I see Get Hooked on D Fishing. What's going on, D? Fishing with the Chad. What's up, my friend? Uh, I also saw Rob from Missouri Creek Fishing. Ernie Brown was in there. Uh, Ryan Bortz even stopped in to say good luck on his way to fish. So, uh, so today we have the bus driver, Jeremy Dufour. Fishing from the Mississippi River in the great state of Louisiana. Yeah, baby. And we have the the man himself, Tim Scott. So would you call it Central Illinois, Tim? I would call it North Central Illinois. North Central I, Illinois, Mr. I am Tim Scott. Much in the middle middle of like a million acres of corn and beans. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Tim Scott of Epic Catfish, man. Thank you guys for joining us today. So uh, pretty much what we're going to do is we're going to be fishing alongside Mr. Dufour, Creole Catfishing, and see what we can get done. During the whole time, we're going to have some pretty technical high-end talk about catfishing, which I'm really looking forward to. Tim, how about you? Yeah, I'm always up for that. <laughs> I don't doubt that one bit. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, you don't even have your baits in the water yet, do you, buddy? Casting my rods right now. All right. Send it, Send it Jeremy. So I know up here we got some pretty chilly weather. I know it's one degree here. I think it's really close to that where you're at, right, Tim? Yeah. We don't have water that looks like that. It looks like flat and white. White, covered in snow. Yeah. <laughs> it looks cold, <laughs> to, to, and to make it as simply put as possible. Yeah. So I'm pretty jealous of Jeremy right now. He gets to fish. There's a lot of people out there fishing today. So uh, 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 good luck to everybody. And uh, uh, I'm just wishing I was one of them. So I'm I'm jealous, but completely happy for him because that's exactly. I mean, wow. A absolutely. Great to be fishing right now. Y'all <laughs> threw our baits. Yeah. Just checking out the chat. Chad says, Jeremy, you would love it if it was white and icy right where you're at. No, no, I would not. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> A little camera view. It, this one's our monster bait right here. How, how big is, oh, well, there's your hand. Okay, I was going to say. How big that shad is, and I cut a good bit of his tail off, but I got that on a uh, double hook rig, two twelve volt Dale tackle hooks. Hey, here's a full size Galaxy phone next to that yeah, bait. It's a big bait. That's a big there bait. We go. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> big baits. I know, I know, Mr. Lyle Stokes and Chad. He likes those big baits too. And what kind? What kind of weight you got in there to keep that big bait down in that strong current, Jeremy? Sixteen ounce lead weight. Sixteen ounces. Pound of weight, a pound of bait. I see Justin come in the chat. What's going on, Justin? How are you? What's up, Jesse from Outdoors Addiction? Flint Hill Cat Fishing. What is going on? Uh, Dale Hayslip. What's going on, Dale? Welcome to the chat. See, I, think are, I, I think I've seen those names before. Yeah, a lot of them are uh, uh, either regulars on a lot of the chats or they have really good YouTube channels. Um, one one to, that comes very much to mind is, is Flint Hills. If you like... Uh, uh, catfishing out of a kayak uh he catches some pretty big catfishing and the man loves to eat on his his videos so uh he's kind of getting known for that country boy catfishing just showed up as well so what are we going to expect what do you think we what do you think we have to expect today tim it's hard to tell we just talked with jeremy about his situation he's got uh, a hard rise he's got a lot of debris and garbage coming down he is in a good spot though i think he picked a great uh area to do it all right and he's fishing for blues today how are blues different than than flathead when targeting them that's one of my first questions since i'm so unexperienced with blue cats. okay they're pretty much uh different it's almost night and day so uh Flatheads like that mid-depth situation, <clears throat> and they like probably the slowest current out of the three main species. I am getting a little bit of reverberation here. Maybe I just take that. There we go. I was getting uh, my own voice kind of kicking back. That's okay. That, that's that echo okay, I was so, telling you about. We can take care uh, of that. How's that? Better? Yeah. So okay. flatheads in a 
more of a, a slow water situation, they'll actually sit on those deep ledges. Whereas you get a natural river like what Jeremy's fishing, and that happens a lot less. Now, this time of year, his water is probably 50, 51, 52 degrees. So that kind of puts flatheads in that semi limbo state where they're going to actually be nice to each other, which, which doesn't happen <laughs> no. uh, during the warmer period. So that, that actually uh, uh, sometimes increases your, your chances of catching numbers of fish because they're, going to, uh, th they're not going to separate their, their, their population. So in the basin holes where it's more comfortable for flatheads to sit and it, it appeases their, their fish brain and they, it, it feels all, they, they're, they're not so uh, upset that another one might be kind of cruising in next to it. So you can get spots, you know, little basin holes, maybe 30 foot deep, maybe even 40 or 50 foot deep, especially when you're down by Jeremy, uh, that uh, they're accepting of each other. And if you're at the right bite window, I mean, I, I've, I've actually catch, caught uh, some of the uh, highest numbers on a single anchor in those situations. Early season, when they come out of their wintering situation, late season. The problem with late season is up here, we don't have a huge population of flatheads. So they're going to be few and far between. So you've got to really cover some water or get lucky to get onto a basin hole situation because there's 100 basin holes, but there's only about four you know, in maybe a couple miles of a river that's going to be acceptable to them. So it, it's it's a little bit of work, but it it pays off pretty heavy when you get in those situations. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I I have I, I I stumbled across a wintering hole up here on the on the Fox that I don't tell anybody about. I leave them lay all winter, yep. and then I wait for them to come out in the spring, and I go back. But I, I've actually physic I've I've seen with my own eyes the situation you're talking about, and the fox being such a shallow shallow river, you know. And in the winter, the water gets really clear. You'll able you're able to see it. So I, I kind of leave them there. Is it true that they're not going to bite in the winter? <clears throat> depends. Depends on where you're at. Depends on, uh, in my experience, and talking with a lot of people that do it. You've got that northern tier, which ends about middle Illinois and goes across the United States, but yet it kind of curves up on the east and the west coast. Mm -hmm. So that instead of just a straight line going across, it actually dips down, and then there's a range up the east and the west coast because you have ocean effect weather that comes in on each coast. So, you know, like everybody, well, not everybody knows, but uh, like where, where I'm at right now and where you're at, um, like has life and chunky and all those guys are actually north of us, mm -hmm. but yet their weather is so much nicer so much because they nicer, have all that yeah. stuff. So they're able to catch uh, blues and sometimes flatheads. Oh, Jeremy's got one going. Oh, I'm going to do that a hundred times. I can't. Oh, that's help. okay. I'm going to give him when that happens. I'll give him the solo screen if if it uh, moves okay. forward. It, 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 see here, here I was looking at you and I saw that out of the corner of my eye. Just like I, I, was, I saw that too. I was like. There it is. <laughs> I saw him a bunch of too. imaginary bites today. He's keeping an eye on that. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. The imaginary. It's it's the one you you wish for a bite. So man, that's not working. You wish for a bite so much out of the corner of your eye, you're like, there it was. Oh no, it wasn't. Like, well, ah. I've stared at rods long enough where I swear I see them moving. Yep. Where they start to bow. Yep. In your mind. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're like. Oh. Oh no, it wasn't. All right. So, so I imagine, I imagine the, the Great Lakes here has an effect oh. on that whole weather bow that you're kind of talking about in the in the state yeah, area as well. I think it does. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of things, but I think it's that westerly wind. So you've got on the west coast, you've got wind that pushes up in the wintertime, and then you've got wind that's coming down out of Canada, and I believe that it swoops down in the middle part of the country and goes back up closer to, you know, New York and Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And that's kind of a prevailing situation that we get. And uh, yeah, it affects uh, fish, fish behavior and fish patterns and, and what they've done. Because I mean, it, depending on how long that uh, weather pattern has been prevalent, uh, you know, it could really affect their, their nature at a biological level, believe it or not. I'm still watching those rods. I feel like I'm getting hypnotized. Hey, we got Jonathan from uh, 
Hooked Catfish, what's going on, Jonathan? Thanks for checking it out. I see uh, uh, Justin's Fishing Fetish showed up. Uh, Mr. Josh Monarch, welcome, welcome. Um, hopefully, you guys will enjoy it. Hang around for a little while. Uh, getting all sorts of messages all of a sudden, so apparently people are liking what we're doing. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I want to make sure I uh, uh, give those people a shout-out. And, and, uh, Don't interrupt me anytime, because I'm sure I'll interrupt other people. I get all excited if you haven't seen any of my live stuff yet. And, I and I've watched a little bit yesterday to try to remind myself that I can wait. <laughs> <laughs> I get a little overexcited about stuff. So um, I see that jeremy is in the trash line which a lot of times you have to be in the trash line because that's you know it'll shift those fish over from all the way around in that main current mm -hmm. and then as after the water goes down to normal of course they'll start spreading out but he's on that beginning peak that thing where the water's coming up he's on that beginning peak which will shift fish over towards the bank for a short period of time until they get acclimated to it before they'll start spreading throughout the river again and a lot of guys get uh they, they get kind of confused on that. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people on the phone and they're like, what is going on? The water comes up. I go over towards the bank. We do really well. But then, you know, two days after that, they're not there anymore, even though the water didn't drop. I said they get acclimated and then they start spreading back throughout the river. It's kind of an amazing thing, actually. Well, real quick before you go any farther, you had mentioned the trash line. I use a trash line to identify seams. They're pretty much gives a define detail to, to where that seam is are you telling me that not only is it be, they're there because of the seam but they're there because of the the actual trash in that seam as well well it and that that would just be uh speculation but if you think about how current moves dead dead fish regular fish you know live fish if you've got a trash line usually somewhere around there is this is, is fish are going to be located somewhere around a trash line, especially okay. if the bottom contour, if I get this right, especially if the bottom contour does some of this. If it does that and has some side slopes, you've got a situation where uh, those fish can position any which way they want. Now, I'm not saying that that fish want to be have their face into a trash line because if you have eelgrass coming down, uh, a lot of times you have to get out of that type stuff. You mm -hmm. know, I always say fish don't like hula skirts. Is, you know, you got your lines going down, you got all that eel grass building up, and you've got a clump, you know, the size of a soda can on that. They they don't they don't really love that. They don't love having just garbage coming in their face. Coming in and hitting their face. A lot well, of times you gotta move out of that line or inside that line. And that makes if, sense because I guess their snout's pretty much more their most sensitive part of their body, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And if it's getting bombed with garbage all day, they're they're not gonna stay in that position. Exactly. Too. So that that'd be uh, what do they call that on a tornado when when you have all the debris? It's the debris field. Yeah, we we don't. Yeah, yeah we're, we're not real fond of that either. You know, dust and, and stuff. You know, bombarding our faces. Snow, ice. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't miss the days when I was younger, and I would go out there as many times as I could and I would get caught in sleet storms or hail or any of that stuff, you know, and I, I'm the captain of the boat. I have no choice. I got to put my face into it. I mean, mm -hmm. and I have a big windshield to duck. I mean, it's just pelting you like, like gravel. And uh, with a jet, if you're running shallow water, there is no hiding from that. It's face into it and you're getting pelted. And I, I finally, got a little smarter and uh, started bringing safety glasses because the bugs and the all that stuff I mean talk about the Fox River you fished the Fox River I fished the lower Fox a lot and that's one of the buggiest places I've ever fished so as soon as you're ready as soon as the sun you know the sun's already down or evening or you know you got to get back through all the crazy rocky water yeah you're going to take some gnats to the eye yeah, absolutely. Uh, Flint Hill Catfishing. Doesn't the trash current seam take the basic shape you see on top of the water underneath down to the river bottom too? Does that make sense? Uh, I think it does. A little bit. Is, because, is it yeah. nearing what's on the bottom of the water, I guess, is what he's asking, which hopefully I, that's correct. I don't, I don't think so in a, a literal sense. I think in a 
and if you've talked to Brian, Brian's a very smart guy. And so mm -hmm. he's thinking about things in a pretty, pretty high, uh, you know, Level. yes, he is. And, and so, so let's just talk about this current scene that you're seeing a trash debris field kind of go all the way down that water slice, like in Jeremy's thing. Mm -hmm. So you've got basically a slower amount of current and then you've got a faster amount of current and they're actually rub, they're, they're actually passing each other. So that creates that friction. And so, and nobody thinks of water having friction, but it certainly does. And so anytime you've got a slower amount and, and everybody just calls them current seams, which that's pretty much what they are, but do they exist? And that's what I think Brian is asking. Do they exist all the way to the bottom like that? I think in a, if, if a guy was gonna draw it, I think sometimes it does, but sometimes it's gonna do a curve. Curve. Sometimes it's gonna, you know, it's got a lot of friction on top. And then when you have that, and Brian and I talked about this, the river underneath the river. And that, that's kind of a cool thing because you've got current flow on top. A lot of times moves faster. You got current flow on the bottom that moves slower, but then you've also got the current going this way. So it's, it's very, very uh, cool and complex, but the easiest way I think about it is whenever you've got a current scene, you've got, you've got the slower water, the faster water, is creating friction it's it's actually turning around in circles like this and it also i would think because that's what happens with air is that it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom so almost like a weird it, not not a full tornado but if you look at everything in nature when you've got that situation causing those those you know really crazy weather weather patterns it's usually and and think about this too let's just say we're in 30 foot of water so 30 foot of water every i think it's 10 feet it's another atmosphere so you're a three atmospheres the density and and all that stuff so you've you've got really dense stuff down at the bottom mm -hmm. and then as you go up it's lighter weight so i th i think that top and what we're talking about is that stuff's going to swirl around and have that trash line in a wider gap than it does at the bottom and sometimes it's going to angle this way and angle that way that right. Depending. I mean, the way I kind of like to think of it out and tell me if I'm thinking about this or the wrong way, it's, it's like when I'm looking at a bank, looking for drop offs, if I don't have sonar or something, at least back when I didn't, you know, the higher the bank, the more likely there's a drop off in the water. Yes. Kind of yes. look at it that way with the current seam. If you're looking at a current seam that's heading towards towards a bank, I like to think that that's more likely that there's a drop in there, thinking that the water comes up that drop and, and kind of angles and continues its trajectory towards, you know, its path of of the, the path it's taking up said hill. Uh, At least the water. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, th there's no doubt that uh, fish finders are really cool and advanced, but it's it can still be done. Mm -hmm. uh, where you don't have a fish finder and you can go out and still catch fish. You just got to, you know, learn to rely on your fish finder a little less, I think. I try not to rely on mine too much for two reasons. First one is um, I, I haven't had one for a real long time. Second, um, I'm still learning how to use it to its <laughs> to, to, to its full potential. So uh, uh, we're, we're getting there. I, I basically use mine. The only there. one, Mark. Yeah, I got the boat with those tournament guys down in the Tennessee River system. Uh -huh. They played that those fish finders like a musical instrument. I mean, the first thing they do is they get in there, they drop their throat, you know, they they do all their stuff. But I mean, it's do 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 do, and then there's close ups, and then there's far away, there's waypoints, there's this, that, and the other. I'm like a a school child when it comes to mine. I go like this and like this and you know i've got two screens usually just the down imaging and then the 2d and that's pretty much what i do and i mean well you know I 2D, only down imaging and 2d are, are pretty safe bets as far as you ask me if you're over the fish chances are you're going to catch them get over those fish you're going to be all right side scan works well for me um to help me get over to those spots where I'm going to be over them. I find mm -hmm. structure that way. Uh, I can pretty much tell where there's a drop or a hole with it. But but other than that, yeah, 2D and, and uh, um, uh, standard uh, sonar is, is pretty much my bread and butter. So I'm I, use, pretty good this. I use mine side by side because mm -hmm. sometimes the down imaging mm -hmm. – uh, oh no, the 2D. Sometimes the 2D 
will show me things that look more like fish and they're not. In, unless it's a single fish, you know, sitting out there. Mm -hmm. If it's maybe a clump of fish or maybe there's some wood involved or whatever. So I'll reference that one to say, okay, right. so we've got wood and then we've got some fish that are not as big as they appear over here. But if I, and, and I, I mainly use that, the, the straight up 2D to tell me whether those fish are in active feeding positions or not. And I talked about that in another live channel and people are really kind of eating that up because mm -hmm. they, they haven't thought about that. And I don't know if it's just something that, uh, you know, I've become accustomed to, maybe I've got my settings just right. And, you know, sometimes I'll take that, that uh, the, the 2D and I'll actually reduce the sensitivity far enough to where I don't mark anything but 30 pound fish or anything but 20 pound fish and over. It's kind of a big advantage because you can really start to, uh, you know, if, if your sensitivity's up, you, of course the fish show up more bold and bigger and all this stuff. So I turn my sensitive way down. But to do that, you have to get on a spot mm -hmm. where you're pretty certain there is bigger fish. Cause otherwise if, if you, or just say they're only bigger fish, and you do that now you're not even going to see the bigger ones so you got to get into a spot where you know you, you're going to see two three four five ten fifteen twenty pound fish and not too many big ones mm -hmm. and it's 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 kind of uh and i don't do it all the time uh, but if, if i'm down in big catfish i mean big big catfish waters i will do that i uh use my 2d versus my 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 legacy store or my my three my high definition sonar versus my standard sonar um the 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 old school standard sonar will show you um uh soft returns and the new 3d will show you hard returns and when you combine those pictures when you're in in, in your mind thinking about it you can definitely deviate what's a fish and what's not at least that's how i do it also um my sensitivity i'm looking for more defined um uh, images because I spend a lot of time looking for bait rather than I do actual fish. Mm -hmm. And I found in my experience, at least where I fish, that that's a little better than me looking for big fish because big fish are on the move. And when you're down scanning, whether it's, you know, high def or, or whether it's the standard, that, that that's an image in history. So if I can get a decent picture of bait fish and I know they're staying there, I kind of compare it to an ice fishing sonar. I know that there's usually fish that are, are near there, predators that are near there, whether it's catfish or, or any of the other fish that I chase. Um, so that's kind of how I go about it. Now, once you start getting into some of this, uh, the new 360 imaging stuff and, and the live scope, that might change the game a little bit. But I try to keep in mind that what you're looking at is a history of what's there and maybe even gone. And, and that's why hmm. I, I look more for structure. See, I, and, I and don't look at it that way, Mark, mm -hmm. because I'm fishing, I'm fishing areas that are <clears throat> likely to hold fish for a long period of time. Okay. That makes sense. So if, if I'm, if I'm in a fish areas that are transition or travel areas, I do look at it like that. Okay. Because if you have fish moving through, but the one thing about, blues flatheads and channel cats they don't seem to like just straight up fly uh, there are some that do i mean you can be in an area you're not marking anything underneath the boat and all of a sudden you see fish moving under you know underneath your screen like this but a lot of times i'm fishing spots that are, are like um they going to work kind of like the coffee shop if you get what i mean mm-hmm they're hanging People out travel to the coffee shop. They're hanging out. They're eating some donuts They're doing whatever. They're hanging out there for a while and they're kind of grouping up and then some of them will move. So I'm a lot of times I don't look at it as much as I'm as I'm using my electronics. I'm not losing looking at it like, well, if I mark a big fish, he's going to be gone by the time I get there. And some guys do think that because mm -hmm. some of those, uh, especially blue cats, They'll get in that that moving frenzy to where yeah they'll 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 you know look at a whole area they'll set up on it and fish are gone and usually usually that's because they and in my experience not everybody I, I can't tell you what happens all around the world but usually if that happens to me I've set up in an in an, in an area so that if I'm up here 
and the bottom slopes like this. Mm -hmm. And let's just say I've got 10 or 12 fish hanging around on at the bottom of this drop and at various locations up that front because I've got current coming this way. We've got the river on the river, so I've got slower water down this drop. But still, these fish have got to, if they, if the, if I'm marking them underneath the boat like this, if they're going up underneath the boat, they're on the move. It's not just lackadaisical. They're, I've, I've got there right when they decided to get up out of their slumber spot. They're, they're done. They're leaving the coffee shop. Yes, yes. Yep. So they're leaving the coffee shop, but now they're going to the steakhouse. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're browsing a little bit here. Now they're going for the the beef so um when that happens i know that i have a shot at actually missing some of those fish because i've set up on them it's let's just just for ease sake say it's a uh, 7 30 in the summertime and we know that from 7 30 to 9 30 that bite probability gets a lot higher i mean you know in the middle of the day it's about like this you yeah get on absolutely whatever. sometimes it's great uh but the pop the probability is going to be right before dark to right after dark up to 10 30 everybody knows the cycle so um if i start seeing a bunch of fish in that situation start moving underneath and i keep my fish finder on i'm not afraid of scaring fish with that if i see that I'm yeah ready. it does worry me a little bit because i've already marked fish that i got my heart set on and mm -hmm. I hope they don't go that way or that way. I want them to come this way. So how do I control that? So I'm going to take I'm going to take outside rods. I'm going to throw those outside and let them sweep in like this a little bit. Hopefully that they so so I'm going to I'm going to increase my presence. But mm -hmm. I'm also going to take and it's interesting that we're talking about this. Jeremy just talked about two pound weights. This is what I call a coffee can weight, and it's similar to a coffee. Can I pour them out of a wooden mold, and I've got a little. Maybe it's easier to see with this, but I've got a little piece of wire here that goes through, and that will allow me that fast current to shotgun baits down on tops of wing dikes at a quarter of the way down from a drop at the base of a ledge. I can throw those if if I'm not worried about losing them, which generally I'm not. I don't really worry about losing mm -hmm. stuff. I can throw those things out, and they'll actually drag because they have got a, a just a, a they're not rounded like these these I'm gonna are give you that i'm going to give you a solo screen here so we can see oh, that a little better yeah. real quick okay so there here's your standard teardrop and then here is my homemade ones that i that mm -hmm. i made and see this corner right up here i i it'll do it'll start dragging oh, let's see it'll start dragging along the bottom and almost act like a little anchor so this helps as far as uh, uh you know getting my baits placed effectively to where if they do start moving from where i'm casting out i can at least intercept them before they get them on the way out yep. yeah and you know it, it does happen a lot and it happens sometimes all at once it's pretty crazy you know you got two guys in the boat and four fish on at the same time and they're all huge yeah, that that explains those double and tripling up and stuff at times. So they're, yeah, they'll yeah. get on the move. And, also, also and, we have bite windows and, where I fish a lot of times, and I I can get them down to 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 the top of an hour. To be honest with you, which is the strangest thing. And as the day as the nights get longer or shorter, it moves by that many minutes. So there's certain, and I'm talking about bank fishing here, not boat fishing. So, uh, you know, we got a 10 o'clock bite yeah. window, a 12 o'clock bite window, and then they kind of get spread out as you're staying out later at night, but, but they do happen. It never, never ceased to amaze me how, how re repeatable those bite windows are or how, how, how repetitive those bite windows are. Um, so uh, we can talk about that later, but that's what that brought that to mind when you're talking about them all leaving at once. Maybe I was just catching them at that point or, or, or just traveling to their feeding grounds. I don't know. I haven't been able to figure out why that is. Flatheads seem to stay home. Blues, when they're going to get, when they get up to move, they're moving. I mean, and sometimes they're not feeding when they're moving. Mm -hmm. They're going from point A to point. They're going from coffee shop to steakhouse to coffee shop to whatever. Flatheads do that a lot. They everybody has this idea that flatheads in a in a normal natural river go around feed, 
competing a lot. And there's a lot of studies that have proven that to be pretty much the opposite where they'll, they'll, they will, they'll get up and move. They'll get up and like position over here and then maybe position over here. They'll, they'll set up in likely spots. But as far as going around like a shark and trying to get this and trying to get that, that's usually reserved for the small ones okay. and the small ones, they can't dominate any sort of good habitat, like any habitat. ambush spots because other ones are already in it. So they have no choice. They got to run around and, you know, act like a, a little chihuahua. And you know what? During spawn, I catch a lot of small flatheads. I mean, really small flatheads. So my, my thinking always was that the big ones are hunkered down. The little ones, will, you know, the cats away, the mice will play kind of scenario where I'm at. So, um, and I know a lot of guys who are getting skunked, but I'm getting four or five pounders nightly. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and you can tell with, you can tell with flatheads what's going on underneath the water. It's, a, it's, everything's an inference, but if you get into a great piece of cover, let's just say you got some wood extending off the bank and uh -huh. it's rounded into the ground and you've got some nice current flow coming in and it's been stacked up for a while. It's a nice old piece of cover. And, and then the, the, the bank is shallow up here, drops down right in here. And then you almost never catch that big fish up here. And it's not because of depth it's because of current because if if the current comes up the big fish will slide over and you won't catch small fish up here you know current goes down the big fish will slide down the little the, the little ledge and that's where he'll be somewhere and they'll usually prefer where a main stem comes down sometimes you can even see it or you can tell if you imagine like where it, what a tree looks mm -hmm. like you look at them on the bank you know how long they are you know how big their branches are and it's likely that there's going to be one big branch and then the rest of it is going to be hanging around like that. So I try to target where I think that branch is going to be. Branches touching the bottom. bottom. They, okay. they love to get on the side of things. Not necessarily behind them because that's a non-advantage. It's usually by, by the side or in front if they're active enough. They'll get behind that stuff when they just they don't want to feed at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, the moral of that story is that depending on how that current is, those big ones seem to like that medium current and all of a sudden you won't catch small ones there. You're going to catch the big one. But you'll mm -hmm. catch the small one out in too fast a current that they don't really like and too slow. So, you know, it's that porridge thing to where you, religiously you can almost pick out on a piece of wood cover as long as it's not just massive. If it's massive and choking off an entire secondary channel and stuff like that, you can't. But if it's a single anachronistic tree, you know, it's just whatever, you go, mm -hmm. there it is, right there. there. There's the big one. A lot of times I'm like, yeah, that's that's my huckleberry right there. I'm like, watch that rod. I'll just tell my customers. Hardly, I mean, you can pay attention to the other rods, but here's the thing. If this one goes down, if this one over here goes down first, you can pay attention to it. But make sure to pay attention to this one and this one right here, or the or if the water's low on the outside, where that current is kind of gosh, this is weird, sweeping around that piece of cover, that tree, that rock, that boulder, that log, you know. Uh, so I, I usually just tell my kid, pay attention to this one, this one, and this one. Don't pay attention to that one. And sometimes it's opposite if the water's up. But depending on how long the water's been up, right. But that'll just tell you the, the 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 aggressive nature of flatheads that they chase out and repel other fish. Now, I've got a little story here, and it didn't just happen once. You get close to that flathead spawn, and if it's like, you know about the Rock River, right? A little bit, yeah. I've had some experience on the Rock River. So the Rock River is a... It's a shallow and rocky river, but they've got nice holes with gravel bars and big mm -hmm. rocks, and wood, and all that stuff. So the first time this ever happened to me, it was on the rock. So I'm fishing a relatively shallow situation. There's a large boulder right off of the – so so the bank comes out. There's a large boulder in about 11 feet of water. Current is just – right for being able to basically back your boat up to it and just drop a bluegill right into the front of this boulder so I, I i did that i just let out some anchor rope i didn't have a whole bunch of boat sway i just put it right into this rock 
right to the outside current line. And it didn't hardly hit the bottom. It goes boom like this and moves. It just starts moving. And then it, it spit it. I mean, that fast. So I said, what happened here? So I reeled in. Look at my bait. My bait's got a tooth pad mark, and it's about that wide. So I knew it wasn't a small. Mm -hmm. So I basically just put it right back in it, and it goes, poof, and it moves again two feet and poof, spits. So the third time I just I was smart enough, I just set the hook. It's 44 pounds. Now, what was that fish doing? Why was it hitting my live bait that I basically put in his face, carry it two, three, four feet, and then spit it? Because – you know, conventional wisdom would say, "Well, why not swallow it?" Because he didn't feel me. There's he a, wasn't he wasn't trying to eat it. He's trying to get it out of there. That's right. And first thing they, comes to my mind, they get aggressive towards other fish, flat, and doesn't matter if it's a flathead or a you know a channel a cat. bass or a carp or what whatever it is. Or, I've, or a, I've I've experienced that myself, and and I've done the way I always combat it was change hook placement or add a stinger hook, and that usually does the trick for me. Mm -hmm. But if you put it right back in that same place, they'll keep doing the same thing. And I've been where they'll move that line four feet, and then they let go. Mm -hmm. They'll move that line four feet, and they'll let go. And it always isn't the exact same direction, but they're they're getting rid of the they're getting rid of whatever they 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 don't want near them. So and, and usually a, it's a green a, sunfish when they do that. <laughs> what's that? It's usually a green sunfish when they do that. They really don't care for it too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, our our human brain thinks well. You know, maybe maybe you just lost track of it or, you know, maybe it got caught, you know, the line got caught on something. But, man, there's really something to be said for flatheads, flatheads especially. I mean, I don't really notice. If blues are going to bite, they'll bite pretty – yeah, we all know that they'll, they'll, they'll short bite baits and they'll do stuff like that. But they don't usually carry it and then spit it. But flatheads' mm -hmm. penchant for carrying and spitting, I think, makes them one of the most interesting fish to fish for. Because it's that challenge. Are they going to spit it? Are they going to keep it? Are they going to go back? Are they going to go to the side? Are they going to curl their tail like this and then have their their head go? You, you, and I cool usually think of chan. I, I, like I said, I don't fish for blues too often, just because uh, they're not available to me as readily. Uh, but I like to think of flathead flatheads like like dogs, where they'll pick up that kernel of food they don't like and they'll set it off to the side and go after what they want. Where channel cats, I think of as like little miniature pigs. They just eat like crazy. And I know it's an opportunistic feed, but that thinking early on is is kind of helped me be more successful in my fishing and and how I set up, whether it's my rigging or where I set up. And that that's kind of the way I look at it to to make it as simple as possible. So mm -hmm. um, well, and now yeah. I know that they're, they're they're doing it more protecting their territory than anything. I'll I'll, I'll look at yeah. it in that way and that. Makes perfect sense to me, Mark. One th one thing that if if I could just clap my hands and everybody would know one thing, I I, I would like to get this across to most people because I think it would help them a lot. I've heard a million times that big blues or big flatheads or big channel cats they just take it, and it's not really the truth. There is a surprising amount, you know, and, and, and I've talked to a lot of guys that catch some really big blues. They'll get in a situation where they're like, oh, that's a dink. I'm like, are you sure about that? Yeah. They're like, well, yeah, it's not folding the rod over. I said, that's not necessarily the truth here because you can have big fish, 40, 50, 60 pounds, peck and hit and spit and pull down and not really do it. And then all of a sudden you will catch that fish. And, and a lot of guys think that it's a small fish messing around and a big fish comes and takes it away. Because they're like, well, you just kind of think, think, tap the rod a little bit. Mm -hmm. a lot big of fish will do it too. And, and I, I know this to be the truth because I have literally went in and sonar marked one fish, one single fish in the whole, I mean, the whole place. And especially during the day, you get that thing. And if I sat there for 20 minutes, I would have to assume that other fish moved in. But there was nothing moving underneath the boat. Nothing. I mean, and this didn't just happen one time. If you're just marking a single fish, the base of a drop, blah, blah, blah. And it's it just won't pull it down. 
this won't and then all of a sudden it'll get just enough of that hook in its mouth and pretty soon and there you go and it's 45 pounds yeah my, my, my bigger fish have definitely done that where i've 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 literally thought like okay oh bother some channel cat got a hold of my bait you know yeah. and, I'm, and, and as it gets a little closer a little closer you you kind of realize that wait a minute this isn't a little channel cat that's happened time and time again so i definitely yeah. uh get what you're saying so Hey, Some Tim. of the biggest flatheads I've ever caught have bit the lightest, believe that or not. 80-pound mm -hmm. fish. 80-pound fish. The initial hit's usually pretty good. You know, sometimes it's violent, sometimes it's not. Depends on what, you know, how much line you've got out. If you got short line or whatever and there's not that much current, it'll appear more violent. But if you've got a decent regular amount of line out and then all of a sudden you get that 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 tap that's different because you, you, you got your, your, you know, your bait's doing a little – wavelength deal from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you get that 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 tap like this but then it just sort of meanders it doesn't pull the rod down because it's not going behind you sometimes all they do is back up move to the side or sometimes move forward if you have reverse current which i don't mean reverse current this way i mean it this way mm -hmm. so if i'm at the back of my boat it's not that it's coming from the top of the water all the way back it's coming from that lower river underneath the river, and it's actually turning on itself like this. So flatheads, instead of face into you as you're fishing, they're actually, oh, sorry. Yeah, they're facing away from you. Okay, so they're facing away from you. So when you throw that bait past that fish he and he sick. gets caught finally, he comes and bites that bait like this. And he's going to go downstream towards you. So all of a sudden, all you see is just a little bit of a tap tap or a, just a little bit of a hit. And then you just start seeing a little bit of this. And a lot of guys miss those because mm -hmm. they're like, hold on. And a lot of times you have to reel in, reel in, reel in. Just watch, watch Carl. He, Carl didn't know it, but he was fishing a lot of those. Uh, it looks like Jeremy's guys. moving. Let, let's check in with Jeremy real quick. Hey, Jeremy, what's going on, my friend? Yeah, I got uh, I got two rods that are hung up. But what we're gonna do? I'm gonna make a small move. I'm gonna back us up down this current seam about probably 200 feet and get set up again. Okay. I didn't want you. To, I I saw you were doing something. I didn't want to interrupt him until he got past a certain point in where he was talking about. So uh, I wanted to make and sure that uh, anytime you're gonna have to probably. <laughs> that's okay. As long as you don't mind. A uh, real quick, also while I have it, uh, to, uh, Flint Hill Catfishing made uh, the comment. I've I've never thought about no bait on a sonar screen, possibly meaning that big fish may have moved into the area that are uh, uh, setting up to camp for an ambush later. So, you know, it's on the Mississippi. It is fairly common to move into an area that holds big fish, and you're not marking a lot of bait. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I know the bait fish situation is a lot different. You know, we have a lot of moon eye as opposed to skipjack. We up here, I don't know if we have a whole lot of deep, deep water bait fish. And I think that affects some of the catfish location that we have up here. Because it's a rare thing to see a bunch of skipjacks where I hear about them on the Tennessee River that they go deep. They go 30, 40, 50, 60 feet deep. Now, moon eye will, but moon eye don't seem to it's hard to mark moon eye because they don't seem to get in big bally schools. They seem to mm -hmm. lay along rocks and along the bottom. And I talked to the walleye guys about them because the walleye guys are the ones that are catching them deep. Yeah. So I, you know, I go somewhere and somebody says, Hey, yeah, we've been catching these weird fish, you know, silver, big eye, you know, teeth on their tongue. I'm like, yeah, that's it. so how are you doing it? And this is when I first started figuring out about moon eye or golden eye, whichever one you want to call it. So moon eye or gold eye are actually throughout the Mississippi River and its tributaries all the way from, you know, basically Canada all the way down to where Jeremy's at. I think I even saw some pictures of him. Are so, they two different species? The, they they are. Okay. But they're so I just similar. want to make sure I was I, thinking about that correctly. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of my uh, uh, one of my friends, he's almost as much of a fish nerd as I am. And as soon as I started talking about the difference of it, he gets out his big giant books and he's taking pictures and he's showing mm -hmm. okay, how many renal fin rays and this and the eyes a little bit bigger on this one? I'm like, dude, dude, it's like the difference between a black and a white crappie to me. Uh -huh. I know enough to be dangerous, which is why I ask a lot of questions, Tim, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. 
No, that's great. Okay, so what's Jeremy got going on? Setting up. Jeremy, what's going on, my friend? I would just uh, I got my position just getting set up. I'm just changing the weight out on my uh on my big bait. Right, I want to show you something. Please do. The hydro. It's kind of a on demand. They've picked they've picked up the flow a little bit in the center. And you, can you tell that how much trash there is? Like there's whole yeah. tree. At this yep. point. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Last 15 minutes, I've noticed if you see that big log coming, it's going to end up. It's going to come to about where we are. It's going to flip around, go towards the bank, like where this cutout cutout is, and then they're actually flowing back down the bank, and they're all and they're going to get back hung up in that end cut near those trees. Yeah, they're they're hit. The water's hitting this rivet. The dip's right where we're at, and there's a full reverse current between us and the bank there that even these big logs are flowing. You can kind of tell. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, I can see that one in front of you is heading the opposite direction, so definitely. Yeah, yeah, the one out by the tree, they're going mm -hmm. bank instead. There's, yeah, the whole current out there is a big circle where they're switching directions. Is that is that an opportunity or a problem, Tim? It's a problem. Okay. Anytime you have that much trash coming down, I got to take that out. Um, anytime you have that much trash coming down, and especially if you have stuff that's like big, big and it's kind of you know, it's a problem. So yeah. it's, it's far, at least at least Jeremy is not anchoring. That's more of a problem than that. But if he gets a big you know a big lib or log or tree to come down and hook onto his trolling motor and all that stuff, yeah, it's it's kind of a safety issue. But yeah, we had a about a 14 inch by seven foot log hit the front of the boat. I saw that come, come right in there, right in the screen. Yeah. And you know, all, all river fishermen, if they're in big fish territory have dealt with that before. I mean, it's just, that's, that's just the nature of it. You know, so, this you brings know, to mind. So like some of the people that are fishing on the Ohio river and, and places that allow unlimited or, or multiple lines. Um, I'm, I'm, I need. I can't go more than two poles. A third, if right. I have it labeled correctly, and that's kind of iffy. I consider that in those kind of situations to be an advantage because I could be more mobile. I can move lines when debris is coming down. I can get up and move spots sure. when it's coming down. So I mean, sure. it's six of one, half dozen other. I just kind of wanted to bring that up because I know a lot yeah. of people love the idea of having as many lines as you can have out there, but that always isn't the case for me. Hey, hey, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, he hears. You got me. a second? You got a second? You can talk. Yeah, sure. All right, so let's just say your de your debris field is really hindering the way you're able to fish down there. Okay. And I I do agree with you not being up tight to the dam, but when it comes like this, sometimes you almost have to get into the tailwaters again just to just to salvage your day, and then stay out of that big debris field wherever they're let are, do they let it through in all the gates or are they just pumping it over it i don't know how that works down there for you well actually the the debris we're seeing what's happening is they're taking those big cranes grabbing okay. along the inlet side literally passing yep. them for the road and dumping yep. them yep. Off. gotcha they got a big pile that they put them in but there's just some stuff coming out of the pile i gotcha so is there any anywhere you've got that you can get out of that debris field but yet still stay in fairly good straight line current and in good we fish location look at this spot and see what's up if i keep having trouble we're gonna look at that yeah i thought, I thought that rod was getting hit yeah at, at this hydro lots of full-size trees is just kind of a everyday yeah. thing oh okay like we we can get so you're used to that sometimes yeah like this, this is what we see right now is every every single day. That's not uncommon. Okay, these are smaller right. trees. Yeah. Well, right that's uh, there's a that's something that's kind of unusual compared to up here, because we uh, we have debris fields and stuff like that, but we we they don't normally run those cranes on those dams every day. Yeah, and they're really fact, they're breaking they loose do. additional stuff. So can you? Can you zoom in your stream and see the the two red cranes up on the dam? 
I can give you guys, let's give you guys a solo. Let's see what I can do here. Solo layout. We can't really, we can see yep. him in the distance, but we can't really get a zoomed in view on him. So yeah. you, I, I think on my phone, you can tell what they are, Jeremy. And the one on the right is down. Go, they're going grab something right now. A big garfish just hit. I don't know if y'all could see that. Yeah, those cranes are actively putting trees in our uh, in our path here. And that mm. that backflow is still happening. That big yeah, old they're all, they're all that big seam right there is going this way. So a lot of the trees are uh, fully making it to us. Good, because it's shooting them off towards that main channel. But. Uh, towards the bank, yeah. The main channel's this way, and there's those are yeah. going that hole. Oh, so you've got a separation there. Okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah. That's main channel, and then it comes yep. down, and there's literally a log pile in that inlet hole where that bank bank okay. cable. I thought you were talking about see where that current is focusing more towards the main channels, kind of going out and around you. I thought it was kicking a lot of that debris out there. That's what I thought you were talking yeah, about. Like if if the highway makes a Y in the road, that's what it looks like. Yep. Those pelicans yep. in the main seam, and then those logs are taking a left. Gotcha. It, gotcha, gotcha. Because this dam, since it's a hydro, it has active gigantic fans down there. Like it's physically pushing uh -huh. it. Okay. Yeah. The the undercurrent here is deadly insane. Really? Yeah. Especially. Are, are you saying the current along the bottom is faster than the top in this situation? Uh, Jeremy, answer well, that one. Well, the thing is, this this hydro works a little different than most of the ones that people see. The outlet for the hydro is about a hundred feet below the surface of the water, and it blows okay. the water. It blow it blows it up. You can see the water kind of boil out, then it makes the current. Okay. Uh, we're so far down. We're probably we're a quarter I'm, mile. I'm, 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 yeah, we're, we're a quarter mile or so from where the outlet is. So the current should even out by the time it gets to here, you know, top to bottom. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. You know, if you're if you're if you're right up by the structure, then yeah, then then the, the further down you go, you get by those outlets, it gets a lot stronger. Okay. All right, Mark. There was somebody that had a question about the Morris pool yeah. on the Illinois River. My buddy Nick over at Stilly Fishing, he says, Hey, Tim, I live right on the Illinois River in Morris. What's your thoughts on flatheads in that stretch? I've never really targeted them on the Illinois, just the Fox. That, and that is above Starved Rock, if anybody's not familiar with it. So mm -hmm. we have pools that are, you know, between 25 and 30 miles long. The, the, the Starved Rock Pool is actually a really long pool. It goes all the way from Utica all the way down to Peoria, or basically Pekin. Uh, but the pool above that That's cool. it is, my, to my knowledge, people have told me that commercial fishing is not allowed up there. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's what they say. And I've always speculated that uh, the situated that... Um, since that happens, since there's a split right there, so there's none above, but there is below, that that flathead population is better. But there's also the Fox River that dumps in to that pool. Anytime mm -hmm. I, I look at pool, if, if, if I say I'm going to go to a major river, it doesn't matter if it's the Illinois, the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Wabash, it doesn't, doesn't matter. I want a decent size or a mid-sized tributary coming into that pool because that is a constant feed of new fish all the time. Even though they can travel through those dams, flatheads, they will, I mean, it's no accident that some of my best flathead pools are pools on bigger rivers that big tributaries coming into feeding them. You know, the, uh, so th that is one thing. Now I, I have noticed one thing, the overall top end size of the Illinois river, especially up there, flatheads, are not all that big. For some reason, a big one is 40 pounds. Oh, and uh, I don't know why. I have a feeling that it's possible that the gene pool has been sullied a little bit, but I can't prove it, so I don't really say much about it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you catch a 15-pound flathead in the Illinois River in that Morris pool, that's pretty good fish. 25 is a great really? fish. 30 is 
pretty darn huge. 35 is getting up there and 40 is like monstrous in that stretch. But if, you know, when I, when I fish the Mississippi and to a lot of people, to most people, a 30 pound flat, and, and I, I still like 30 pound flat and I still like 25s. But if I'm really going to go focus after something huge, I, I'm going to mm -hmm. stay close to that mississippi river because it has paid off in the past you know as far as big fish i used to fish the morris pool i used to fish the fox quite a bit for flatheads you know mm -hmm. uh, and you and i are old enough to remember when it was i mean there wasn't a lot of people catching 30 plus pound flatheads on the fox was there no you'd hear of them uh, you'd hear of them in the day you know somebody catching one in the dam or you'd hear of the occasional uh people like hooked and yourself and all that to right. go out there and talk to flathead because because really, if 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 all the people that are watching this can imagine the Fox River, it's dammed because it's actually got a pretty good gradient. So they had to and it's short pools, but the edge is just this flat, shallow thing, and it goes like this and just dumps off a little bitty main channel, and then it just goes straight yep. across. Because the Fox was not a big river, so a main channel ledge on the Fox River where him and hooked and everybody, you know, these guys are, are fishing. It's like it it's only like two feet. It's like this two little feet, bitty thing. Nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. two feet. You, you, and you gotta go out 30 yards to get to a two feet little drop, and that's what you have to target. All the yep. wood most of the time that you would normally target is only got this much water on it, and there's no current on it. So if you find that great piece of wood on the fox that's actually got current and a little bit of depth, man, it's like gold. You know, I, you, know. I, you I have three spots that every time I launch my boat, I have to stop at those spots, and there's yes. always fish in each one of them. Always. They stay there because there's such little opportune, uh, I call it places they can, you know, hold up in yep. or nesting area. They're not a technically nesting, but they nest up, and I right. call it that, that you got to take advantage of them, and it's taken me a long time to find them because the fox is so flat. So I look forward yeah, to it. Yeah, very, very much so. Small. No. Yeah, it's amazing what two feet can how two feet can make a difference. <laughs> yeah. And see, that's that's uh, I've done some video stuff, and I did a little bit of uh, talking on another live feed about throwing those rods on bigger rivers. You know, I may be throwing into forty-five or fifty foot of water towards the main channel, and then this sinker right here is just sort of sliding along <laughs> bottom like this, and it might find a two foot drop or a one foot little rise and they're running with the current like this and it'll focus those catfish's attention right down that little furrow right to my bait which uh, how do you how do you find a two foot drop amongst 45 foot of water and then position on it correctly besides to go off to one side throw off and have the current do it for you there's no way to pick that out by the time it hits, that stuff is falling down, and uh, maybe it's over here, and and you know maybe this is where the little ledge is that you need because all the fish are running this, and mm -hmm. you're trying to target it like this. You can't. You got. You have have to be able to target it from the side a little bit, and then your rod is going to do one of these. It's going to go like that, and it's going to actually bow down because that current. There's so much on it, and the the, the lines all. It's. I'm I'm going to try to do some. Uh, I'm going to try to do some drawings of that because it's really a kind of difficult thing to understand. Now, why do why ball. do fish travel on, on on ledges? I've always wondered that. The, it, they seem to love, you know, like, see this tank behind me? That's a relatively oh. small tank compared to what I used to have before I had kids. You know, I bought 150s and I, had, I got a tank outside uh, in the garage. Okay. And I would run it in the summer and in the winter back then, uh, you put a flathead in it, and he almost always likes to be up against the side of the tank. Not necessarily in the corner, but they'll they'll you know they'll get up n next to that side. And, and when you feed them multiple bait fish, sometimes they'll be at the back, and then they'll move to the front. And then any minnows or whatever that's running along that glass, it just gets funneled right into them. So they're t what they're doing is if they're out in the middle of nowhere. They have a whole lot of area that a bait fish can escape, a ton of area. So if they cut off half of it as far as a ledge this way, and then the other half of it as far as the bottom this way, now that bait fish can get funneled right to them. And it pays, it pays to 
run along to those little there. those little drops or ledges, and I use my phone to to do that. So you've got that such, and let's use the glass for it. So you know if you've got bait fish and they're they're unsuspecting, and think about shad and think about all these bait fish, they'll run into obstacles and it will affect their movement and all that. And here's the bottom, and if they can get up next to this and run that. It's a huge ambush. It's it's like having hands. They it's don't have a wall. Hands. They get, you know, oh, now yeah, that you're a- talking about it, it makes total sense because they got to change direction. Yeah. And when you change direction, when you got a zig to zag, it's going to slow them down. It's going to give them better opportunities to feed. So, yep. Yep. And you know what? I didn't think about that because that's exactly where I fish for crappies in the winter. I'm looking for those walls outside of basins, and, and that's pretty much because they have to turn there. So why wouldn't bait fish do the same yeah. thing? So. And that kind of crappie, you know. crappie are huge on walls for some reason. You know, you go to any of those. Are you familiar with Shelbyville Dam? I'm sure you are. I, I am. Yep. Way. Okay. So great poppy, crappie population down there. Mm-hmm. Good flatheads. At times, there's big channel cats. There's walleyes. There's muskies. There's all kinds of stuff. So along that wall, uh, one of the best things I did for crappie, which I'm not a big crappie angler, you know, just take a almost a three ounce like that and you know a aberdeen gold hook and a little water jig and just drop it right along that wall and man mm-hmm. i'm telling you and i'm sure those crappies have spilled out of the lake and just stuck there you know they're not probably true river crappies they're probably lake crappies but i mean massive things just they get big yeah That's yeah cool. It tastes pretty darn good, too. I'm trying to keep up with everybody, see if we got any questions going on here. Hey, hey Jeremy. Yo. Caleb wants you to say hello. We don't want to forget about family, brother. Hey, Caleb. Hey, Bubba. There we go. Sorry about that, Laura. I, I should have had him say that earlier. Uh, cool. Uh, we're tooling right along. Um, you were talking just now about your yellow cat holding up against the wall. It reminded me yeah. below that dam, there's a giant uh, picture. Take a giant rectangular cube of concrete in front of it. That there's a okay. concrete wall that we can yes. fish th- uh, three sides of it if the current's very, very slow. And the mm-hmm. two of sides of it are on the edges about, uh, what, Jeremy, 30, 40 feet from the bank, 50 feet from the bank. And those backflows come towards it to where they if they could lean up against that wall facing basically our direction up against a concrete flat wall at the bottom right under the hydro. It, that big concrete structure is like in front of the main dam underneath the wall. Yeah, the big, the big concrete wall that you're seeing over there, the end of the structure underwater actually sticks out about 100 feet from that wall towards us. That's where the right. uh, that's where the outlet holes are. So what it, okay. But but it, but it's not the full width of the channel. So basically, what you've got right. on each side of that that shelf that sticks out, you've got a sheer concrete wall that drops down to the uh, to the bottom of the ledge where the rock revetment meets up. All right, Jeremy, have you figured out the fifteen minute sweet spot on that? Fifteen minute sweet spot. You might have to yes, educate. sir. It's usually in dams with concrete obstructions you can figure out what i call a 15 minute sweet spot so you can move into it and you can know in 15 minutes whether it's going to work or not because usually those fish will actively locate on the especially flatheads on the uh, lower current side because Uh what those concrete things are doing is is they're actually trying to slow that current down is what they're doing and a lot of these dams have uh, either big obelisk squares or they have uh, washboard surfaces. I mean, I've, or they have baffles side to side and then pumps up and down. And you just find that 15 minute sweet spot. But it, it, it does, it, it takes a lot of fish in it to figure that out. And you'll know based on the water level at some point if you focus on that, where you can pull your boat up, throw your live baits out or your cut baits and go, yep, they're here because they're telling me that they're here and it, you can put it on your milk run. And okay. uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's been one of those great things that uh, I kind of came upon because I was younger, uh, you know, and I would fish below dams a lot. I don't fish below dams as much as I used to, even though it doesn't look like it from my, uh, my <laughs> YouTube channel. 
but I'll fish below dams when I have to. When 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 downriver is dead, buddy, I'm going. I'm going where the bite is. Yeah, well, so far it's a uh, it's been a slow morning so far, but we'll we'll keep we'll keep hopping around. We'll get it figured out. I have no doubt that Jeremy will get on the fish today. Uh, uh, hopefully, I didn't jinx him. Knock on wood. I'm just saying hello to some people in a uh, chat, Tim. So uh, I want to okay. make sure we get everybody taken care of. So. Uh, I could probably even take a gander at that myself. There we go. Let's see what your people are talking back and forth. Flint Hills in there. Avid fisherman just joined us. Uh, Terry Lane, what's going on, Terry? D's in there still. D is awesome. Jennifer uh, Copley, thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, a lot of good people in chat. It looks like Norm from Catfish Headhunters is in there. Uh, he has a question for you. Let me see I if I can. Her. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, Norm, it might have got away from me, but I promise you I'm going to find it. Terry Lane. Flint Hill. There we go. Let's see. Two old vets. Oh, it's up there a little bit. There we go. Let's see what Norms has to say. Question for Eric. <clears throat> How do you target flathead in a river uh, with minimal current uh, but has tons of wood piles and rock piles? Would you target the slow moving river this a slow would you target the slow moving river the same way a fast moving river? <clears throat> when it comes to flatheads, if I feel that the river current is not as is not as like the average river current, if it is slower than what flatheads usually like, and let's face it, that's what the fox is all about. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going if I, if I'm gonna fish that with a short amount of time, okay, let's just say I only have two days, and I have to make a decision. I'm gonna try to go to the fastest current I can find first, and then I'm gonna make deductions from there. Because honestly, the slower the water, especially if if uh, let's just say flathead speed out of 10 has, is a five, but the whole river is a four or a three. Then it comes down to depth and cover. So I'm going to look for the right depth for the time of year, but I'm still going to try to find the best current. Like, let's just say the since the, the current in that river generally is a four, I'm going to look for smaller areas that the current is a five or a six if that's possible if it's not if it's mm -hmm. like a canal where it's just blah the whole way then i'm gonna have to uh i'm gonna have to really start relying on depth and then the contour of the river and then i'm going to try to focus on areas that of course rocks and of course trees i i think uh i think he kind of answered his own question because yeah, and time on the water in, in those, you know, ask any tournament guy. The hardest thing there is to do is go to a river that doesn't have discernible markings. It's very subtle. It's, you know, whatever. So that's when locals really have the advantage over you because they have time on the water. They, they time on the water. Exactly. Together. I don't know why, but I'm catching flatheads right here. I can't see it on the uh -huh. surface, but I'm catching them here. I'm catching them here. I'm going to the whatever. But like, here, like Mark just here. said, if you're in a situation like that, you've got to fish the structure and the cover. So you've got to fish the wood cover and the structure of the river. So that little that little two foot dip might be the secret to catching your fish. Maybe you've got a drop off. Maybe you've got, you know, the, the river's going along and all of a sudden it drops down three or four feet. Maybe it drops down 15 or 20. But that, you know, yeah, you got to take the current out of the equation if you don't really have any discernible current to deal with. And unfortunate because that means it's a little bit less. Um, for what I do, I don't like to pull up to a river and go, "Oh boy, there's no real current going on." I'll actually just turn around and go somewhere else if I got a short amount of time. You know, if they shut that dam off, if they shut the dam off, basically at Clinton or at or Keokuk or whatever. I mean, I've been down to Keokuk when it was rolling at nine and then I get there and that night they shut her down to four and a half and it just took the bite. It took any prayer of a bite out. I mean, because they just had dropped it. So I'm going to go, you know, to Meyer. I'm going to go to Winfield or I'm going to go 
clear down to Alton. I mean, we've had adverse current conditions before that have chased me, you know, a thousand miles in one weekend. Ever fisherman asks a question below Alton Dam. How likely would you be able to catch big flathead? How likely would I be able to catch big flatheads? Below how likely Alton, would well, that's the question. Anybody how like well, but would you be able to catch big flatheads? I imagine he means anybody, including himself. Okay. Um, there again, that is kind of like, I'm kind of, I, I don't live there, but I'm kind of a local because I've fished it mm -hmm. for so long and I've fished it in various situations and all that stuff. I think that there are some big flatheads uh, below Alton Dam, but I'm not talking about directly below Alton Dam. Alton Dam at times in that corner on that slower water, that deeper, slower water, there's the Missouri corner. I would set up offshore for big flatheads there. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind, and especially especially that pre-spawn migration. You get those big flatheads, and then they start separating each other. Yes, you can catch big flatheads up in that corner. But that fast water that you guys see me watch, I never catch flatheads in there. It's way too fast. That's, that's, I get, I, when I hear all damn, I, I, I think blue cats right away. I've, I haven't once considered that to be a flathead spot, but it's good to know that they're still in there on the other side. So, Oh, I've caught big flatheads at all. But I don't necessarily target them. I will, on occasion, target them for. Well, I, 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 oh, the most God. flatheads I ever caught down there was when I still had my channel cat and flathead mentality. So by fishing shallower, I contact a lot more flatheads, and mm -hmm. I think the biggest one was about forty-six pounds that I caught down there. I've caught some a lot in the mid thirties. I've caught tons of them in the twenty-fives, and I've caught oodles of them in the teens and lower i mean if you're, you're throwing a live shad or you're throwing even cut bait at times uh you know you're gonna catch the flatheads but flatheads are weird at alton you'll have a population up, up there one year and you won't have an, a population you know like you won't run into hardly any in a few years and then you know it seems like that population ebbs and flows so you know i was there and you know 1989 and i caught 50 flatheads in a weekend well i was there in wow. 1990 and we caught three flatheads in a weekend <clears throat> very cool uh backwater tarver welcome to the show it says backwater current eddy holes washout seams uh and back out holes holes washout seem to hold uh consistently hold seem to hold consistently hold flathead in the mississippi in the mississippi at least in memphis i'm sorry that was a mouthful but i think what he's saying is he has his best luck in washout holes so that 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 goes to well, them being laying up in in at the top of those holes or at the bottom of them so that makes sense to me well and it also depends if he's talking about current that goes like this or current mm -hmm. that goes like this that comes back towards you because I find that anytime, you know, if the current's going away from you, anytime you find a situation, and I don't mean this way, I mean something that's got a, a subduction zone and an induction zone. So you've got mm -hmm. current and it separates. So here's that bottom flow, and then it hits an object like this, and then it comes back towards any anytime I find that, you can find flatheads and you can find blues. And a lot of times they're some of the biggest fish in the river. He's right. And it doesn't matter where you're at, whether it's Memphis, whether you're where Jeremy's at, or whether you're where I'm at up here, or even farther north. You know, you, you get you get flatheads that do love that situation. Hagen Grubbs How's Fishing. Going, Hagen? What's going on, buddy? How are you, sir? Thanks for, for checking it out. Hey, Jeremy. So what's going on, buddy? Well, apparently the uh, apparently they've, they've cranked up the hydro quite a bit. We're now in current so strong that my trolling motor won't hold the spot lock anymore. Oh. So, we're, so what we're going to do, we're going to take one more step back and a little closer to the bank, get in that little bit slower current, and we're going to give this general spot one more setup. Nice. The, um, the big backflow we were talking about earlier has actually stopped, and it's all coming just downstream like normal. Yeah. Because it, it's just picked up that much. So, I him, never find that situation pleasurable or favorable. Whenever they start pounding that water, just within, you know, I would so rather have it stay. What do you do in a situation like that? 
usually what I'm going to do is almost exactly what Jeremy's doing. Jeremy's saying, okay, I'm going to have to get out of this current. Even though, even though blues don't have a problem with current, they still will move according to basically the big windstorm that they're getting. And, and that's how they're, they're going to look at it. They're going to go, oh, I was comfortable. Now all of a sudden I'm barraged by all this stuff. So they're going to shift. They're either going to go up, go down, shift out, or shift in. So a debris field, you know, if they're getting hit by gravel and sand and all that stuff just in their resting places, they're going to want to find somewhere else if they're not actively feeding. So, yeah, it's smart for them to move and maybe maybe take a look at a little bit more. And you're like, I'm looking in the background there. Matter of fact, I can pull it up on my big screen TV over here, which you guys can't really see, but. I can look at Jeremy's situation a little bit closer. So, yeah, back back along that bank, and I can't see much of it because those two guys are kind of blocking all my view. <laughs> <laughs> so, does, does that help? Uh, yeah, I'm hung up. Just tell me what it you're doing. does. But you know, you can only see, see so much from a you know a phone. You know, these guys are going to know what to do more than I can say what you know what to do. But uh, it's just one of those things where they are going. Uh, yeah, you can tell it's ripping. It's definitely ripping compared to what I see Jeremy fish normally, even though he does fish good, fast current. I mean, I would guess, what, Jeremy, two, three, four feet it's come up? Uh, it's come up more than that. It's probably come up about seven feet. Wow. Wow. Yeah, see, wow. Now they must they, they turned up the hydro even more than about 10 minutes ago. I, I can't even get closer to the bank. It's shoving me down the river. Now, is, is that due to rain? Uh, I think what's happened, I think the Mississippi is on a really, really fast rise. And that, and we're getting to that time of morning where people are waking up and using more power. Okay. So the hydro to compensate. See, All right. Wanna... But what my question is, my question is, Jeremy, if I get stuck in that situation right there, that right there, I'm looking for other avenues to get, maybe I'll jump rivers or I'll jump pools because if I start seeing that stuff, seven foot rise and all of that stuff coming down, that is going to diminish my chances of locking into big fish. And as a guide years ago, that is not an option for me. So I would fish areas that I could literally put the boat back on the trailer and be somewhere in another 20, 30 minutes. And I, I've done it many times, and I'd do it again today. I still do it. Ask, uh, you know, if you ever talk to Catfish Heroes, yeah, we do that. Yeah. Sometimes I get stubborn and stick it out when I shouldn't, though, and I'm still kicking my, myself in the rear end for doing that last year on the flat season. I don't know if we can – I don't think we can set up right here. No, it's, it's, it's too have, fast. We'd have to hard anchor and put 12-ounce weights to sit right here. It's just, it's it's, just, it's just too fast. We need, um, a, we need to jump blocks or something. Yeah, I think get out of this channel. Um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, the hydro coming unfishable. Yeah, right what now. we're what we're gonna do? We are going to get out of this channel where the hydro is, and I'm, I want to go look at the channel where the two other dams are. When we got here early this morning, neither one of them were flowing water, but I keep hearing the siren going off on one of them. I think I think they may have turned one of them on. I want to go see what the situation is. I'm, I'm it, it might be something I want to get on. Like, 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 Tim, that's actually a good question for you. If you have a situation where you've got a dam where they have not been flowing any water out of it for, let's say, a couple of weeks, and then they turn it on and start flowing water, is that something to go focus on, or, or will the fish not have reacted to it that fast? Depends, because the population, if they haven't been flowing water out of a, just a short stem, that's that those fish can actually go somewhere else and find current and food in a prolific situation. I don't find that that to be an advantage. If you have a single stem where the fish are going to stay there, they, they don't have any choice, you know, during that low water, maybe they'll move downstream, maybe they'll stay up there. And then a lot of times that extra water will fire them up. But if, if, if you're in say a three finger situation where these fish have the choice, which one to be in and it doesn't take them that long to get back out into this because you've kind of explained your fishing situation to me i don't see it advantageous for numbers of big fish if these fish because if this stem is dead for two weeks you know you're still going to have a few fish in there so is it really advantageous 
it is advantageous that they picked up the current, but is it really totally overall advantageous? I'm talking a little bit Zen here because you're kind of getting into my mind as far as how I make decisions based mm -hmm. on if I'm going to go out and tackle into like the biggest fish I can find in the river. Yeah. Now, if I'm just going to find, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to catch thirties, forties and fifties, that's pretty much my average. But most of the time I'm trying for that 80, 90, 100, 120, 100. Fish. So my mind thinks a little bit different. If I was going to, I would not go to a stem or a river that has had the dam not flowing for two weeks. That is not advantageous to me. Okay. What is yeah. advantageous to yeah, is a it, nice stable flow of flourishing activity for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Now, I. Hey, I say no flow. That dam always has the uh, a little trickle coming out of it, just okay. turn, like maybe to keep a boat straight. And there's usually yeah. there's usually a lot of numbers of fish at that area. And we have caught a few okay. big there in the past. Okay, well then then it, then it's an option, you know. And, and I would have to defer to your uh, your knowledge as as far as what that local population is and if you're going to be able to take advantage of it but i mean everybody will tell you in the south that they don't even fish until they turn those dam gates on yeah so it's obviously especially for blues obviously something that is beneficial for when they haven't been running it for a while and then they run it as long as your fish can't escape that situation or don't escape that situation when it's low yeah, it, seem, it seems like there's always fish hanging around it, you know, at, at any given time. I know okay. I know we've gone before where they were flowing water, then while we were there, they shut it off. And immediately, yeah. 14, 15 fish, all about the 20-pound range. Nice, nice. You know, so there, there's you know, always, and always some hanging around there. Skin that when we pass. You, will, uh, you will see that situation where... A direct change, especially a man-made one, will enact some sort of response from the fish. Either they're going to shut off, they're going to turn on, or they're going to, you know, start. And it, <laughs> where Mark and I live, we have some hydro dams, and there's one on the uh, the Marseilles discharge. There's another one at the Fox, you know, the right there at Dayton. Mm -hmm. And then we'll show you the activity levels in a graph like this. And it's, it's a hard rise and a hard fall. You don't really notice it when you're out there, but you'll definitely notice it when you compare that with the day's fishing. If you have, you know, because I've got a jet, I can run those shallow waters and it really doesn't bother me too much. But when they're dropping that water, it seems that the fish go to pecking. When they start to rise, they start to start taking the baits and going downstream and full rods over. So, I mean, you can definitely tell that on even on the bigger rivers, Mississippi, the Ohio, all that stuff. So if you look at your, you know, flow report, you go, oh, yeah, that was about, that was, you know, from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, they were running really good. That was our best bite, and then it died after that. You know, just a little reinforcement for that. I mean, I think everybody who fishes a, you know, the non-free-flowing dams is used to that. I'm not whatsoever. Everything you said right there is not new to me, but it's it's strange. It's alien to me, definitely. It's so. alien. Yeah, okay. pretty much. So, well, uh, I, I, I get what you're talking about because I, I I look at the same thing, but mine's more nature driven, like like rain and stuff like that, or construction projects. Yes, or, yes, or, it or, is. Whatever they're doing. Yep. It's more. Here's the a question for you. In, in my area, they're getting rid of a spillway here in a Carpentersville okay. in the next year. How is that going to affect fishing in the in the short term? Actually, from what my biologist friends tell me, is that I'm going to try not to get too zen. I'm going to try to keep it to a, the Fox River level. Mm -hmm. They say that getting rid of dams actually helps because as soon as you open up more habitat, the success of fish and they actually get bigger. So. The worst thing we could have done to the Mississippi River or to our biggest rivers, let's just say our biggest rivers, is actually for the fish, you know, getting huge is put dams in them because you limit their mobility. And that goes under the, the basic law of megafauna situation. So, you, you know, uh, and that's kind of been scientifically proven from, you know, 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years ago, because we, we, we kind of know that if you limit the amount of space that they have available, the population and the size of the individuals of the population dwindles. So and we can tell that by just in our general lifetimes, they did that to the Mekong River and they used to have just huge numbers of those giant Mekong catfish. And then they dammed this stuff up and all of a sudden they're endangered. I mean, there's not as many big ones, whatever. So, mm -hmm. the biggest uh, uh, the biggest catfish ever on a reported record was a field agent slash scientist in the 1800s for the Chicago uh, National. I, I think it was the the it was either the Field Museum or, or Natural History. Went down into the Memphis area to a fish market and bought a 315 pound and a 330 pound catfish. Now they wow. did not specify which one it was. And unfortunately, what happened was they had to ship it on a train and they didn't have, they had it packed in ice and all that, but the train broke down on its way to Chicago and the thing rotted. Unfortunately, because if that wouldn't have happened, we might have had a taxidermied actual two specimens of over 300 pounds. Can you imagine that? That would but be awesome. It wasn't too long after that that we started doing the dams. And then so the 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 overall top in size, because they used to be able to move from all the way where Jeremy's at right now, all the way up past where we're at, if they so chose. So imagine that kind of huge habitat and that, that giant migratory situation. Lynn Leeper's got a question. Is live, live bait better for flatheads? And and I've heard you answer this question before, and I, I, I agree with you. And, and I go, it depends. Yep, it does depend. It does. It's, uh, you know, uh, if you're on a smaller river, like let's just say the fox, just because he fishes the fox, you could throw a lot of cut bait and not catch very many. You'd have to hit that on the right trend to do really well with cut bait. Overall, though, you're going to do way better with live baits on a slower, smaller river or even a faster, smaller river than you will uh, cut baits. And I just know that I don't know why. I just know that I started out throwing lots of cut. I, you know, I've thrown lots of cut baits. I've thrown lots of live baits in lots of different rivers, lots of different types of rivers, too. Not just lots of rivers, but I mean, lots of small medium and large rivers lots of major tributaries minor tributaries and almost down to creeks i've you know I, I but once i started fishing big big rivers and i started throwing a lot of cut bait i was convinced that flatheads would not eat cut bait because i'd thrown it on small and medium-sized tributaries and things mm -hmm. like that but as soon as i graduated up to Things like the Mississippi, things, you know, some bigger rivers with deeper channels and lots of what I would call open water bait fish, where, you know, the smaller tributaries don't have a lot of open water bait fish. They have some bluegills. They do. They've got suckers. They've got stuff like that. But they don't have this huge population of these crazy moon eye and, you know, the, these almost pelagic saltwater acting type bait fish but once you get into that situation it seems that all of a sudden you can start cutting them catch them on, on on cut bait and some days and some weeks and even some months if you're not throwing cut bait you might as well go home because they're going to hit the spinning mm -hmm. bluegills or not even pay attention to them at all they're going to hit a stupid shad head with a glowing eye in 25 yep. foot of water and just take them straight down i cannot explain that why but i do know that there's only the only evidence i have of conditions that ha that happens on on bigger rivers is that when it gets lower stable and clearer water it seems to spur that cut bait bite on more than anything else 2006 and 7 was like that from july 30 30th or so all the way through almost september for two years in a row and we did fantastic on pieces of cut bait and sometimes i would fish some of my epic spots throw all kinds of awesome live baits. We're talking, you know, sunfish like this or white bass like that. And they're doing all their wiggling and whatever. We catch like two fish and it goes dead. And you can't catch, you can't get another bite. It's two minutes later. I took a piece of moon and I throw it in there like that. It's a five minute bite and it's freaking this big. Why? Well, I don't know. 
but I don't know. it's pretty obvious. I, I used to kind of, in my younger days, I used to kind of tell people they were a little bit nutty if they were telling me it's a patternable situation to use cut bait because I didn't understand back in those days. I thought I did, but I didn't. I There was a guy by the name of Chris Winchester way up north. He's telling me on some catfish message board years ago, he's, he's like, yeah, you know, you got to use cut bait on the tips of the wing dice and all that stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy's a lunatic, but he, it, it, it turned out he was just on that situation that I hadn't been there yet. You know, he lived there. I think seasons have a lot to, to, a lot to do with it as well, at least in my experience. I mean, even the type of live bait versus cut bait has a lot to do with it. Cut bluegill works better than cut shad sometimes for some reason. Sucker bait, I call them, you know, the candy bar type baits that are long and yep. slim. Work better than, the, you know, the big old yep. wide bluegills and such. Uh, bullhead work closer, but better closer to the spawn for me. Stuff like that is just yep. what I've experienced over the last yep. years. and. Absolutely. And I stick with what you know, works, which is my best piece of yeah. advice for anybody out there flat flathead fishing is is try everything till you figure out what works, keep records, stick with it, figure yep. out why later. Yep. But also don't run a muck. There's a lot of Definitely. guys that I know when they first get into it, they start running a muck and they uh been there, done that. They 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 they, they start thinking a little too much and they go off of that beaten path too hard and then they have a hard time learning because they've they've caught blues in three foot of water and then they've caught them in 35 foot of water they've caught them on hot dogs and they've caught them on chicken and they've caught them on this but if they stay closer to that that mainstream kind of a root equation and then learn that and then branch off that then the true the true story comes out and they, they really get that thing uh, figured out. But some guys can do stuff uh, so haphazardly that I just can't imagine learning anything uh, that way. I mean, it can be done, but it, it you know if, if I'm flip-flopping from pattern A to Z all the time, I don't know, some people can handle that. Maybe I can't. Maybe my brain works a little bit differently, but I, I got to go step one, two, three, four, five. And I got to be able to say, okay, step four, we're going to set that off to the side. Step three, we're going to set this off to the side. But five worked pretty well. So, okay, we're going to bring that back into what I think works. And so then I'm going to start branching because I'm always uh, I'm always pushing the boundaries. You know? yep. But I, 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 do I the, can't I do push the divide and conquer. have one, huh? I do the divide and conquer with my different methods, whether it's, you know, this bait, that bait, what end of the water column, yeah. where I'm fishing on turns and wood or whatever. And that kind of seems to work. If I'm catching fish, that's the whole thing. Getting on the fish is, is the key. If you're not getting results, then you don't yeah. know what's working better. Uh, I think big, bait, big fish is probably one of the coolest sayings or monikers you will that you know you have in fishing altogether mm -hmm. but it's also probably one of the ones that are less true or more true at times and I, I i think it really undercuts a person's learning ability because if if uh if the truth be told that's what i was told years ago and i would use some big baits and it was those big baits that I used back in those, they were hard to control. They they weren't, uh, you, you couldn't really use them in a really good situation. I'd got bites, but you know, if, if you're using a sucker this long and you, you know, something's biting half of it, all, all it did was all that big bait, you know, equals big fish thing did for me is prevent me from catching fish and moving forward, if you get my meaning. So, you know, in my in my 20s, because I listened to the bait shop guy or I listened to the guy down in the thing, and he says, you know, sh sh you know, you got to use big baits. And all that did, yeah, it, it just uh, canceled a, a, a big learning curve for me. And I hope that people understand that big baits equals big fish once you get that situation narrowed down where you are in applicable mm -hmm. big waters once you understand where these big fish are and you've had a little success on you know how they bite and how they do this now it's time to use big baits but not all big baits because i've caught and, and i and 
I've caught lots of fish over 100 pounds. I've caught tons of fish over 80. And honestly, I've caught lots of fish, lots of huge fish on baits smaller than this. And that is not a big bait. That That's a big like bait a, to me. <laughs> uh, it's a six inch strip of Asian carp. I mean, actually, my top 10 anchor. We, that's all we had for bait. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have chosen it if we had a choice. But for some reason, it was on. And that top 10 anchor, I'm not even going to really talk about it too much because it's uh, it's unbelievable. It's uh, Hey, we got well, Mr. Lyle well, Stokes. Hold on a second. We got Mr. Yeah. Lyle Stokes. Hey, Lyle, what's going on, buddy? Hey, Lyle. hey buddy. How you doing? Oh, you can barely hear you, Lyle. Got, got your mic next to you? I do now. Oh, you sound fantastic as always, buddy. <laughs> Good morning. How you doing, Mark? Good, good, good. Lyle, Tim, Tim, Lyle, how are you guys doing? Hey, Tim. Good. How's it going this morning? It's going great. You and Mark are discussing um, catching fish while Jeremy is just trying to figure out where they're at this morning, looks like. Yep. Well, he'll find them, uh, and he's in a spot to get them. Yes, he is. I agree. I'm going to uh, get a refill on some coffee. How are you doing? Do you need a break, uh, Tim? Are you doing okay still? I can do a quick break. Okay. Why don't you get a, a refill, and uh, I'll talk with Lyle for a little bit until Jeremy comes back, and then we'll go from there, all right? Sure. That's great. Sounds good, man. Been going. For, so how are we doing today, Lyle? You 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 enjoying the show? I am. It's, uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. I've been here since the beginning, so... Uh, I left for a minute to check on some other stuff, but uh, it looks like you guys got things well in hand and a uh, pretty good crowd this morning for as many uh, shows it's on. I mean, yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot of live streams going on. Everybody's out there fishing. It's Saturday. If, if I could be out fishing, I definitely would. But if while, while I was out fishing, I'd be, definitely be watching some people out there, too. I'm really grateful for everybody who's out here watching and stuff, and people even just stopping in to say hello. It's always a Heck appreciative yeah, it's zone. nice when you can see guys like Catfish Heroes and, and Dockery and, and Chad and uh, Hagen Grubbs and uh, Justin's Fishing Fetish and Ernie Brown and all these guys, Fishing Finds, come in here to, to join in on the show. Uh, and and they're the ones that Mark was in there last night and a week before. And a week yeah, before. yeah, we got some good caliber of people out there. Uh, check it out. Uh, I got Jer. I think Jeremy's done moving. Maybe I'll unmute him and see what's going on there. Yeah, it looks like he stopped. He's moved. It looks like the. Did you see all that debris coming down? I know you got some big river experience. How often does that happen to you, Lyle? A lot after the when the river's rising or falling. Uh, if it's steady, you don't get so much of it. But um, I, it, there's a point where it's dangerous. But for me, if if they're coming down through there, high water means fish are biting. I, I mean, if it's rising or if it's just high and I'm able to get out on it, I'm on it. And people say, oh, you're, you're nuts. Well, maybe, but we catch some big fish once like that. So... And numbers of fish. I don't know what it is about it, but it turns them on. So um, we caught the biggest fish I ever caught on Truman Lake was when it was at record levels and uh, the parking lots was full of water and people was afraid to put in. We caught the, the best fish of our lives on Truman Lake when it was like that. And uh, on, on the Mississippi and the Missouri have been the same ways. And when most people won't get on it, that's, man, I'm just, I'm flopping at the jaws. Can't wait to get to it. I, I, I hear you. I mean, even, even the small bodies of water around here that are, <clears throat> pardon me, excuse me, people. I apologize. <clears throat> the small bodies of water, which are dammed off creeks, are little quote unquote mini reservoirs. If we have current, we got high water. Fishing's on. Fox River is a different story because it's so heavily populated. They actually close the river down to boat fishing. So that kind of ends that story right away. But, you know, bank fishing don't hurt in a couple of spots that I know of either. So we wait on that high spring water to come for those spots. So I can kind of understand. I don't know if it heightens their, their senses or if it carries scent further or or, or who knows. The, the new line of stuff for them to uh, 
to fish on new new travel corridors. I, there's a whole. Uh, I have a theory about it, but you know, it just matters to me. It really doesn't matter to anybody else, but I just think it opens up new venues for. Them. Welcome back, Tim. Can you? Oh, wait. Hold on. Mute. There you are. Now we can hear you. Right, I go. had you muted while you were gone. That's All right, good. I'm going to take a quick break and refill, take care of some stuff. I'm sure uh, I'm leaving you in good hands. I got Jeremy unmuted, so as soon as he gets set up, I'm sure he'll be yeah, part yeah, of the yeah. conversation again. So uh, I will be right back. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, cool. I'll be I, back. See, I see Jeremy is in cleaner waters. That's good yes, news. He is. Good yeah. News. You know, uh, I thought this Tim, was I've got a question or two that I would like to run by you right quick i was watching okay earlier when when you said that uh, there was a difference between moon eye and golden eye and i know that there is but i think there's a lot of people out there that don't know the difference could you explain that to them i'm gonna i'm just turning you up a little bit here okay there we go i what i said was i i, I know the difference i've seen the difference in gold eye and moon eye most people have not could you touch on that for a minute and explain to them what the difference is? Well, uh, let's just say. Uh oh. I don't know. We got. We got activity. I don't feel good about it. I've got a huge lag going on on my feed for some reason. Right. I, I, I can tell. And I. I yeah, I'm kind of lost here, but let's just say Moon Eye are a cylindrical, silvery looking fish. Wow. Yeah, I got to fix this because I'm, I'm playing back in my ear like 40 okay. seconds later. <laughs> go ahead. I will uh, holler at some guys in chat while you're working on that. Okay, you go ahead and do that. Sure. Kelly, speak out. That's. Is this some, yeah. that's somebody new in here, and uh, we're glad to have you on the, uh, the show today. We've got uh, Epic Catfish and Creole Catfish. Of course, Mark is taking a break. He will be back just shortly, so uh, welcome to the feed. There's some fish scattered out in here. Is that a catfish? Mark or uh, Tim is working on his, uh, his feedback right now to get him caught up. He's, he's lagging a little bit, so he's working on that. A little bit. Justin Fish and Fetish keeps talking about shovel heads. I'm not sure what he's talking about. Yeah, we're uh, we're, we're creeping right now. Uh, creeping? I'm creeping. I'm I'm creeping, creeping closer to this dam. I want to see if I can get set up where I want. But I, <laughs> I, I there were some guys here I was visiting with privately a while ago. Said, "What's he doing?" I said, "He's going to that dam because that's where the fish are." <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm creeping ever so slightly. Yeah, how deep is the water you're in? Uh, you're... Right now I'm in 32 feet. 32. Do you have an idea of what it's going to be like when you get closer? And yeah. and where you're at, how it's... close to the dam can you safely get? Well, I, actually, it's all it's all closed right here. The only little bit of current they have is what's leaking through the gates. Uh huh. Uh, it's just enough current to hold the boat straight. Okay, is it? Pardon me. Is it high for you guys, or is it about normal? Or uh, it's about normal for this time of year, but it's about ten to twelve feet higher than what I've been fishing the past probably few weeks and months. Okay. Good we're, deal. We're, we're starting to get to that part of the year where the water's coming up. That's my favorite time of the year. What are you using for bait today? I've got all big gizzard chad today. No slicker. Nope, no, no slicker today. The the little bit of frozen one I have left, it's uh, I don't know. I just I just didn't feel good about the quality of it. Okay, what about when you get up closer to that dam? What's the chance of catching a few? Ah, uh, the chances are pretty good. That's what I was thinking, and I also figured you'd be doing it. <laughs> chances are pretty good. Like I said, I'm 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 creeping real real slow. Look at that cloud. Yeah, they got a cloud. I just passed over a, a cloud of bait underneath us. Oh yeah. Yeah, what I'm talking about right there. I can take my phone out of the uh, out of the holder there. Show the to show the screen. How big of uh, how how close are you going to get to it? Um, just about where I want to be. 
Yeah, awesome. Now, is there enough current that you do not look at that? There's a nice bait ball. And look, look what's right behind it and underneath it. Yeah. See what I'm talking about? Yeah. Now, them big, long marks like that are probably fish moving. Now, I'm I'm, I'm not going. Them one there one. on that hump, they're probably just that big. Yeah. Well, I'm not I'm not going but one mile an hour. So the mark's going to be longer, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We are, tell you what, they got a little more current in here than I thought they would. But that's okay. So you're you're just you're going to be able to use one one uh, one anchor. Eric Jackson wants to know if you have moon eye down there where you're fishing. Uh, I've never caught one. I've caught a few golden eye though, so I imagine like we got them in here. That's my they're my favorite bait of all time. Sometimes yeah. I can't get them. Sometimes they're hard to get. But if I can get one, I will use it over anything else. Okay, that's well just me. We're gonna we're gonna put some uh we're gonna put y'all back in the holder. If I can, I'm gonna swap my let's see let me put it put us back. See, this works out for me because this uh this may or may not be the place where I'm fishing winter blues at. Well, you know, I've told this many, many times, and I feel like the dams, if they're running water, that's my favorite place if I'm around one to fish, because it's the biggest piece of structure in that river that's right that's right and i i like fishing that tim's having audio trouble it was lagging real bad mark so he should be back in here okay just i just added him back to the stream hopefully uh you can hear us there you, are. Hear us? There you are sorry about that tim i was just visiting, right. visiting with uh jeremy he's up close to the bank just about where he wants to be and i think he'll put some fish in the boat there and the, like i was just telling him the reason I like to fish dams is because it's the biggest piece of structure in the river. Oh, okay. And it's, it's a migration stopper. I mean, if, if fish travel up river, they got to stop. They got to hang out a little while. I mean, really, I mean, I, I'm not a huge proponent of telling everybody to fish dams. But if you're struggling down river, go to a dam. Because a lot of times it'll, it'll clean that thing right up. I mean, you could have a miserable day, switch into a dam. Uh, you know, get on the fish, and it can really turn your stuff around. Oh, it's Kelly. Hi, how you doing, oh. Kelly? Hi, Kelly. Thanks for tuning in. I want to make sure we get a yeah a new folks out there. Travis Tarver, hello again. Kelly, you'll get a kick out of this. I just sent Garrett to town for some Red Bull. We're fixing to get oh. fired up here. <laughs> Oh, well, Catfish Hero says Moon Eye, which I made the statement is my favorite all time bait if I can get it. Can't always yes. get it. But he says, are usually in Epic's cooler for sure. Yes. That I'm gonna do everything in my power to get Moon Eye. And it yes, I could I could have I could have red horse suckers already. I could have Green sunfish. I could have bluegills. I could have crappie. I could have you know shad. I could have all. I could have skipjack. I still want moon eye because moon eye have proven to me, at, at least in the areas that I fish, to be a top end bait. They really I are. Agree. If they I go really to are. a tournament on a big river, and a lot of the big tournaments are on big rivers, if I yeah. don't have moon eye as a bait source, I'm bawling like a little girl. Yes, because yeah, yeah, you yeah. need it. It's that important to me. I try to try to be quiet. Is is Moon Eye a, a cast net bait or is that a hook and line? Both. Both. Yeah. Both. Exactly. Both. They they're I, they eat small minnows and bugs. Yeah, I prefer to get them off a cast net, and where I, I get too. them off a cast net is behind barges that's been setting for a long, long that's time. Right. That's They'll right. They'll migrate up there. Okay, so why do you know why they're there, Lyle? No, I Behind do those not. I'm just glad to know that they are. There. Yes. <laughs> okay, so so Moon I are there because one, they're current oriented. Two, they don't like light, as everybody has seen. You know, if you've seen a Moon Eye, you know they have a gigantic pupil yes. and they have a really big eye. They don't love light, so they're normally a deep water fish. They'll hang out on wing dikes. They'll hang out in main channel ledges. They'll hang out in big deep holes. But if you and and they're not really accessible in that situation. I mean, walleye guys catch them on you know jigs and night crawlers and stuff like that, but they don't really catch a bunch. 
So if you're going to get onto them, you got to find just the right barges because what they're doing is they're feeding on all those bugs that grow on the underneath side of those barges. Okay, so as the bugs are hatching, and most of the time when we do really well, it's lower light. I mean, we'll catch them there during the day right behind the barges. But mm -hmm. if you get a bug hatch going on, we all get excited. Me, John, you know, uh, Sean, uh, Aaron, all the guys that fish with me, we're like, oh, yeah, we got a bug hatch going on. And so that means that these moon eye are going to be up closer to the surface. Thank you attack on the bugs so it's it's awesome but so you've got algae that builds up underneath these barges you've mm -hmm. also got the situation where when they hatch out of that mud in the bottom and then they float up they get stuck underneath that barge and they start dribbling towards the back and those moon eye are all up under if i could throw a cast net up underneath the front of a barge That's and right. have it go, that would be even easier but we have to all throw off the back of the barges and I even showed that in one of my uh, videos where we went to go target Moon Eye. The, the worst part for Moon Eye for me is that it kind of takes some of my bait downtime away because it's really hard sometimes to get them during the day. You're going to throw your guts out for 10 Moon Eye. But if you go the evening, you might catch one net with 10 or one net with 20. That's but right. it also takes that great bite window away. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it does. But I'll do it. I'll sacrifice that by 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 time. Absolutely, and and you know a lot of the top tournament guys are using Moon Eye and never yeah. saying anything to anybody about it. But <laughs> yeah. you and I know yes. they're using it <laughs> because you see it, yes. see them using it, and you talk to them privately and and ask yeah. about. Well, yeah, I got a couple. Yeah. Let me ask you guys both this question. All right. I, 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 don't, I haven't come across, I don't know if Moon Eye even exists in the Fox River. What if I was to, I know you shouldn't, but hypothetically speaking, if you bring a bait to a water that's not native to that water, is that entice a fish more or less? I guess that it's akin to that whole, I never see chickens swimming in water argument. Does that work the same with, you know, bait that I, swims i guess i find that to be logical but yet realistically off the mark and why i say that is because i have evidence of me doing that very thing so there's not a lot of moon eye in the rock river there's but also we know that there's no alewife no oh. what okay alewives so uh there not yeah alewives are basically okay. a herring Okay. I'm frozen? No, nope, not anymore. It broke free. It looks good now. You're back. Okay. Okay. So um, there's no alewives in our rivers. They're all up there in Lake Michigan. And when I was a mm -hmm. charter mate, they had a, a moon, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an alewife kill. And this alewife kill, there was lots of big ones you know six seven eight nine ten inches in the harbor so i asked the captain i said can can i take the net and like get all these so i brought like 30 alewives home and i used them in ponds i used them in the small river situation and i used them in big river situation and they did so outstanding i wanted to go back to chicago and get some you know th throughout that week and so even though the fish that i was catching never saw an alewife they, were, they worked really well. So then I translated that to shad. There's no shad up here in the Spoon River. There is in the Fox and some bigger rivers like that, but there's I've never seen a shad in 40 years. But shad do really well. Um, there's not that many chubs in the Mississippi River. There's not that many chubs in the Vermilion or in the Illinois River system. They're all you know off in the smaller creeks, but yet I can bring mm -hmm. chubs and do really well. So it just kind of depends on the the and how i look whether a cut bait is going to be better than another cut bait is is it oily it does it have that scent what's in the stomach contents is it flashy does it have a big glowing eye because i'm going to tell you i've got a theory about the the fish that have the glowing eyes as bait it just seems that when that water's a little bit clearer and you're throwing gut pockets and you're throwing you know, regular cut bait. And when those heads are really doing really, really well, it needs to be a flashy bait. It's a little bit clearer. And I, I believe that they don't glow itself, not like a, not, not like one of Chunky's rods, 
but I think that catfish have such great night vision that those eyes still collect a little bit of light. I think they can see them even in 30 foot of water. After we had a on Panfish Week, we had a discussion with Brian Brosdale, and he was explaining when well, sometimes when the bite is hard, adding just a bead to the top of a hook will give that fish something to target on, something fish to on. focus on. Oh, oh, we got a fish on that off. Yeah. Hey, he wouldn't very big if that's the case. Oh, and we would, you got us all excited. Yeah, I know. Play with that's all right, Jeremy. We're rooting for you. We are. I hope so. <laughs> No, but he explained that they definitely he feels that they give them something to target on, something to zero it on, and I don't see why a large eye on like a moon eye or something like that wouldn't do the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah, I, and and I, I think I've seen a lot of evidence of that. I mean, there's there's none of this stuff that's a general absolute. None of it. But it's all it depends. Tendencies. Well, the 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 reason is not because nobody does studies on that stuff, isn't that correct, Tim? Yeah, nobody does studies because it doesn't pay any money. <laughs> That's exactly right. And you can't probably get grants from the no. government for those studies because no. what are they getting out of in return? They're getting an idea of what yeah. somebody thought was correct that will help catch more fish, and they don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't – no, nobody pays for that. That's exactly right, but I agree with you. I think just a little bit – the only thing is that I don't know how deep it would work on the big rivers because they're usually so muddy – but if there's a refraction of light down there, anything, but catfish have such sensitivity on their bodies. Yeah. Uh, I think vibration, and this is just my opinion, and I haven't really told a lot of people, but I think vibration is very important. All right, uh, Lyle, um, I got a crazy story to tell you about light in the at the bottom of rivers. So... When I was younger, I was very interested in whether there was light at 17, 18, 19, 20 foot in a turbid river such as the Illinois. And it was, it was a fair, I mean, compared to the Mississippi, the, the current's very slow and all this stuff. So I was, uh, I, I was either 19 or 20, and I just peeled off my clothes down to the old underwear and followed my anchor rope down into 27 feet of water. And of course, it's muddy and whatever and, and and i hypothesized that there's still enough light for people to see and i was correct you down you couldn't see much but if you turn your head up towards the 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 you, you could actually there is enough light penetration even in 20 foot of water so that kind of clued me in and i, I didn't really have to do it again Bro, but, that yeah. is amazing information right there yeah. it really is i never and, and, thought of doing that and our eyes are so poor compared to, say, a walleye or a channel cat or a flathead or a blue mm -hmm. or even a crappie. Our eyes are terrible as far as light goes. Yeah, but like we can adjust to light pretty good. But they are so much better at seeing light than us. It's no wonder a flathead loves to get underneath stuff. So if, if, if you've got a, I mean, literally, if, if you could put a piece of plywood into the bank, on the Fox River, on one of those little, as long as there was enough current depth, they'd be under that plywood during the day. They might even be under that plywood during, you know, at night. Docks are, I mean, docks attract, uh, you know, flatheads on free flowing rivers. They actually attract them on even lakes. And, you know, I, I never they, thought they, that the docks attracted in that shape. them because of the light. I always thought the docks attracted them because of the bait. But what you're saying now about looking up from the bottom, to see the light yes. makes a lot more sense. Yep. Yep. And barges, you know, everybody talks about, hey, we're going to fish in front or on the side of barges. And I honestly believe there's it's a threefold thing. I think the first thing is overhead cover and darkness, shade. I think that as that current comes in, it pushes and goes down underneath that barge and creates a little faster current area. And if you use your side scan underneath barges, you can all parked ones like ones that are like moored there. They have like a stake in the front, the stake in the back. They're huge on the Mississippi. You'll see that they're, you know, it, it'll, it'll go down because the, this is weird. So you got the front of the bar, front of the barge like this. Um, so you've got that current smashes into that 
gets shoved underneath and it also creates a, like a little lip at the bottom of that hole. Because a lot of times on the Mississippi, you'll get those shallow water barges. They're only in four foot on the edges. But if you get your back of your boat right up to that, it goes four foot and then drops to 15 right underneath it. It's really kind of a cool thing. And then you get your side scan on, on the thing and you'll start seeing humps. And right. sticks caught into it. Sean and I fish a lot of barges that are, are moored on the bank, and sometimes there'll be wood cover smashed in between the bank and the barge, and there's no room to turn around. I'll actually whip the boat around and reverse that thing hard back into it and then fish that cover that's between that because you got like shallow water, you got logs and sticks, and then you got that current coming in, and then you've got that drop right underneath the the, the barge. And it's it's really kind of a dynamic situation. Would you agree that the older the or the longer the barge is set there, the better the structure it makes? I'll give that a huge heck yes. Yeah, yeah, I've absolutely it. on target. Yeah, I'm I, when when I look at things, it's always relatable. I, I'm fishing older timber piles rather than new timber piles. I imagine absolutely. it's the same way with barges. The longer it's there, the longer yeah. the fish have just not only to find it but to get acclimated to their situation. That's and right. and I think they make for different, better fishing areas. So, Tim, I've got one more question for yeah. you. Then I'm going to leave you guys with your show. Those places like you're talking about, like underneath barges or other places. Uh, bridge piers and things like that where there's a lot of structure i think mm -hmm. people overlook them because they're going they know they're going to get hung up they know yep. they're going to lose a lot yep. of stuff and they don't want to be tangled up all the time That's but right. if you'll take the time to fish those and be willing to give that up you will catch more and bigger fish and lyle it's a general principle of life i think that with more effort comes greater rewards I agree. With less effort comes lesser rewards. So I've always been the effort guy. You know, I'm the guy that'll I'll work my fingers to the bone, beat my brains out to figure those fish out. I used to do guide trips like every day in May or June or whatever. So I would get done with my guide trip and my customers are like, why aren't you putting your boat on the trailer? And I said, because I'm going back out because I was not satisfied with how today went. I think I, think I may have missed something. So I would go, you know, from six o'clock in the morning till six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. And then all of a sudden I'm going back out. They're like, you're not going to get home. Yeah. And I've got a guide trip tomorrow, but I need to figure this out. I have to figure this out. You got to know. Yeah. And sometimes it worked. Sometimes it paid off for going out. And sometimes it was like, well, it's just more of the same. That's but you I always learn something. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to back out of here. If you guys need a break, uh, just give me a shout. I'll Lyle. be around. As always, thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure to see you, my friend. And uh, I'll let you know yeah, if we need yeah. a break in a in a yeah. little while. And uh, thank you, thank Talk you for taking you. thank you for taking care of us. All right, buddy. Uh -huh. I'm fond Sweet. of that guy. He's a good friend of mine. He's a good guy. I look up to him a lot. Great, guy. great questions. Yeah. He really is knowledgeable. So are you? I mean, I am thank very you. impressed. I am since I got on youtube i'm very impressed with the average not the i'm impressed with the average knowledge has risen so much in the last 25 or 30 years let alone the individual knowledge you guys are you know guys that used to do what you guys did that a lot of times you know years ago they were repeating what their dad and grandpa said you know they're, they're buried in the mud they wait till the lightning storm you know all the anachronistic crazy fairy tales that we used to hear and now you guys are you guys are very i mean you guys are right on it right on i uh I, I i you know i don't claim to be uh joe fisherman or anything but but i'm a pretty good analyst by trade and i kind of apply that to everything i do which i believe is a benefit to my behalf so uh i'll never claim i know something i don't but i'll ask a hell of a lot of questions well, i always and, do <laughs> you know questions questions are, that are on the right track are a beautiful thing because it really helps you know because when when we go down the the if while everybody's learning if half of the catfish populate you know people that love catfish are going down one road and the other half are going down the other road. I think that the two, you know, the, the, the more new age and the older age have kind of, kind of melded in the middle. And now it's like, it's, it's like a nice, it's like a nice road. It might not be uh, uh, paved yet, 
uh, it's still got a little gravel to it, but it's yeah. at least one nice main stem. And then everybody else can, you know, they can say, okay, I fish here. And this is the goofy stuff that happens here. And people can answer that and say, wow, that's great. That's great. I want to know about that. But then, then, but there's, I don't see a lot of arguing like there was years ago. I mean, people would just flat out argued whether you could catch flatheads on cut bait or live bait or, you know, doing this or doing that. I, I think it's great. Definitely. You know, and one of the things I believe that's akin to that is 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 YouTube in general because you can see results of what people are doing, and when you're seeing results, you, you got to respect that. Yeah, there, there's yep. no if ands or buts about it. I think that you know there isn't somebody telling a wives' tale about you know I caught this fish or there's a Volkswagen sized fish right. at the bottom of this dam when when somebody's actually catching one that could be mistaken for one when you're looking at it face to face. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, let's let's check in with Jeremy real quick. Jeremy, yeah. how you doing, bud? Uh, we're hanging in there. Uh, I think what we could do one by one, we could pick up some of these rods and we'll put some fresh bait on. I just realized my bait's been on for a little longer than what I like. But we go, we go freshen up the baits and uh, see if that might spur a little something. Hey, Jeremy, ask me. I, I need to ask you a question. So when you first set up on that spot and I was having trouble with my audio, I was still paying attention to your fish finder. And when you had come from that deeper water just up a little bit onto that rise and you had all those fish marked down there are you confident that those are catfish one and two when you move into that situation in the summer or at least when i see that situation on my fish finder i know I'm, I'm about to get lamb basted usually now the difference between summer and winter is obvious so i guess the first question is are you confident that those were catfish they look like catfish position to me yeah, they. I'm. I'm pretty confident it's catfish because I've I've been in this same spot before, seen the same thing on the sonar, and if and if had caught catfish. So like I said, mm -hmm. it's kind of caught me. There's your bite. bite. There's your bite right now. Got a rod getting on catfish. So something's on it. We've been yep. getting love tap. We're gonna go to solo here so we can get a better look at it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, we've been we've been getting kind of dink tapped and stuff. So there's there's fish here. I'm just waiting for a better fish. Uh, maybe they're not dinks. Maybe that's just how they're biting, like we were talking hey, about hey, earlier. Hey, Jeremy, right? I just I just watched that one on the left, the blue handled rod. Yeah. I don't know how much you're swaying, whether your sinker just moved or not, but that did not look like a dink to me. Uh, I am swaying oh. for the lid, okay. but yeah. not enough to cause all that movement. There you go. Hold on. Now that that might be the boat moving. Okay. Also, when you sway, are you short enough to the back of the boat that maybe that is off the bottom? Uh, no, those those two shouldn't be off the bottom. I got okay. I got it. Okay, shouldn't be. Hmm, interesting. And we're back to the multi screen layout here. <clears throat> Excuse Wait. me, Tim. How do you feel about birds? Because we're surrounded by a hundred pelicans. Yeah. And as I grew up and Jeremy, we didn't have electronics. So we would just yeah. look at and I chase birds to chase bait. Yes. And and you said it exactly right. There's a takedown. Oh, oh, and he didn't go. Oh, but yes, chase birds to catch bait. But I, I didn't I don't put a lot of stock in fishing where birds were. I mean, of course, we're all fishing moving stuff. I agree with it in lakes, but I don't agree with it as much for me. Now, you know, if people are having success, who am I to say, yeah, don't do that. But, I mean, I ignore birds except for bait or if the fishing situation is uh, really tough, I may go below the birds and set up because, and not as much pelicans, but like goals, goals are mm -hmm. pretty successful at getting shad but they're also unsuccessful a lot of times they injure a lot of shad when they're dive bombing them and then pretty soon you got dead shad and crippled shad running down that water column and so yeah i mean sometimes especially with channel cats you can take advantage of that you know i sometimes this is a couple of times this oh do we got one fish on. Fish on. All right. fish on. Oh, and we're, we're gonna see if this is a big fish or a little fish and I, I know it's not a ginormous fish, but I don't think it's a super we'll, dink. We'll find out. Oh, 
All right, let's see. Can you step to the side, dude, a little bit? <laughs> well, let's get him to the boat first. We'll don't worry about their Do you want me to scream and holler like it's bigger? Nah. Okay. What we got? Ah, uh, he's, shoot, he's a 10 or 12, something like that. 10 or 12, okay. Oh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and net him just to be on the safe side. Okay, he's hooked about as perfect as you can ask. So oh, yeah. There we go. Let's see if we can't get that. Fish on. See, Jeremy was downriver having a heck of a, just fighting all the, the debris and sticks and everything else. Goes up, gets in cleaner water, marks the fish, gets above them, throws the bait back, and gets paid off. Success. That's great. Well, Tim, you were great. right. It, it was beyond dink. Yeah. Yeah, it's beyond dink. Not a whole lot of beyond dink but you know i'm those dinks are just they got that different wavelength you know and those big fish even if they're they're just they can peck at baits and it's just different and i, I can't describe it i i wish i could but i know when i move into an area whether i'm getting dinks or not and a lot to to a lot of people they look the same they look almost Exactly the same. To a lot of people who don't well, catch like catfish, that it would be a big catfish. <laughs> oh, absolutely! No, no, that's that's a great catfish. That's a great catfish. So, what what was Especially what's the one video one. where you say catfish ruined? Yes, catfish ruined. That is uh, catfish the ruined. I, I find myself in that position a lot myself yes, too. Yes, 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 and that that is the effect of having caught huge catfish. It is more difficult to appreciate. Hey, that's a great looking fish. Look at that it thing. Sure it's is. like a bodybuilder. That's awesome. Heck yeah. He's uh he, he's every bit of twenty pounds. Nice. Can you bring it close oh, to the camera? And that's right. See, you get them big guys in the boat and they're holding up fish and it makes the fish look small. I, I'm guilty of that. You know, I, yeah. I, it's hard to this, this is a thirty ounce coffee cup, and there you go. Yeah. That that's yeah. my problem with fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Catch, very nice stuff. congratulations guys he's got some kind of fresh red marks on him like he's been there on the rocks lately all right buddy. yeah how do you uh oh, real quick hagan's got a question he would love to hear uh your thoughts on hook size he sees a lot of guys using hook huge hooks before you answer that um i'm of the school of thought where match the size of your hook to the size of the bait you're using Am I wrong in thinking that? What's your opinion right. on hook size? Yeah. Is too big, too big? Is too small, too small? What do you have to say about right. that? Uh, no. hey, this one, that. and I've, I've put a lot of thought into this. I mean, a ton. Oh. Because, you know, I fish back. And I'll try not to make this a big, long, epic story. But back a long time ago, you know, 25 years ago, our local stores, there was no internet. Our local stores are even like bait shops didn't really have anything except for a gigantic O'Shaughnessy hook or a small bass hook. So am I going to use an O'Shaughnessy style stainless steel gigantic hook that, you know, like literally is, you know, this long and the gaps like that. And it's got this mm -hmm. big shark hook. And I got to tell you a story. So I've got, one of those, of course, and I think he, even in Fisherman tried to kind of say it was good. I forget. I think it was the LO42 Eagle Claw, these giant hooks. So uh, Catfish Heroes, I took him fishing to a flathead spot and uh, put that on there. You know, we, we, we used the big giant hook, and I mean, these things are pretty thick, and he's got a bluegill on about like that, and his rod, get, this is back in the old 808 days or 888s with, you know, like mm -hmm. his boogie good a rod as we could do and it pulls his rod down like this he sets the hook as hard as he can he's got it on for a while and it's big i know it's big because it's not doing a whole bunch of weird side to side movement there's no rolling going on it's just full on down like this and all of a sudden the hook pops out now why is that most likely because that hook and that barb is so huge that that rod could not transfer enough power to penetrate that fish very well that is probably because he had it on long enough. We know it, he didn't just have the bait. The hook was in the mouth. It was there. It's just not enough to sink past the barb. So I've got a hundred stories like that, that led me to what I think about hook size. I think you can get by with larger hooks 
as long as the diameter isn't so thick, thick like those exactly. those big uh, like those big saltwater type circle hooks. Mm -hmm. They just thick because you know you need so much more penetration power for that so i like a thin wire hook i like a a seven knot daiichi circle chunk light which is now the team catfish double action circle hook yes i can is. tell you a story about that one too so i like that one and i have started to use some 10 knots but i only use the big 10 knots when i'm in giant shark waters i mean big big fish waters for flatheads i think it's unnecessary to use the 10 knot because I, I mean, I sometimes I'll even downsize to a five aught for fifty pound flatheads. Because if, like you said, I I don't want such a huge hook that it's overpowering my bait. So if I've downsized, I'll be like, Sean, hand me a, or you know Garrett, hand me a five aught, or I'll I'll get a five aught myself. So we might be in like epic big flathead waters, and I'm still going to reach for that five aught. I'm still going to reach for that seven knot. The ten knot, you know. Now, if I'm down, if I'm on the Mississippi down south, if I'm at Keokuk and Dead Man's Hole, or if I'm, you know, fishing a sunken barge in 35 foot of water, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll take some ten knots. But of course, I'm going to use bigger baits for the tens. But if 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 these fish are not aggressive enough to take in a big bait and then move off with it, I've just done myself a disservice. disservice I used definitely. I used a large piece of moon eye on that uh on my epic catfish adventure trip down there and i had to take down from obviously a fish well over 50 pounds and i it still haunts me right now because i used a piece of bait about yay long and i hooked it in the eyes and all i needed to do was take one more cut and i'd have caught that fish and that fish could have been anywhere between 50 and 150 and if you watch that video, that takedown, there was no shake to it. It was all one very slow motion. It was a slow motion in some of the fastest current that you could find to fish. So that fish was a big, I mean, a, bit, a slobber knocker of yep. whatever proportions. It might have been mega proportions. It might have been a world record. I don't know. But it still haunts me because I did, I just, for some reason, I threw on a big bait and did not given the activity level because the activity level is on its drop because it was the day before that it was at its height so usually it doesn't last more than about two or three days so i got activity level doing a nosedive even though we're still catching good fish i had one shot at that big fish and i blew it i blew it been there <laughs> oh. drives me nuts uh, uh i feel your pain uh flint hill Get catfish right mark tim i wonder yeah. if smaller yeah. fish Hit the bait in a way to kill it, whereas big fish aren't concerned as much about that. Bri so they kill it before they take it in. Maybe I'm not quite sure, but I believe it's something to that effect. Maybe I don't. I don't know as much about blues because I haven't seen it with my own eyes. But I've seen it with my own eyes with big channel cats because I've had big channel cats out in my thousand gallon tank, and I throw in live bluegills and pop. They pop them and they shake them, spit them. Pop them, shake them, spit them, and and you, you're you're a Fox River fisherman, so you know what channel cats do. I mean, it's like yeah, it's they a kill all my green sunfish. Oh, like it's nothing. Absolutely. Like it's going out of style. <laughs> kill them, and it's hard to get them to eat them. You know, because there's something attached to it. And I used to, of course, get all crazy and attach lines to them and stay out of sight on my thought. Because I got to do a video on this thing. It's a big big giant round white tank it's got current flowing in it and all this stuff it's about four foot deep of water and i used to hook up some shad and throw them in there without hooks i actually put used a darning needle put them through because I, I wanted to see what they would do because if i let them free float if i let the baits that i throw in free float those channel cats would they would take them they would take them they would take them but as soon as i put a little bit of tension on that and spit and spit and spit and sometimes never go back to it so i wanted to know how much tension was too much tension when their activity level wasn't very high when it's very high almost no tension is too much i mean shoot they'll try to pull the yeah, rod in the water but i think competition and current has a lot to do with that too in my experience you know if there's a lot of competition there they're going to want to hit run they're going to want to be opportunistic and, and get away with with their spoils of of war so to speak is the way yeah. I kind of look at it. Yeah. But if there's there's no current, yeah. there isn't many fish out there, 
there it, that's when you're getting not as not as a positive a bite as as you'd like you or so. or when they're pl when, when there's plenty of food and they're mm -hmm. they're basically True. satiated but yet if you presented a bait close enough to them you're like ah yeah I'll, I'll take that you know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll eat that just like after Thanksgiving, I don't want to go up to the, you know, get back to the table. But if I'm watching the football game and somebody brings me something really nice and really good, yeah, I'll eat, I'll eat it. It's almost that same thing. Yeah, I said I could eat syndrome. You know, you're not hungry, but somebody puts that yeah. scoop yeah, ice cream yeah. on that pie in front of you, and it's like, oh boy, there goes my, there goes my you diet. Know what? I think that's one of the best analogies that there is for winter fishing. Because their metabolism slow. It's really, mm -hmm. really slow. They're like snakes. It might take up to three, four, five, six, seven days. So, I mean, they get, after a while, they get food stacked up. And so almost every bite that they do is like kind of lackadaisical, except for a few of the ones that are the outliers of the group. You know, the, the ones that have been down here, they haven't been fed very good. And then you get some it's just like Stan's, uh, Stan's son caught a 55 or a 53 up in five foot of water. Well, we yes, know that's did. not the norm. We, are, we know it is not the norm, but he caught that mm -hmm. that rare fish, and the winter time actually made that ha uh, made it be able to happen because normally on the James, those big fish do not come that shallow. They don't have to, but evidently with uh, yeah, you story of my whatever, life, life, whatever reason. Yeah, absolutely. And, and sometimes you just have one fish that's meaner than others. Absolutely. You know, you got that aggressive overachiever, I like to call them, and, 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 and you come across them, and they're always fun to come across, definitely. But that, that kind of just puts a monkey wrench in, in the whole situation and what you've got figured out, I found out. so. And, Mark, you're absolutely right, and I have a, a great supporting story for that. So okay. a friend of mine, well, he ended up being a friend of mine. He was a DNR uh, biologist in the Pekin area. And uh, his name is Rob Hilsenbeck. He ended up getting um, some flatheads from a smaller tributary river. So, and they were they were tiny. So I took them home, mm -hmm. put them in my tank. And over the course of six months, uh, you could see the aggressive nature of two of them and the non-aggressive nature of the other two. And they started in... Uh, one of them started eating way more regular than the other ones. And one of, and I used to pay attention to him a lot. And so basically we, we, out of four fish, we got one bully in the tank. He's getting bigger than the other ones by the week. And pretty soon he, and to make a long story short, he outgrew the other ones and ate them. So when you said some are more aggressive than others, it's an absolute fact. So, so you feel that dominance does exist in, in, in the catfish world? Absolutely it does. It, just like everything else. Just, I mm -hmm. mean, there's dominance. The only thing that dominance, we've kind of just kind of just in the last few hundred years gotten rid of that as a you know, kind of social construct. But uh, dominance, yeah. I mean, all is, is is that just our way of thinking? Because could the a fish just be more aggressive and more successful? Because when I think of dominance, I'm thinking of it dominance. I'm thinking of it in human terms, where I'm trying to get out of that mind frame where I'm comparing fish to us, wildlife to us, where it's a yeah. totally different way of, sure. of of reacting. I don't even want to say thinking. I think they're more reactive. Am I mistaken in in thinking that? No, I I think you're right. I think fish especially uh dominant fish are going to be dominant as far as real estate they are going to put pressure on the other fish as far as you know they're going to hold their ground they're going to fight more they're going to really make another fish pay and as that fish grows they become more and more and more dominant as far as you know, being able to uh, really attack other fish, uh, I've got a little video that's coming out before I talk at the uh, the catfish conference, and uh, Sean catches a twenty five pound fish right at the height of the spawn, and it's got bite mark on it like this big, right on its gill plate, mm -hmm. and I've seen it with, with my own eyes where flatheads will suck onto the belly side of another flathead and literally drive them and smash them off the end of a tank. I mean, it's very violent, 
and and I, I once when my kids were small, I had to get rid of flatheads because they made so much noise at night. <laughs> One flathead was fine, but they made so much noise. I was constantly cleaning up water. I mean, it is just crazy. I mean, yeah. Jeremy was pointing to something. You got something going on, Jeremy? Are you getting some taps? Yeah, I'm getting a, uh, I'm, I'm I'm getting tapped on my little spinning rod on the left side here. It ain't nothing. It ain't nothing serious just yet, but I'm watching it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's starting to uh, it's starting to rain again. All the uh, pelicans got their heads cut down now. Yeah. Oh, back to the whole birds thing that I, I wanted to bring up. Um, I've run into situations where we'll have like a comrade or something near hunting bait. Now I'm thinking, okay, the bait's here, the bait's here, and on numerous occasions that comrade's disappeared. When that comrade disappears, that's when I'll catch a fish. That's when an angler that's with me, whether it's on a bank or in the boat, catches a fish. Um, are they that worried about being, cons well, a lot of the times they're big muskies, like 50-inch muskies I see come out when that happens. But flatheads come out of that water at that same time. So uh, I, I kind of been, been kind of studying that, um, and, and I'm also finding it to be true when I'm channel catfishing. As soon as the comrade disappears, I used to think that it was just the bait that was gone. But when they move the bait moves when they totally disappear that tells me that something's going on under the water am i mistaken in thinking so am i imagining things this is no, what i'm trying to i don't think out. you'd be imagining things i mean and down where we're at down in this region and lower we don't really have the kind of clear water type situation that you do up there if you're fishing lakes and smaller mm -hmm. streams and stuff like that Ours is more turbid, so I don't think it's as exaggerated down here. We don't really, I don't really uh, see like, uh, but but I, I have spent a lot of time fishing those kind of waters up north where you're at, and yeah, I think those fish are, I mean those those fish birds are predators of all kinds of fish, and I think, yeah, I mean if you've been a if you're a catfish and you can actually remember that long, I don't know if you can. But uh, I'm sure there's a, a lot of a fish are like, oh, boy, there's some sort of big predator acting in a predator manner. So, yeah, they could just say, well, we're, we're just not going to eat right now. We're just going to yeah, watch We're, we're gone. Yeah. And, I mean, they, they disappear. And I watch them pretty close because I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to what's going on, like almost to a point of dysfunction when I'm fishing. We had talked about this a little bit <laughs> yeah. about like my videos and stuff. But that's one of the weird things that I wanted to bring up that I've that I've definitely noticed. And I've seen like a Fox River, I think it was 54-inch musky come out when that happened oh, wow. one time, right here at, El at Algonquin Dam. Uh, it was Algonquin. a pretty cool day to see that fish come out. Yeah. Uh, that's right where I fish there, just north of there. I, uh, I went on a, a stint when I was younger of wade fishing a lot of those. You know, so I'm, I'm familiar with Algonquin. I'm familiar with Montgomery. I'm familiar with uh, a lot of those. And then mm -hmm. I got on to Wedron once I had a jet boat. And Wedron Pool is one of the most amazing pools in the Fox, I believe, because there's a lot of uh, sandstone. It's more like the lower, lower Fox. And so mm -hmm. you'll go in a little bitty offshoot. It's like a mini Wisconsin river. Yeah, that, that's where Stilly, who asked a question earlier from Stilly Outdoors, that's where he fishes a lot. I'm familiar oh, with that just oh. from his videos. Yeah, I so. mean, he. I got to start watching those videos because, I mean, there's a lot of people that so – I'm kind of new to YouTube. I really have only been on it since the pandemic hit, really, so maybe a year. And I don't get a lot mm -hmm. of time to, like, watch stuff. I wish I could watch everybody's stuff. Sean does. Yeah, me too stuff he, he's like hey you need to watch this you need to watch that i'm like oh okay but um yeah that wedron pool is 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 kind of neat because uh, it the there's there's a lot of when the when the water's fairly shallow it comes across and then dumps down like this goes over and pops back up so you've got that current going this way you got that backwards current along the bottom it holds what I would say big flatheads for the fox, 25, 30 pounds, 15, lots of 15s, lots of fives and tens. And it can be a fantastic day. I mean, it's beautiful. You just got to make sure your boat doesn't run over any kayakers or tubers and you're all right. I believe that's the size that he's uh, he's catching most often too. So that would explain a lot. What do you got going on, J Jeremy? We got something to... I'm getting taps on two different rods on opposite sides of the boat. So, <laughs> Well, good. We'll, we'll have to see what's going on here. So how long have you been in that spot, Jeremy? Uh, we got here right at 10 o'clock. 
Okay, so half an hour. Now, what's your opinion on on moving and how often when you're looking for the big cats? Um, it, it kind of depends on where I'm at. There's certain spots that I won't stay in for more than 45 minutes, and there's other spots I've been known to stay in for for two hours because, uh, especially when the fish are really really active during the warm weather months, I know a lot of fish move through certain areas that I fish. So sometimes I'm willing to sit there a little longer and see if I can catch some moving through. That uh that that big ledge that I fish downstream from here, that's one of those spots that I don't mind sitting in it for more than an hour just because of how many fish travel that spot. And there there is a big difference between uh, fish holding areas and fish moving areas as that's far right. as how you would fish it. So I mean that that's uh that's a pretty pretty you know, pretty far along ideal that Jeremy is talking about. Mm -hmm. So you know, as you progress into catfish and you, you understand, you start to understand, okay, there's holding zones that fish are there all the time. And sometimes they're just placed in little different areas and you have to get your rods and reels, you know, you get your baits in front of them and constantly be moving and all this stuff. Those are more like what I described as a basin hole. And then there's those areas that that funnel fish in, in a moving pattern and then kind of stop them for a little bit and you can deal with them there. So, you know, move travel routes and holding zones. I fish them totally different. Yeah. And I spend and more you, time on one than the other. Uh -huh. And how do you what's the best way to identify those holding ones and travel traveling areas? Well, sometimes I suspect that it's a travel and a lot of them look very similar. It's kind of a subtle thing. So let's just say you've got a, a pretty defined ledge and nothing really on the bottom. It, it's just kind of flat. There's, there's nothing, there's no really dips going, there, there's no drops, no humps, no sticks or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yet it will still funnel fish because that ledge is fairly steep and it will funnel them right to you. That is what I would, that's one type of area I would call a, a traveling fish thing. And you can set up to ambush fish on that. There's no doubt. But I like to go to places, uh, I like to, the epic spots that are, they're already traffic jammed for me. Okay, so I don't have to really rely on hoping fish move. It's they've already moved there. And I like to move my stuff around according to how I've marked fish and how that current is orienting around all of that, that whole process. Thank you, sir. Holy moly, them are the big ones. Get ready because we got the we <laughs> giant tower red bulls. Oh my there gosh, go. you guys aren't I'm not gonna shut up after this. So, anyways, let's just say that the difference between that travel zone and then the holding zone, and I could I could translate this to a smaller river situation, like a medium-sized river, pretty easily. So you've got the rock river, which some of you guys are familiar with the rock, some of them most probably aren't, but it's it's a faster flowing shallower type river but yet it has rock channels that goes throughout it like that and most of the time most of the heads are in that but they'll move from spot to spot but they won't really just sit like in a travel like like a, a ledge like this because all they're doing is going from one specific hole to the next specific hole which would be a holding zone you can set up on there but Odds are they're going to miss your baits totally because that is not their their main priority and their prime directive. Is they don't really move around looking for fish. They're going from one ambush spot to the next ambush spot. So if I set up on that, I might catch a few fish, but it's not going to be near what it is if, if I come up to the next drop or rise right along that 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 highway. So you got a highway, then they're they're coming up, and then all of a sudden it rises right in here and and still you still sometimes have to wait for that because if there's no basin hole attached if there's no whatever it's just it just sort of cuts off that driveway you know that that whole corridor you still are gonna have to sit there but i feel better if i'm there where there's a migration stopper and then they have to kind of navigate around it and move around i have better luck there very cool. Hagen Grubbs has a question. Boat noise, such as idling around, uh, around over a whole, a hole full of fish. How much yeah. does it matter in your experience? So, going over a hole of fish with your boat, even idling, 
any okay. effect on them? I cannot tell you as far as blues. I don't think it has any sort of any sort of adverse effect as far as blues. I also know that I have literally jammed my boat on top of four foot deep water with trees, taken rods and thrown them down into the right spots and had flatheads bite almost immediately. So I actually crashed my entire boat, <sighs> not crash, like whatever, but just drove it up on this piece of cover and caught flatheads on this side and caught flatheads on this side in only four foot of water. Flatheads are not really uh, boat shy. Now, the other thing, I've, I've got another anecdotal thing, is I had a guide trip from a guy in Chicago. He was a younger guy. And he said, well, what about boat noise? I said, well, let me show you about this boat noise right here. And, and uh, I said, well, so so on the Scary River, there's a, a narrow pass where about half of the river is only about this deep. And then the other half is only about this deep. It's really fast. I mean, it's not deep at all. And I said, I said, what I want you to do is I want you to put your rod down tip and see how deep this is. And he said, okay, it's only about two feet. I said, we just drove over this. I threw the anchor out and I said, we're going to throw baits right in this zone that that's the only place they could be. They can't be in that really shallow water. They're in that right there. If they, I said, if we catch a fish within a minute, I said, you know what's going on. And we caught three fish within about three, four minutes. And he's like, yeah, he bet me $20 on that and lost, actually. Oh, wait, does Jeremy have something on? Looks like something's going on. Yep. Yep. There it is. Fish there it is. Oh, look at me, he got off. Rookie. Ah, he got off. Uh, yep, missed it. He's loaded up good. Y'all quit talking and nervous. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, uh, he didn't have the hook. See, what you got to do, Creole, is you got to start talking more. And when you're talking and get into conversations, when it's going to happen. It's like walking to your truck to go get something. That's when the fish always bite. Let me ask you this. Here's a off the well. Actually, Justin had a question. I want to make sure uh, I don't miss yeah, out on this. He says, "When anchored, should you shut off your electronics, uh, or is he wrong thinking that it spooks fish?" Talking about uh, fishing in lakes specifically. I would say, I would say, evidence that I've seen, it does not tell me that I need to shut my electronics off because I've literally caught flatheads, blues, or channel cats directly under the boat. I mean, directly under the boat uh, with my electronics on. But that doesn't mean that I'm completely right about that because we know fish are sensitive creatures. We know that they, they are built to accept or recept sound. So depending on what that wavelength is, it's possible that the people that made fish finders have a higher wave frequency that they don't detect as well because otherwise, it would be just like a fish moving in water like this, sending low frequency vibrations, and then it would hit their, their lateral lines and their swim bladders. So if that was the case, and we know we can irritate fish using live baits, like flatheads get it in their face, blah, 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 that, that's, they, they, we know we can irritate them into eating it. But well, you know, they, with fish finders, I don't think the wavelength is that same type of irritation to them because otherwise they would start avoiding our boats yeah, with our would. fish fighters on and, and they would i mean because i mean sean and i i mean just to give you an example we may be anchored for an hour or two and we still have fish move up underneath the boat and trounce rods right under right underneath the trounce transducer i'll, I'll transducer. bet you thing happened you know, that, that yeah. brings up a, a question in my mind. I don't know for sure. Um, I do have a ham radio license, so I got a good idea of how, how frequencies work and such. And it's not something that we can hear with our human ear. Uh, but I know for a fact, especially in like an ice sonar for like ice fishing, you can hear that ticking. And, and that makes yeah, me yeah. wonder where that sound comes from. So but it doesn't seem to scare fish in that situation. And the only reason why I bring that one to be is because I definitely know that it doesn't there. Whether or not the catfish are more receptive or or or, or, or to that sound or that those frequencies, I, I don't know. Um, now, but it's cool. Justin, Justin, that was a great question because I have often pondered that myself, and you will 
I mean, if you fished with me, you would notice there's times I do shut it off. Um, I don't know why I think it because, you know, just like you said, I hear that tick, 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 tick. And I'm like, is this loud enough? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely loud enough. Yeah, I'm hearing the tick. I know that it's sending sound out. I know that it's doing whatever. And sometimes for some odd reason, not when the fishing's going good, because when the fishing's going good, I don't care. But when the fish is going bad, I want to do, I want to shut everything off. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to get, I want to get, I mean, I want to hunker down in the boat. I want to, you know, make sure everything's just right. I want to shut the lights off, turn the cameras off. And I, and, and I want to, you know, be, get in stealth mode. And, uh, you know, most of the time that doesn't work either. Because if the bite's off, it's off. Usually there's almost nothing a guy can do, it, you know. Uh, Lynn Leeper would like to know what's your favorite rig to use uh, for catfishing, Tim. All right. My favorite is your standard rig. You got your your sinker, slides through the line. Then I have a bead. Then I have, and this is going to be unusual to people. I like large brass snap swivels. I love snap swivels. <laughs> I do too, and people are afraid of them. Because they, they're saying, well, because they've had t small snap swivels, fail on them. But by the time you graduate to those big ones, I don't have a fail on me. Even, you know, like that monster fish that I caught on film, mm -hmm. that was a snap swivel. And then I use 80-pound Berkeley big game that is, <laughs> that's actually spooled on an old pin 330 GTI. I put it into a, a like an ammo box drilled a hole through it and left it on clicker. So I just pull it out, clip it off, tie it up, get ready. And then, oh, then a, a seven, uh, which, or an eight odd. It's, it's actually the old seven. And I always call them seven odds because that's when we first started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess uh, a, a Daiichi circle chunk light, which now gets sold by team catfish as an eight odd. It was a seven up back in like 20 some years ago when I first started going to the James River. And TTI had sent me this box of every circle hook that they made. It was like this big, you know. And out of all the circle hooks, I just picked that one up and I said, this one makes the most sense to me. And I said to Todd Carlander, which was in the vehicle with me at the time, he's from Chicago, by the way. He says, this circle hook looks like it could be used. And I hadn't even used one yet, I'd just gotten it in the mail. This thing looks like you could just about set the hook with this. And he's like, wow, that does make sense. So we used them. Uh, we used two of those, cir those circle chunk lights on Chris Harris's boat. And he was using the Gamagatsus on, uh, on four other rods. And our hookup ratio was like 100% for that day. And his was about 60. And he's oh, like, hey, you got any more of them red circle hooks? You got to know Chris. He, he's like ripping on the red. He's like, oh, that's dumb. He's like, and pretty soon he's like, I gave one of the red circle hooks. Yeah, I love yeah. red circle hooks. I use them for yeah. trout for everything. They 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 work for me. You know, I got to. You use mono basically for your main line, correct? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, I do, but I, I do have some uh, some super line uh, in the boat. Okay. I'm not I'm not new... asking for preferences or something. I'm just yeah. wondering if you found this, yeah. which is what I'm finding. Those hooks that you're talking about, the the I, I don't want to bring up the brands or anything. Um, yeah. with, with braid and shallow water, I have terrible luck with them. As soon as I switch to like a standard mustad demon circle hook, when yeah. I'm using my braid because I like to use braid in my situation, I'm, yeah. I'm not a mono hater whatsoever. I yeah. get way better hookups with that. Even if I'm setting them or whatever, uh, for some reason, I just can't get them to stick. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. I don't believe I'm smelling them wrong. I don't smell them, smell them any different than any other hook I do, but that's what I'm finding. And I actually switched over to mono on a couple of reels and it improved my hookup. So yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if that, that stretch has something to do with such setting those double action hooks. It does. And, and I'll get to that in just a second. I just glanced over and saw Lynn Leaper. Yes. 80 pound leader and 50 pound uh, main line is what I use. And it, both of them are Berkeley big game. I use the high viz yeah. on my main line. So, so that I, you know, can see what's going on. So to answer your, uh, that kind of question, or just to give you a little bit of uh, background about what I do, my guide trip days really affected the way I think about line. And I used graphite rods sometimes. I used some power line and things like, like that uh, when I was first 
doing the guide trip thing and i had a lot more failure as far as fish getting off and i fished a lot of rocks stuff like that and and i find that a more a little bit more limber rod a little bit longer rod and mono if, whether it's 20 pound test or 50 pound test since that stretch is way more forgiving and mm -hmm. mistakes happen less and less it's so, more forgiving, know, definitely. It is way more forgiving and way easier to deal with and stuff like that. But I'm not saying that if you don't get to an expert level as a cat fisherman and you fish certain situations, that, that that's the case. Because I think it's kind of fun because I, I, I put some 65-pound or 80-pound Power Pro on one of my rigs this last year when we were fishing down in, in uh, St. Louis with Sean and man it makes a 50 pound fish one of the most exciting fights in the world because i mean it is direct right straight to you it's like yeah. every single jolt like this and it's mm -hmm. going just ripping stuff and i'm like oh my gosh this thing feels like an 80 and it's it's 45 pounds I'm like holy <laughs> moly when, when i'm using when i'm using braid and i'm using a uh j hooks right it depends on yeah. the time of the year there's something about that you, you you get that bait clicker that goes zip you know he's inhaled it yeah Pick up the rod nice and gently, and when you can feel that fish gills flaring on the line, that gets your blood pumping too. That's yeah. one of the other reasons I like braid. I, I I like being able to feel everything that's going on, especially when I'm fishing J hooks. My other reason why braid works for me is I'm fishing real heavy cover, real close. I need yeah. to get that fish out before it gets stuck. Also, that's my boat. When they get under my boat in five feet of water, it's with mono. I've had nothing but disasters happen. Then gotcha, gotcha. I need to manhandle them, fish the best I can. Because you're fishing, you're fishing tight. Yeah, tight stuff. You know, other than I, that, I, like I, I said, I have no problem with mono. I like mono. I use mono for everything yeah. else. The only thing, the only thing I use, I'm trying, I use Berkeley Fireline, which I think is a composite, but that's for salmon yeah. fishing. That's a total different yeah. animal. But. Yeah. You know, Mark, you have such probably one of the mo more unique fishing situations that you'll see in this middle part of the country, because uh, you know I, you can go you can go not too far south and be in a whole different whole different situation. You can go a little bit north and be in a whole different north. situation than you are in now. So, I mean, Chicago is I mean it's got a lot of sportsmen, and, and people don't think of it that way. They don't think that Chicago has thirty sportsmen's clubs, and they have lots they of. Do. We have lots of air and it's it's pretty uh it's it's pretty loaded down with that stuff and you get such a wide variety you got your crappie guys and you got your salmon guys and you got your you know freak uh salmon uh, situation you know the you know bass the, guys the musky guys small bass mouth guys, oh. yep catfish all kinds of crazy stuff up there and it's really kind of cool you know, and and I've taken part in, in in probably all of those, which I think is is good. So I just want everybody to know, even though you love catfish, don't be afraid to try other things. You learn something from everything. Yeah. There isn't one thing yep. that I haven't. So yeah, and it's a cool place so, to fish too. I, I can go downtown yeah. Chicago, at least I have in the past, and and get a limit of perch. You know, bring them home and have a great yeah. meal. You know, and then the, and oh, then yeah. the next day I'm on the ice catching you know walleye and stuff. So wow, who can, yeah, can, yeah. Who can argue yeah. with that? It's yeah, it's a heck of a place, except for the politics. I like Illinois, but that's another story. Ooh, ooh, we're not even going to go there because those towns people there. wish the politics would fall into Lake Michigan. There you go. <laughs> we can agree on that. Yeah. Uh, let's see what we got here from and the, and the taxes. Exactly. You ain't kidding. No. Uh, I am kind of proud of my hook set uh, with any style circle <laughs> with mono or braid. I got that stuff perfected. Uh, all my videos, I use circles. Uh, my hookup ratio and my casting skills are actually uh, practice at. Oh, he actually practices. Actually, I practice at. Yeah. Like, well, and you know, hook setting guys, circle hooks. <laughs> yes. Is that yeah, a thing? We, we we do it a lot. We don't do it with big blues, but we do it on almost at, well every flathead. Mm -hmm. You talking about the sweeps? Flathead. Yes, the sweeps. The sweeps. Um, you know, channel cats, you know, you're going to see me, uh, some of them you don't have to, some of them you're going to have to, uh, and, and I keep talking to hooked catfish about this because I see them, let me go sideways on this, I keep talking to hooked about it because I've seen his videos where he's in the wintertime on the fox, shallow water, and these things are, they're, they are, they're, they're tapping it, and they're big fish, and they just tap, 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 and then they'll give up, and they just won't load the rod, and he's like, yup, he wasn't taking it, I'm like, 
All right, Jonathan, take that out of the holder like this. And every tap, I want you to feed them down just a little bit like this. Until because some something about big channel cats, especially in the winter time, and sometimes in the pre spawn, sometimes even in the summer, if you can feed them down line a little bit, they'll actually get a little bit more confidence on that and get it into their mouth. And when I learned that, that uh, you know, when I learned that, it, it, that was huge, huge for my fishing. And and uh, Jonathan, is, I love Jonathan, love Jonathan. That guy is he is not only is he a great guy. But he actually, he's, he, he yeah. reminds me a lot of myself a long time ago, where if you got half a day, you're, you're going fishing somewhere. He's not afraid to go three, four hours yeah. for three hours of fishing, pushes it through. It's freaking freezing cold and everything else. That's, that, that, that's awesome. But I, I, he's I an hope animal. he is an animal. And, and, and an I animal. hope that he will learn that technique. And maybe he won't like it. <laughs> I don't know. Because some guys like to just let him pull that circle hook down but if he if he does that he's he's gonna see a a, a whole new little world open up to him and uh you know he's he's a great fisherman it's just that's Absolutely. as a matter of fact that's the only thing that i saw that i've learned in my past that i could help try to pass on to jonathan that might help him out might not but i i think i think it will it's, it's pretty cool it's it's almost like uh I don't, I don't know any other species I could lend that type technique to, except for like uh, if you're using like live baits and you're fishing for pike. So the pikes, they're not going to just pull on this thing. It's almost like chomp, 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 mm -hmm. chomp, and you got to feed that down to them because too much pressure and they're going to let it off. It's almost yep. exactly like that. Absolutely. I wouldn't be surprised if Jonathan's out there fishing and listening right now. If you are, Jonathan, hey, what's going on? I also want to say thanks for everybody that's uh, uh, out here in chat. I appreciate it. Um, uh, looks like everybody's hitting the like button. I appreciate it. If you're not a subscriber, I'd love to have you subscribe. Uh, if you're on Facebook or Instagram or something, we'd also love to share. Uh, the more people we can get in here, the better. I appreciate it. So uh, uh, that being said, what's going on, Jeremy? How you doing, bud? Yeah. Yes, we, we made a slight move. We dropped back about, uh, I'd say, about 75 feet. And our okay. response boat and kind of moved, moved all the lines back some. And I'm, I'm already getting one playing with my spinning rod right here. And uh, you did make the bait switch? Yeah, yeah. We had switched the baits a little while ago. Uh, shoot, that big that big donkey bait on that big rod, that thing is still bleeding. Still is? Good. That good, good, good. The donkey bait. That's awesome. So uh, is visually inspecting your bait good enough? I know I know. for me personally, I'll, uh, I'll pull a bait out of the water and I'll, I'll literally squeeze it. If I can squeeze it and there's still a good bit of blood coming out, I'll, I'll put it back in. But uh, if there's no blood coming out anymore, it, it's getting swapped out. That, that's me. I, I've been known to smell a bait. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> I'll smell them. I'll step on them. Everything, and if that doesn't work, then that's when I'm definitely switching them out. But fresh bait's always better. Oh yeah. And I, I also hey, like hey. the idea that I'm incorporating that you guys have kind of taught me that I've learned is uh, uh, get some of that spinal fluid going. That's 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 a big plus for me. Oh yeah. Hey, Mark, if you'll keep talking with Jeremy, I'll go get this business done real quick, and I'll be right back. No problem. We'll take you off. When you come back, we'll put you back on, all right? Wait, that'll work. All right. What's going on, my friend? How you doing, Jeremy? Uh, it's the, the bikes are getting a little more serious on this rod. All right. Well, that's cool. Oh, Mark, I wanted to tell you, when you were talking about braid versus mono, I know from a lot of bass fishing, I learned the difference between the bite and the hook sets. And a lot on the bass, I'd use a slightly heavier rod for heavy cover, and I could not rip it like I do at mono because I could rip the lip off a of bass. So I would assume with these circle hooks, you have to be a lot more ginger not to rip that circle hook out a lot easier. Hmm. It so much more sudden than the mono does. I usually let the, uh, my circle hooks work for me. If there's any question, I'll do that whole sweeping motion. But uh, I definitely think there's a... Um, a 
correlation between the the types of hooks you're using and and, and the type of line you're using i mean uh, you, you get this big long equation that's exponential and and once you start adding things up the right way it's when you you're fine-tuning that technique but then again that's advanced that doesn't mean that you can't just go out and and and, and catch catfish uh, uh with whatever you got in your arsenal so uh definitely uh twisted fish and tv says new dip plate flavor is spinal tap fluid <laughs> hey you never know thomas little page hey what's going on as Ooh. long as you don't take you know what uh, it's funny you say that thomas because you know what uh, a breakfast fan well shad scales does nothing for a breakfast biscuit i can tell you that from experience so nothing at all Oh it, oh, it does something for it, all right, but it ain't nothing good. Nothing positive. That's what I should have said. <laughs> no, 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 no. Does anybody scale their bait for catfish? I'm sorry. You guys are kind of hard to hear a little bit. Oh, I was in the front of the boat. Is that Okay. Good? Does anybody scale their bait for any certain baits for catfish? Um, I, I do definitely on some cut baits. Um, there's this... You know, we'll 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 talk to Epic too a little bit. Um, maybe the people in chat can say, but uh, um, there there's those that believe it it helps give off even more scent when you do scale them, yeah. which would make sense. You know, it's like peeling and taking the peel off a, an orange. You definitely smell more orange, right? But I know for uh, hopefully I can get on the gar this spring and get mm -hmm. deals of it, but I have to scale the gar because those alligator gar are really really picky. They'll sit there and chew on a bait like a live brim until it's completely, uh, completely scaleless before they swallow it. Mm. So with garfish, you have to completely hide the hook inside the bait and scale them to try to get the gar to actually swallow the whole thing, or they'll spit it out every time because they're just extremely picky. Very interesting. I've never uh, gar is actually one of my uh, bucket list fish. Uh, it's something I'd like to catch one of these days. Ah, uh, hey, you know, you know all what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come come down and visit you. Well, welcome back, Tim. How are you? Up, oh, I can't hear you. Oh, well, let me take you off mute. My bad. All right, you're off mute. I apologize okay. for that. So right now up I by can you, you, I fished with a friend of mine, and I can't remember exactly. We only went one time, but. It's on the Cal Sag. There's, a, it's like the lowest dam right there. There's an island below it, and it has wicket gates at the top. And we got on to five to six foot long nose gar, like I've never been on in my life, and it was crazy. We were using light baits for flatheads, and I started noticing some gar, so I slipped on a balloon, threw it out there uh, below that, and it was great. I mean, giant. I mean, they, they were like this big around too. They were wow. huge. And I don't know if that was just a circumstance that they were up there, or I suspect they're up there all the time. But, uh, yeah, if you want to get on good gar, that's a good place to go. Nice. You know, I worked on the Cal Sag for a while back when I was in the oil business, okay. working on the barges and stuff, and I caught some monster carp while waiting for them barges on the hook. Oh, that was a long time ago. You know, the, the barge guys had a question about. We had a question. Well, we, we had a short okay. discussion about scaling cut bait. Is it a oh. good idea to scale them? There's that thought that they, they, they give off more scent in doing so, and other people that say don't matter. What's your opinion on that? There's guys that do it. I mean, there's tournament guys that do it. And my last two videos on the uh, uh, the Tennessee River system, we went with one tournament guy the first day, another tournament guy the second day. And the, the, first, the guy on the first day did not – scale his baits the second guy todd does all the time and it doesn't matter if it's a you know a two foot golden sucker he's going to scale that thing and i i even made the comment i said yeah and aaron does it in my boat and it it's like it snowed in my boat by the time we get three or four bait i mean it just scales everywhere flying everywhere. around hit you in the face and all that stuff and i'm like okay well i think a lot of things is what you can believe in i confidence yeah, I and really, uh, the best bait is the bait that you have the best confidence in. The best, you know, the best style is is what is paying off for you. What has paid off in the past? What's going to pay off tomorrow? And what paid off yesterday? So, you know, I, I don't really have an opinion on that. Except for me personally, I don't scale any any baits unless unless I think that the scales are going to get in the way of that hook point. I really I really don't. Like with a big carp or something like that, right. definitely, right? 
But but then again, I would say to myself is at what level do I need to make sure to get any fish in the boat? If I needed to get as many fish as I contacted, like if I, if I was in a tournament, I would probably lend towards scaling that bait a little bit more than I do just personal fishing. Mm-hmm. You know, because I'm of the opinion that, you know, if, if, if I'm not catching fish, I, my first opinion is I'm doing something wrong. I'm not in the right location. I'm not presenting my baits correctly. I may have to, you know, I may have to tailor. I listen to what the fish are telling me. So I'm going to say, okay. And I may get to that point where I will throw a, a scaly bait back in the cooler and use a smaller bait if I have to. I might uh, go with a softer bait. I might, you know, instead of the big moon eye, I might start throwing the little moon eye. I might start doing all kinds of stuff until until a fish tells me, yes, Mr. Scott, you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong. And so I am, you know, like I, I have a, a, a lot of uh, respect for people that can go like what Jeremy's doing right now. He's going out even though he knows the bite isn't good. It's winter time. He knows that the odds of landing big fish are a lot lower right now than they are in the spring or in the summer or whatever. He's got a seven foot rise on his river and he's still going out and doing it. And I see guys on YouTube doing it all the time. They already know. They're like, oh, the bite's terrible. It's like, well, they already knew that. I mean, the guys that are doing the live shows from shore, when that bite goes south, when it starts dipping like that and nobody's catching anything, they're still going. I mean, I mm-hmm. do have a lot of respect for that because I was that guy at one time. I mean, it didn't matter if there's a tornado coming. I'm going fishing. But now, since I'm older and I have so much responsibility and it's so expensive for me to go because I have to travel so far. And, my, you know, if, you, if you've ever run a jet outboard, especially a big one, those they things, are, they're, they're expensive to run. I mean, I don't get by on a blue cat trip on a weekend for less than five, six hundred bucks. Wow. That's you know, I don't get by on a flathead trip that's only an hour away for under two hundred and fifty. Two hundred a lot of fuel. By the time you get the, the boat fuel, the, the the truck fuel, by the time you you know uh, spend all that time getting bait, you know, because I may have to travel tw- forty miles one way to go get bait, bring it back to my house put it in the bait tank that cost me money to run you know constantly i'm gonna have i'm gonna lose rigs i've got to buy rods i've got to do all that stuff i'm not complaining about it it is it's just it is what it is i run a jet jet so that i I, it's it's worry free driving for me i mean at Mm -hmm. night i'm not worried about following my pink line as long as i'm in the thing i'm not gonna hit you know as long as there's not wing dike sticking out of the water they can Uh be a foot underneath the water and I'll drive right over them. Uh, you know, yep. if I hit a big log going down the river, I'm not buying a $2,500 lower unit. I just jump up over it. Oh, right. You know? You're done. I, I, I've been in drives, I think uh, yeah. uh, Spencer Bauer over at River Certified just purchased one. He's yeah. getting into the, the guiding game I saw this yeah. morning too. So best of luck to, to uh, Spencer with that stuff. So if you guys Spencer talk to him. Or- very, very well. He's got a big following. I mean, there's going to mm-hmm. be people want to pay to get in the boat with him just because they've been watching him. Not only that, he's a great fisherman. Yeah, and absolutely. he fishes unique situations. And he, he's going to uh, he's going to really enjoy that jet, especially in the area that he's at. That he because can, there, have been times, there have been times when there was laydowns over these smaller rivers all the way across, and I got to get to my fish. So I'm like, all right, customer one, two, or three, hold on, because we're going <laughs> to – we're going to hit this thing and we are going to jump this log that's out, you know, sticking out of the water this far. And uh, I used to have to actually physically take my, uh, uh, my, my transducer and pop it up because it would want to rip my transducer mm-hmm. off. But yeah. now I've got one that comes up pretty easily so I can run over anything. Very nice. Hagen Grubb says, uh, this may, may have been covered before I tuned in. Does Tim believe <clears throat> that when the water drops, you should go to the deepest water around? I've heard that my whole life and was wondering if you agree. Uh, specifically, catfish behaviorally speaking, that is 100% true. Because catfish, of course, do not have a thinking brain. Okay, 
it's, it's very difficult for a catfish to predict what is going to happen tomorrow, the next day, or even in the next hour. They're completely reactive to water levels. And one of the most ancient, uh, one of the most ancient, I would say, not behaviors, but a learn, but and not a learned instinct, but an inherent instinct is when drop when water starts to drop, they need to find deeper water because they risk actually dying. Because if they get stuck, they're gonna and, and channel cats and blues are really good at it. Flatheads not not as much. They're a lot more primitive, and they they tend to get stuck a lot more than the other two because they're they're really keyed in on holding that prime real estate. And they'll they'll actually accept dropping water and just stay located a lot more than the other two. But as soon as let's just say uh, you've got a situation where uh, fish are up into a backwater because the water's been high, as soon as it starts dropping, man, that's one of the first things blues and channel cats do is they get right back to that main mm -hmm. channel. Now, is it necessarily true that they all go from like uh, let's just say your main channel is twenty five foot on average? And then there's like one 50 or 60 foot hole within a few miles, just because the water's dropping doesn't mean they all shoot down to that 50. They still are able to under, they're still able to feel the pressure because remember what we were talking about. You got so yep. many atmospheres. If atmosphere. there's no atmosphere and all of a sudden it starts dropping, then they'll start coming off and going into the deeper. But if they're in relatively deep water, two to three atmospheres and the water's dropping, Usually what that does, in my experience, is just sort of shut fish down a little bit. They're not a confident feeder when that water is dropping, especially when it's hard. They're, all, they're, they're in the, uh, uh, the preserve. It kicks them right back in the preservatory nature. They just want to hold on. Let's, let's hold on. Let's see what see happens. See what happens. Once, uh, uh, you know, and they're not thinking it. They are uh, basically reacting. So, you know, dropping water, slower bite. Hard bite, tough bite, rising water a little bit better, unless you're a Jeremy situation where it rises ridiculous amount, Jesus, and that yeah. puts into that tizzy one more time. But stable stuff, I love that stable stuff. If 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 I can uh, get on the internet, just say Sean and I are ready to go on one of our big epic catfish adventures. We've called them off before, literally called them off because the water came up too much or dropped too much. We're like. Nope, let's not do it. Let's not risk that time either away from work, away from our families or whatever to go down there and struggle. We're going to go down there and do well if that water has, like if I look a few days in advance and it's running at 22 foot and it's still 22 foot, it's predicted to stay 22, 21, 23, we're good. But if, if there's a big giant drop in that, I'm like, drop. nope. We're not doing it. We're we're better off doing something you know that's productive. Is that the same thing with barometric pressure? Because obviously that af affects the, the the atmospheres underneath the water as well. Um, bluebird skies, bluebird skies are can be tough, but even with high barometric pressure instead of low pressure, I've still been able to do pretty well as long as the water level. If you got both happening, if you got the water dropping or rising fast and high pressure, that, that's almost the kiss of death. But yeah. blue skies, I've I've had uh, matter of fact, number ten currently on my top ten flathead single anchors happened on Bluebird Skies June seventh, two thousand and seven, and we boated in. Our smallest one on this, we caught six fish. Our smallest one was about 25 pounds. Our biggest one was 62. Second was second small, second biggest, 60. It went to 55, and then it went to 40. Look at that. Jeremy, look at that. I'm going to put that to solo screen, full screen. Look at that. that uh, we, we, we fixed to find out what that is. <laughs> I think nice. that's, that's a good bet. See, so what Jeremy, are you seeing in that picture, Tim? We never see that where we fish. We never see that amount of fish in such a small amount of real estate. What we see is we will see one or two marks down below that drop, maybe five or six, depending on how big it is. And see, see where that long arch, you know, that long kind of spotty arch is? That usually is active position, uh, big blues just up from that drop usually the ones that are behind us especially during the day gosh i can't get this thing to stay in 
Maybe I got the wrong one. All right, here we go. So uh, usually in, in that situation, that one that's high on off on the right on the on the high side of the drop is your active pos position fish. You may still get bites from the ones that are down there, but usually if you can find them one or two or three in active position, it's more likely that the rest of them are going to be a little bit uh, more apt to feed. Mm -hmm. But in that situation, if I ever saw that situation where I fish with a heavy population, look out, just get ready to bar the doors. And, I mean, cause, and as catfish heroes, if we see something like that, I'm so happy I'll start clapping before we even throw rods in. <laughs> before we even throw rods in, I'm like, look out, it's coming. Do donkey, donkey baits. I'll get the donkey baits Do you, baits you want to drop them right on their heads, or do you want to drop them around them? How do you want to go about attacking that kind I of scenario? Want, that, that scenario, I'm going to be basically anchored about where Jeremy is. For those ones up on the top, I may anchor a little bit ahead of that and throw to that top lip so I'm not hovering straight over them, especially with the mm -hmm. current, because our current's so fast. It's so fast that I guess sometimes got to be a full cast away. But if the current's lesser, like what it is that he's he's doing right there, uh, I will position maybe a boat length a little bit ahead, a little bit more like what Jeremy's doing, and I'll shotgun uh, the dropper rigs with these rigs, big yeah. giant Suspense and bass right over them. Yep, right, right there. But then I'm going to throw back to the to the crest of that drop, like right up here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw back to that, and then I'm going to throw down into it so that I can position for three or four different activity levels. I'm going to head to my bets. Chunky saying hello to everybody. Hey, Chunky, how you doing, Elston? What's going on, my friend? Thanks for checking yeah. it out. Yo. Uh. So if 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 Jeremy keeps showing me that fish finder, I am going to have to go down there because he's invited me to come fish with him, and and I, I start getting overly excited about that. Me too. Uh, I got I got to yeah. I got to figure out how to how to get the time away. That you know, like know. you were talking earlier, man. Life gets in the way sometimes, so you got to pick and choose when you go. That's definitely one that I'm going to have to make time for. So, yeah. Yep. Plus, it's Louisiana, and, man. Who doesn't want to go to Louisiana? And, and not only that. All right. Before I had kids, I ran my entire life so that it was advantageous to go catfishing. I still had responsibilities, still had a house, still had a job, still had a vehicle, still had a boat. But I could do that. I could spend, you know, multiple. I mean, shoot, I'd leave and not come back for seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 days. You know, and I'm staying on the river. I'm staying at cheap hotels. I'm moving around. I'm, I might fish three rivers in you know a week or one in a week. Uh, but now, I mean, that's kind of a rare thing. I get two weeks vacation. I got to do it on weekends. Luckily, I'm on a four day work week instead of a five day work week, mm -hmm. so I can actually uh, uh, do some of that. I don't know how I'm going to get videos edited uh, when summer hits. I really don't, because usually, you know, if if I have a three day weekend, we're leaving. You know that fourth day of the work week that night and not getting home till sunday and i'll tell you what it puts a whooping on my old butt yeah and editing video is, is is a tax a lot of people is a task a lot of people think that you just whip that stuff together but i know a lot of people that are doing it right and i know your production quality is way up there it it it, it takes work it takes work yeah. it takes time I, it takes I, effort I've tried it. I've tried to do some simple, easy one view videos. I can't, I can't do it. I, mm -hmm. I'm so excited about the view that I could show people that I just can't, I can't do it. I told the story before, but the kids and I caught uh, the two fish in catfish brothers above the uh -huh. dam. We locked through, we went down we, and then the very next fish we caught was the epic super monster. Right. I had no idea what I was doing. We, I mean, as far as filming, <sighs> I had to wait until I actually got some other ones done that happened later than that because I just couldn't I couldn't bring myself I couldn't bring myself to uh, edit that thing and and not do it justice. And of course, I've learned things since then, and I would do things different. I'd probably tone down the music. I'd probably spend a little bit more time on this and that. But don't, I mean, you we, don't we need got, to tell people that because I'm the same way with my videos. I just make yeah, the change and don't tell anybody. Nobody yeah, really yeah. notices. That's that's kind right, of a right, secret right, right, of the right. whole thing. But yeah. but I get exactly what you're saying. 
I had so much boat noise that I almost had no choice but to put that music in because I didn't know how to run the cameras. I was always tapping into them. There's wind going and all that stuff. And yeah. How, I, what works well for me because I'm a heavy breather is a powered external mic that you set to gain all the way down and then in post-production, crank the volume up and you'll get rid of all I, of that noise that way. I have none of that. I have two GoPros. That's it. That's all I got. And there's no external That's, mics. There's no fancy nothing. It's just that. Yeah. It, it, it gets to be overwhelming, too. Okay, we got a question from Chad. What's going on, Chad? Uh, question for Jeremy. At that dam, do you do better suspending bait straight down or casting back, Jeremy? What do you normally uh, encounter while you're there? Norm normally, I do better suspending my baits down. Um, I, I have casted out here before, but it seems like most of my fish come on the suspended rods when I'm here. Are you suspending right now, Jeremy? You got anything hanging off the ends? I, uh, I've got four suspended, and I've got two casted out the back. The one we actually I have to admit, I really like to see those suspended rods when oh, they get takedowns. Oh, oh, <laughs> the, take down. the, the down rods are the most exciting, even with flatheads. I mean, there are situations where I will suspend. It's not high. It's, it's only about maybe that far. But I'll have the, the, the sinker on the bottom like this. And then I'll have a, a no knot snell with a long tag on it that'll get tied mm -hmm. here, and it's just a straight up, straight in. And then then I've got the 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 bait about like this, and usually it's like bridges where you know there's a nice wall or there's a ledge or there's a whatever, and those are some of the most exciting bites ever. Just trounces those rods. So pretty it'll much get, you usually like a drop shot, an oversized drop shot rig, right? It is. It is exactly an oversized drop shot rig. And, and actually, sometimes I'll tie them. I'll tie them to where they're three, four feet. And I'll actually let the uh, – I won't I won't uh, lock it in too hard. I'll actually let a little bit down so that – let me see if I can do this. So this, this weight is shotgun to the bottom, and then there'll be a bow in it. And my hook will actually be here down, down river. So I can actually adjust that bait fish either up and straight up and or down. back and down. So sometimes I'll, I'll even shotgun that thing down. And if I start noticing fish moving underneath the boat a little higher, I'll just pull up. I'll just crank it up a little bit more so that that fish gets into that, that zone a little bit better. If they're lower, I can lower it down. It's really kind of a cool rig. And, yeah, we, we, my friends and I are like, we cannot wait until the down rod gets blasted because that's fun to watch. That is fun to watch, and it's fun to handle. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I always have one of those little uh, ice rods, those mini rods, when I'm uh, at least channel catfishing. It's always fun to have one of them hanging off the side and seeing one of them go down. Especially That's when I'm channel catfishing. I don't do with that with, with flathead. Yeah. I don't want to miss yeah. one of them on a on one of those smaller rods, but it, it's always a blast. Spencer does what this rod he calls Snoopy. His Snoopy rods, yeah, exactly. He had, oh, wait, Jeremy, are you on something or are you snagged? I'm snagged. Oh, well, you're fishing in the right spot. Hey, hey, Jeremy. Yeah. Does the bottom look a lot like the shore? Uh, no. Actually, the bottom down here is almost solid concrete because I'm I'm on the shelf below the dam right here. I think I'm okay. hung up. So he talk he talks he's talked to me about the revetment stuff, mm -hmm. and that was stuff put in that like they. I'm assuming that it's erosion they, control, correct? Yeah, it, I'm assuming that they shut the water off and then put these concrete baffles and all this stuff all along the bottom of that to keep that erosion. Because I mean, he, they they have to deal with not only their water but all of our water from up here. Yeah, <laughs> it shoots out there, so it's a really interesting situation. I love talking to Jeremy about his fishing situation because it's so different. I mean, it's the same, but it's different. <laughs> Yeah, he was explaining to me at one time about how when we're getting a lot of water up here, it's, it'll be down by him 10 days later. So that's always pretty cool to see. Yeah, it'll be down there with a vengeance. Days to go from uh, Cairo, uh, wherever, wherever, and from Cairo to here is 10 days for water. Hey, Jeremy, that's you got that snag all? You got that snag all taken care of, buddy? Yeah, I got I got it out. Right. Even you want you want to talk for a little bit? I'm gonna go uh, um, take a quick break real quick, and uh, you and uh, you Tim can talk for a little bit. Sure.
Are you okay? You okay with that, Jeremy? Oh yeah, I'm cool. Go ahead. All right, thanks, guys. I'll be right back. All right, Mark. So, Jeremy. Yeah. Talk to me about this revetment stuff because a lot of people haven't really. I haven't heard much about it. So that's going to be something that, of interest to people that, because because I know that revetment stuff is up along all the way up to Memphis, sometimes yeah. on both sides, sometimes and some of it's actually all the way up to St. Louis, you know, through mid South area and stuff like that. So explain that and when it was put in and and the, and the situation that you've explained to me is that sometimes it's really snaggy because what why I mean parts of it are broken out and. What? What do we got? Yeah, basically matted revetment is if you can imagine some uh, two foot by four foot concrete blocks that are about six to eight inches thick. What they okay. do, they, they lay them side by side and end to end and basically make a huge mat out of them. And they, you know, they've got uh, they're, eyes they're sticking not, out of them. using your hands. They're not even in the shot. And they're sticking eyes in them and they're wired together like to form a big okay. mat. And they're then they're literally right. drag it. They'll drag it on the bank. They'll drag it on the bank, and then they'll actually pull it across the riverbed from bank to bank. And what happens over the years? You know, the 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 soil still moves under that revetment. Sometimes it caves in, makes holes, and that old wire rusts and sticks up, and it it just makes an extremely snaggy environment. And, you know, any concrete with rebar or chains that hold it together, any of that stuff is going to be ultra snaggy, but it's also going to hold, it'll hold flatheads. I mean, you could have a whole situation when you talk about river underneath the river that that slower water and those holes and stuff like that could hold big flatheads. And, and I, I know there was a, a guy, uh, and I forget what his name was, he was he was kind of a guide back in the you know '90s or 2000s, and that was one of his main targets. He even wrote a, an article for in Fisherman about that, mm -hmm. you know, where you've got those banks with the uh, revetment stuff that's all kind of rumpled, and you know maybe there's some holes, and, and he would target flatheads in there. Yeah, see what what I can normally do. I can normally go along the bank with my side scan, and you can when the when it's not covered in silt, you can see the matted revetment really good on side scan. It looks like a checkerboard. Right. All of a sudden, you can see where it looks like somebody took their finger and just pushed it in, like the lines all gotcha. collapsed each other, and you can and you right. can tell a, a cavity in the matted revetment where it washed out underneath it. Nice. So, is it so snaggy that a guy's going to have trouble like targeting that specifically for flatheads, or do you think you could move in there and play some baits effectively? Uh, in a case like that, I would probably suspend fishing. Okay. You know, I have a lot of luck suspend fishing in the matted revetment. Uh, as long as I keep my baits, you know, just, just, just above that revetment and don't let it fall in. Yeah. Well, you know, that's got to be one thing that when a new fisherman comes out of there, just say you and I had never talked and I decided I was going to go all the way to Louisiana. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Catfish Heroes and I jumped in the truck and we drove 20 hours or whatever to get there and start throwing around and all we get snags. That would be a really frustrating situation. And I'll tell you, honestly, I've had that, you know, back in the day before I didn't understand a lot of things. Why I asked you if that, if the bottom looks like your bank over there, because there's some rivers we fish where you look at that bank but with all that chunk rock, the whole bottom's that way. It looks exactly the same underneath the water as it does on the bank. So yeah, I, I, yeah, and that's uh, that's quite uh, interesting. It's 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 weird because there's so much current, especially below these dams. The uh, bottom probably is full of that huge chunk rock or vetment and everything. But that's where these, it, it almost looks like sand dunes when you look at it on the sonar. It piles okay. up built on top of this stuff. And when we're bumping, you can literally feel that. You can, okay. you can feel you're in the rocks when you're in a hole. But when you start climbing a hump, you can tell you're in a softer bottom. Then as you fall down again, you can feel yourself getting around. Oh, Andrew, we got one. We got one on. Got oh. One. There it is. I've got a back one. Oh. Uh, you, you got him? Yeah, I got it. All right. Yep, we got it. Off the front of the boat. There we go. 
I'd love to see the bend in that rod like everybody does. And then that was that was getting back on. That was a good takedown. Uh, yeah, daddy, my guess. Let me do it. What happened? You backlash my reel? I did. What'd you do? I backlash it, is what I did. Hey, Lord, didn't even backlash my reel. <laughs> Isn't that well, I, I don't know where'd you put it? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I told you to throw it farther back. We made me do it. Well, no, I did take one rod way back. I was gonna throw the other one back. You backlash my reel? I did. There we go. Second one in the boat. He's not. Okay. Uh, the hanging on the uh, rod holder back there. Well, he annihilated that suspended rod. Let me tell you. Woo. Get the blood pumping a little bit, right, Jeremy? A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Congratulations, Jeremy, from uh, so if Jeremy ever takes me to that specifically that specific spot, I think. I would love to throw into those gates as close as I could, whether I get it snagged, where I lose it, whether uh -huh. whatever, because I think, especially if he's got flatheads, which it wouldn't count for this time of year, really. But if, if you were there in the summertime, I think, I mean, those flatheads are going to come in. They're going to be tucked up under, they're going to be against that, that wall over there on, on his left. I think that'd be fun as all get out. Very Great nice, fish, Jeremy. Jeremy. Way to go. Found it. Good deal. Got to gotta get the grip and grin in always. That's such a big part of pit fishing these days, isn't it, Tim? It's that whole grip and grin, get those pictures taken. Oh, you know, it always has been for, uh, you know, we were, and when Sean and I first started doing videos, you could tell we were still picture oriented because that's what we've done we have thousands of pictures i have thousands of pictures i've lost more pictures than i have i i dropped the phone in the in the bottom of the river one time with like seven thousand pictures on it ouch oh, oh yeah bad. giant fish all gone whatever i got a computer full of pictures that i did that the button doesn't work and and we tried to take the uh the hard drive out and now I got to take it to some place for recovery because it's got all the old pro cat stuff on it, all the old articles, all, you know, whatever. I've got some old video of some super monster fish, but it won't transfer. It, it it'll it'll play on my computer, but it will not transfer over to my editing software. Mm -hmm. So I got to try to figure that out. But yeah, I mean, the picture culture is pretty big. I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, you. We all love to pose with those pictures because it's the memory. It's not just the fish; it's the story that goes, you know, with it. And it actually has helped me not forget some of the great trips because I'll look at a fish, a picture, and I'll know what happened on that trip. And it's also a lot cheaper than a replica. I hear those replicas are not cheap. I always say I'm going to get one if I ever get that big seventy pound flathead, but yeah. but, but I hear they're not very cheap at all. Uh, I don't want to. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go, go ahead, Tim. I'll ask Chad's question after you're done. I didn't mean to I, I don't want to sound like a, a, a big wheel here, but they do not make, they do not have replicas. I looked into it a few years ago. They do not have them big enough because to get a replica, you have to catch a fish and you have to submit it. Somebody has to, somebody at some point has to submit a 66 inch long fish flathead or uh you know a, a five and a half quarter foot mm -hmm. blue. They, they have to submit one so that they can make a mold of it and nobody has done that yet and i'm, I'm okay with that 
<laughs> I don't want to submit one of mine. You know, I, I want think that thing Luke to be from uh, Northwoods Angling just had a really big one made. I'm not exactly sure. He 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 says it's anywhere between 100 and 120 pounds. The blue he got, yeah. uh, I think that one cost him a lot of money. But I imagine there was some custom work involved in that one. Yeah, I'm sure there is, and yeah. and you've got a situation where you know uh, an average 70 pound fish is going to be. 52 51 53 54 inches long and a long time ago it was 14 dollars an inch i don't know what it is now it's got to be 20 a, what, what you probably looked into it what is it in an inch i, I haven't looked into it lately you know what i heard the number just recently whether it was in a live stream um actually on luke's channel or if it was in private conversation with anybody so if anybody in chat knows uh what uh um replicas cost if you could uh um uh post that in the chat it'd be good uh but i know it's a lot more than that um i'm fortunate enough that uh my next door neighbor's father he actually lives in sterling illinois and uh, uh he does a lot of catfishing down there he's a taxidermist he said he'd be happy to to make one for me if they ever got that big so uh nice. we'll see what happens great story the guy's awesome uh ryan's father he's uh colorblind but he's a taxidermist he does the he does all the work and his wife does the painting and they, they do really nice, nice work down there so nice uh my wife is actually from rock falls which is just across the river yep exactly i've been meaning to get down there and fish with him for a while now but he keeps wanting to go crappie fishing down in lake of egypt so that might be another spring trip that i got planned uh lyle stokes says it's over 20 bucks an inch right now so uh, holy moly so that yeah, adds that, up that, that, yeah 100 inch that's that's a lot that's a lot all right chad wants to know uh uh he says i think y'all have been asked this before but do blues hang with fish their same size or do they or will you find big with the small fish okay they mix I've, done, size I've done a lot of uh thinking about this a lot of talking with people and a lot of you know basic experience with this stuff so it seems to me that you can still have smaller blues with big oh, blues. look at that oh what do we got going on there we just uh moved closer to the gates from exactly where we were and we just moved in closer to the gate okay all right, let me get back to this before I forget it. Okay. Um, you will have a situation where smaller blues will hang out with bigger blues. And, and I know this not just from my experience, but also fishing on the James. So, you know, Chris and I had this discussion on the James River, and we were fishing in the Hopewell area. And I says, well, do you have to throw these giant baits for these big fish? He says, no, you don't have to, but you'll waste all your time on little ones. I said, there can't be that many little ones with those big ones. He goes, go on a bet. He goes, put a, put a little shad and throw that in there. Goes, and, and sure enough, there's a five to 10 pounder every five minutes for as long as you want to throw this. So he had to use those big baits to eliminate wasting all this time. And that proved to me after a while, because that just doesn't, it, that situation doesn't happen where I'm at. I don't need to throw big baits because I don't have that huge of a population that I'm worried about a little fish stealing a, a bait away from a big one. Usually the big ones are dominating and the little ones kind of set back and I don't have to worry about it because I'm fishing those spots on the spot. But if I go into a big basin area, you know, maybe behind a wing dike, maybe it's 40, 50 foot deep and stuff like that. If I, if I, if there is a huge hey, Tim, fish population, you, yeah. the donkey bait's getting hit. Oh, oh. awesome. Awesome. Uh, you know, everybody likes uh, the big baits, but yes, the oh, we got but oh, we got also oh, the, oh, look at the, that. The second part of that, while he's getting that awesome bite on the donkey bait, uh, let's just say, yes, I have caught multiple big fish on the same anchor within minutes of each other, and I mean, sometimes it's just one or two, sometimes it's three or four, sometimes it's just an incredible amount in, in 25, 30 minutes, you caught six fish over 50 pounds. So yes, they do carouse around together. Uh, wow. You got a lot of boat sway. Oh. Mike Greenwell, I feel your pain. There are, a few fish i wish i would have got measurements on in the past yeah me me too i'm in the same boat there 
But uh, if I'm always so excited, I want to get that fish back in the water. I'm not even going to kid I, you, Tim. I, I do. And you know, I, I explained this in one of my, uh, uh, I guess, little messages, the posts. Uh, I have literally weighed fish in the past that were big, and I felt like I spent too much time with them out in the water, and it's just not that important to me anymore. I can get a length. I can get a girth if I really need to, but I'm happy with just saying this thing is a beast or a monster or a, a donkey or a, a bear. I, I mean, mm-hmm. we, we get that whole thing going. So, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, even, even that last fish, I believe that fish is somewhere between 125 and 130. But if somebody wants to argue with me that it's only 112, I'll be like, okay, whatever. Okay, yeah, exactly. I'm the same way. You know, the only time I, I, I do, and here's my method of measurements now that I've been doing it for a while, it'll either be knee high, mid thigh high, waist high, over my waist. And that's just, that's just for my logs, for my journal. Yeah, I'll keep yeah. that to try and keep a, a record of it. If it's a really big fish, I, you know, I, I might get a weight on it, you know, or if I'm in with my buddies and we want to smack talk, then we're going to get a weight on it. But, yeah. but other than that, a couple of times I've measured length and, and, and girth just out of curiosity to see if the, the, the math works up right in the, in the charts and stuff. And yeah. And you know, the, stuff. the charts, the charts are surprisingly uh, close. If the fish is silhouette, it is your normal average fish. But the bigger Absolutely. the fish, and I've always said this, the bigger the fish, the more yeah. likely that that fish is to be out of the main silhouette. An overly giant head, because if anybody watched that thing, that head was completely massive, like, like this. It was I mean, that, just, that head was huge. So, uh, you know, uh, I've seen a lot of fish that are – I haven't seen a lot, but I've seen a lot of 100-pound class fish, and a lot of them have the bigger body, smaller head. And this thing had the massive head. I mean, the jaw, the jawbone was like, like, like it's big around as your wrist. Just, just to hold on to the jaw, you couldn't. Eat uh, that's it. It that's like that's this. the first thing I noticed in that in that 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 uh, video of yours is the size of the actual lip and like yeah. the grip it took to to hold on to that yeah. fish. I was like, yeah. oh my god. Oh yeah. It was a freak show. And I've caught flatheads with lips like that. Like, literally, like the size, of, as big around as like the smaller Red Bull can, where mm-hmm. you, know, you know you can't even get your, your, your hand. You can't, like a lot of them, you just touch them, you know, you go like this. These things, I mean, they're just massive. Massive. Like a hammer handle, you know, like a big hammer handle jaw. Pretty crazy. And some of them, you know, I've got some pictures where I'm holding my hands in the mouth, and it's this like this wide. And you still, and yeah, you still got up. some space in between them. Yeah. D- dreaming of catfishing again. What's going on, Jeremy? How's it going, bud? Uh, we just kind of adjusting a few things. The boat decided it was going to... The boat's not positioned like I really wanted it, but we got it, we got it straight now. Anchoring yeah. up versus yes. spot lock. How do you guys all feel about that? Mark, I would use spot lock if I had it, but I don't. So I'm an anchor man. You're an anchor man? uh, I'm an anchor man. Always have been, probably always will be, because just like what he's going through right there, there's only so much you can do. And to me, I'm such a, I guess, psycho that that would drive me nuts if i'm dragging around and unless unless it's paying off unless my bait's getting moved below a dam is paying off if mm-hmm. it's not paying off i'm like oh my gosh I, I'll, I'll i'll do anything to you know get that anchor position just right i'll go over to that dam wall over there and i'll stick a stick in a crack and you know wrap a thing around it and do whatever i got to do and then i'll throw sideways if that's applicable if it's not i mean if it's like what he's talking about you just snag up it'd be just dumb but uh mm-hmm. you know the only thing i won't do is double anchor below a dam oh no yeah yeah I because I've, yeah, I've seen i've seen the results of that when the front anchor comes undone the back anchor doesn't and boats end up sinking they'll just sink if you're if you're caught on the back anchor and you can't get that thing, I've probably not my boat or Jeremy's boat because they're bigger, 
but you know right. that water where I fish, if if you were to get caught backwards in in that crazy epic water, Th oh my that god, that like that, yeah, definitely, that would be that would be a problem. Always carry a knife with you. I don't care what's going on. As, when I'm in my boat, I got a knife on my hip ready to go in case anything happens. So. Yeah. Uh, whether you believe in that or not, I've I've had problems in kayaks and canoes where they've come in handy. I don't see why a boat would be any different. I don't have those major rises in it or anything, but no, someone it's, gets it's caught or you get an ankle caught in a rope or something, it's never good. Um, yeah, no. All right, let's see what we got going on here. Oh, Catfish Heroes wants one of them sweet hats. Contact me on uh, social media. All the links are in the description below, and I'll let you know how to get one. Uh, I appreciate you even asking. Um, I don't sell them as a business. I, uh, quick story, everybody's heard this before. I had a bunch of friends that are always wondering what it takes to be a, a pro staffer, so I made them pro staffers. I had the hat made, gave them to a couple of friends, and now people want to buy them. So. <laughs> I sell them on the side. It's not really my business or anything. Maybe I should do it, but but that's pretty much how how you pick up one of those hats. So, um, drift socks work well. We're getting some comments about drift socks. Yes, uh, yes. I, I I like drift socks in certain situations. Uh, I like to anchor to front and back. If I'm fishing alone, it's a lot easier to use a drift sock and spot lock for me, um, especially in my little boat. So I have some balance issues too. So it, it, it's good to be able to you know. Uh, the, the less movement up in front of the boat, the better off I am. So, yeah. So yeah. Tell, yeah. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about gear. Cause I know a lot of people in chat like to do that. I know uh, um, it, it seems redundant to a lot of people that have, you know, been fishing for a while, but you know, the, the chatters love to do that. What, what, what kind of gear are you using Tim for the really, really big catfish? I know you had talked already about you're using the, yeah. the 50 pound uh, big game for your main line, 80 pound for, for your leader. But what about rod and reel? Uh, okay, what, so weapons of choice, I guess we'll call this part. 25 years ago, I went down to the big epic water and I was so under tackled that I could almost do nothing. And, and, I wasn't under tackled with channel cat stuff. I was under tackled with flathead stuff, like big flathead stuff. And the bow to the rod was too much. It was, they were actually too, because they're flathead rods, they're too stiff for that situation down there. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hold enough line. It was basically, I mean, if, if you're a flathead fisherman, you know you don't need that much uh, line, you know, line on your on your thing. So I'm using stuff like 6,500s. I'm using 20 mm -hmm. pound test, 30 pound test, and three ounce egg sinkers. And my stuff is just getting destroyed. I mean, I, I I would I would hook into fish, and they would get me to the end of the spool. I gotta you know get up, and and, and it's not that I was catching back then that big a fish. And a 45 pounder in that epic water is gonna run a 6,500 out. I mean, unless you're yep. filming the line and doing all that stuff. And then it's painful to get it to whatever. So I I actually ended up going to the bait shop that uh, uh, Sean and I went to in one of my videos right there. I think it's Bluff City Tackle. And they had just come out with the surge rods. And the surge rods were built for down there. They really were. They're, they were built for the big waters. And they're more like a saltwater grouper style rod. Now, a lot of rods these days have a lot of the same qualities now because they all have stainless steel eyes back and i bought those before you could even get that because i was mm -hmm. ruining eyes like nobody's business and uh, you know you take a 65 or 70 dollar flathead rod and you snag up 50 pound test and you got to break it off and it snaps out every eye that you got in the first thing you're like okay i'm, I'm done with that so they were pretty expensive for oh, me wait back jeremy's on fish. Oh, it's on. fish on there we go we're gonna go to solo layout here way to go jeremy Oh, you think? Yeah. Think it's a little better than the last two? He, he, he was like well, They're not deep. Take your time. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, I'll say that. Oh, you got excited. What happened there? Uh, he, he thought it, he was saying it's a decent fish, and then he said never uh, mind. Turned out to be a snag? Oh, that's all right. Oh. oh, there we go. That's all right. We, we've all been there, buddy, where uh, uh, you're convinced it's a 40 and then you do 10 cranks and it's now a 30 and then it comes to be a 20 and you're like, hey, still a good fish. Yeah, the longer it goes between fish, the bigger the next one gets. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <coughs> all right number three, fish on. Yeah, that's all right. I'll take that. Uh, what do you got? 
all fish are all right as far as I'm concerned. I know a lot of people are looking for really big ones, but I'd rather catch medium and small ones than nothing at all. Uh, okay, in this situation, Tim, what would you do? He's on the fish, which is good. It makes me happy. But if you're looking for those really big fish, are you staying there or are you moving? Depends, depends on what my goal is. If my goal is to entertain this crowd, I'm going to stay right there because it could okay. get long and far between because to move off of fish, you're taking a risk. Now, I already saw what he had on his fish finder, okay? So somewhere back there or maybe even right where they're at, You've got a pot of fish that are basically inactive, a big amount of fish. And what he's probably doing, this is my guess, he's went ahead and he's got to the active few fish that come up out of that and start searching around for food. So he's actually on what I would call an active position. And you could actually sit there and catch all those if that's what's there. Or you might pop on to a 50 or 60 that is in with those and comes up. So really, right now, I probably, as long as he's still got action and as long as he's still got hope, I would say stick with this for the purpose. Now, if, if you were so catfish ruined, like uh, some people, like me, maybe, uh, maybe I would say, yeah, I'm going to get off these small fish. But if I was in his shoes right there, I'd stay right on it. I might start I might start. Uh, might start taking some rods and start throwing them sideways more and you know long shotting them mm -hmm. and uh you know, really winding up and then some shotgun whatever but it looks like he's got it pretty well covered I he mean, does definitely yeah. you know and and i'm thinking that 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 erosion control what, what 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 were you calling them the the concrete slabs that are under there that they lay across at the back you, of those you, dams you call them revetment mats yes revetment the mats, mats. The revetment mats, do they run like the whole width as far as the gaps? Because when I saw that one gap, that last sonar picture. Yes. It, so, it looked like it, it, was, uh, it was raised up correct. into the current because, you know, I got the idea that the, the, he had the, went over it. And oh, it was like this, there could be fish tucked up underneath there. But Jeremy will be able to tell you more than I would. Yeah, what, what it is, below this dam, they've got these big concrete pillars that stick up that make current breaks. And I, I think there's some of these in here, and we're kind of between them. That's awesome. That's, you know, and, and those kinds of situations, they hold big fish. I mean, they do. I mean, you may be catching smaller ones because maybe the bite's not on, but I would feel pretty good about three fish in this amount of time with seven feet of water encroaching on that. And he just went, you know, I mean, he was getting assaulted by, you know, floating wooden alligators is what i call them you know little mm -hmm. creek, you know, whatever so yeah he's uh he's uh he's made a great i'm gonna decision. steal that from you tim wooden alligators i like that <laughs> uh i fish below a uh a large tributary on the mississippi that comes out and i fish on that side and every once in a while there'll be nothing happening on the mississippi and all of a sudden there's giant trees coming down because there was rain on that tributary that comes down some of them we're, we're like, oh yeah, that's Loch Ness monster. It's it's coming to get us because I mean it's you know twenty feet long and got all of its branches left on it and all that stuff. You got to get out of the way. Man, that boat is swinging around. Yeah, but you know when when you get in those swirly situations, uh, nothing wrong with you know suspending your stuff. We do it when we have to. I mean I. I would rather, and, and most of the time I am anchored. It's just sometimes I get in a situation where the current's all this way for 20 minutes, and then all of a sudden it starts to switch. And if you have all your stuff down, all you're going to do is snag and lose the stuff. So, I mean, Sean and I was in a situation last uh, <clears throat> last early summer just like that. We caught some good fish, but it, it was it was really kind of scary, actually. Yeah, that's what the boat's swinging over. That's what we're trying to suspend through. See if okay. something. And uh, so I think I think what that is that uh, that other hard hit that I'm getting on my sonar. I think yeah. that's a, one of those pillars. Okay. Okay. In fact, watch. You can turn your sensitivity down and see. Up oh, there we go. Yes, yeah, that. that. And that's what it is. It's the top one of those concrete pillars. I guarantee it's what it is. Okay, so the yellow stuff right at the bottom, because my fish finder is different than yours. See those little blotches of yellow right at that, right underneath that black looking mountain? Those are fish down there. 
What's the best way to judge size of fish on a on sonar? Wait, hang on. Learn it. Oh, we got, got a fish it. on. <coughs> oh, that was a nice one too. Oh, had one on the donkey bait and he lost it. Oh man! All right, hang on. Let me get the phone set back up. Now, usually when that starts happening to me, I tell myself to give them more time. Oh yeah. I get too excited sometimes, and I start reeling on them too fast. The impatient, look what he did. No, I wasn't impatient. I smashed my finger and had to stop reeling. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, so, I had it. So All right, Mark, I'm going to take a quick break again. Break again the old, no uh, problem. Red, I'll be here. I'll be here. Right here. Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeremy, Tim's taking a break, my friend. I want to uh, tell everybody out in chat, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Also in the description, there's links to all the social media and my guests' channels. Make sure you are subscribed to Epic Catfish and Creole Catfishing. If you're, in, if you're not, uh, share the links out to their channels. They're definitely worth a sub. Good content uh, for both of these guys. Uh, I'm honored to have them both on here. Uh, Jeremy uh, is the man as far as I'm concerned. See what's going on in chat here. Okay, I think I'm a little lost in the conversation here. Uh, you will do one show with the pink one. <laughs> You'll order now. <laughs> hey, you want it? You can get it. I don't have too many of those left either. So uh, the ladies really do like the pink. Uh, I might change them up a little next year, but uh, uh, it's getting late in the season here. It's already uh, towards the middle of February, so I'm going to have to hold off. Those black ones sold out pretty good, so I was kind of happy about that. Um, I, I am very grateful for the hats and stuff. They do uh, help uh, pay for StreamYard and any uh, uh, filming equipment that I need. There is cost to everything, so uh, uh, it's appreciated that you guys really like the hat. So uh, uh, thank you to everyone that, that has one. So Thank you, Chad, for posting... Uh, uh, some links. I appreciate it. Yeah, Jeremy is. Uh, thanks for reminding me, uh, Mike. Jeremy is going to be on Mike Greenwell's show tonight. I believe it's 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. If I am not correct, please correct me in the chat, Mike. Uh, Jeremy's going to have a long day. Jeremy is all over the Internet these days. Uh, so if you want to see him... Uh, uh, keep your eyes peeled or glued to his social media. You can follow Jeremy everywhere. So I don't have uh Thomas. I don't have a link to merchandise. I don't necessarily sell them. Like I was saying, uh, it, it's basically, uh, I, I made the hats, you know, to give away to some friends and stuff and, and it turned into everybody liking the hat. So what I do do is, uh, um, I, I get a batch of them from time to time. Um, and I sell them through my social media. So basically what I would need from you is to contact me through social media. Uh, I can only take PayPal, but I believe they take other, you know, credit cards besides PayPal. I would need like your name and your shipping address through there. And then, then I could send it to you. Just contact me through one of the social media, preferably Facebook, if you got it, because I'm on there a lot more. Um, contact me through there, the Catfish and Crappie page. Um, and, and, and I'll reply with, with instructions and, and prices and stuff. So. 7 p.m. Central Standard Time to watch Creole tonight. You're very yep. welcome, Mike. Thanks for your support. You're in a lot of my streams. You're the man. I appreciate it. Mike was a guest on my show, too, so if you ever want to go back and watch the interview with Mike, it's always available. I'm going to try and make it tonight to your show, Mike, most definitely. At least stop in for a little while. Um, got a couple of family things to do after this, uh, but we're going to try and get that stuff taken care of. Thank you very much, Catfish Heroes. I appreciate it. Oh, here is a little preview. Uh, I might be having a, I'm, I, I might be coming out with some additional merch in the next couple of months. Um, I'm working with a supplier to actually create an, uh, an online store on their part, but that would definitely have to do with, uh, um, there'd be limited sales. So it would be like a two-week sale, and once the sale's up, uh, we would ship all that stuff. So just keep your eye on my social media, on my channel, and if you're interested, I got some cool stuff that uh, I've been working on. It uh, looks like Epic's back. 
Welcome back, Tim. How are you doing? Good, 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 good. I've just been pimping my stuff out while you were gone. Good. I figured that was an, an honest opportunity. Oh, Jerry uh, got another uh, fish on. Yeah. You, all right. Dude, for winter, he's on fire. On fire. I, I knew this was going to be a good thing. Because uh, let me talk to you about Jeremy a little bit, if I can. So you I first absolutely met, can. I first met Jeremy in chat quite a while ago. And I was impressed not only with his uh, open speaking about his situation, because he said, you know, he says, I've just now got myself a boat. I've only been fishing this, and I, and I believe he said for a couple of years, you know, in his boat, and he's really moved forward and progressed. I started watching his videos, and I saw his situation, and he was he really had a lot of the right questions, you know, as far as being able to narrow down almost any time he's on the water and get on fish. And... Uh, <laughs> Then I ended up talking to him on the phone and, uh, you know, we started talking about all his rivers and what he's got, you know, and Jeremy's only problem is he's got almost too many options. <laughs> <laughs> Good problem to have. Yeah, it's a great problem to have. So, you know, he's, 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 he's on fish and, and he's really wanting to work the, the equation down to where he can go to specific spots and tangle into big fish consistently. Like, and I'm not saying these aren't big fish. I'm just saying he, he's wanting to catch those 60s and 70s and 80s. And uh, I believe that he's got an opportunity to do that because not only is he close, well, he does have one other problem. Just like me, he's got a regular job, so he can't you know, spend as mm -hmm. much time. On life. He's got responsibilities, he's got a bunch of kids and stuff like that. But, man, my hat's off to Jeremy, you know. To, to get on a live feed like this in front of all these people and have enough confidence that you're going to get on fish, that says a lot. Jeremy is a wonderful person. I've become pretty good friends with the guy. Oh, look at that. What's that about? Is it? Is are there lampreys down there? Yes. Okay, there that's are. what that looks no, like I, to I, me. I guarantee it's a lamprey mark. But we have lamp. We have a few lampreys on the Mississippi all the way up by us. I mean, I have caught catfish with lampreys on them. I've caught some lampreys in my cast net. Uh, I've actually used them for bait, and they're actually pretty great bait. If I could get a bunch of lampreys, buddy, I would be using them. Kind of like Elston with his eels. He yes. loves that eel. Oh, I love eels, too. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. It's, it's uh, a little bit – it's it's quite a bit hardier than fish. Uh but eels was an interesting bait to me then. It's an interesting bait to me now. And I've only caught one on rod and reel, and that was below the Sterling Rock Falls Dam one time when I was wading it. It was about a three-footer. That was back in the day when I used to eat fish, and we ate it, and it was absolutely delicious. I couldn't believe it. The pulling motor out? Yeah. Oh, I, was, I thought maybe he was looking for us to ask us something. He's looking at his trolling motor. But Mark, they used to make belts out of eel skin and also boots. I remember that. Uh -huh. the, the skin is really leathery. It's it's actually a little bit stronger than even catfish skin. I, I remember them making wallets out of it, and there being a myth that it would demagnetize your credit cards. Remember that? <laughs> I do, I do, I do. Yeah, that's uh, pretty pretty crazy. <laughs> now I'm but, dating myself. Oh, look at that. Stuff. That's what I'm talking about okay. right there. Oh, there. boy. But, hey, Jeremy. But we, we, we can't stay because the alarm sounded. We had to get out of there. Okay. Uh, i got to go back behind the signs. Jeremy, I'm asking you about these obelisks because that's very similar to a couple of dam situations that I fish. Yeah. And it seems to be at times loaded with big flatheads. So if you can get on those like that in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the warm water period, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've always said the same thing too. We, we only just started fishing this spot back in, uh, back in October. So I, I haven't oh. had to come with some five baits. I have a big flathead prediction for you. If you can fish those obelisks uh, during basically the pre and post spawn in stable water conditions, buddy, you're on it. Did you see that one that was laying right up against it, Tim? That one yes. piqued my yep. interest. Yep, and they, they do that a lot. Every hump, every like uh, situation where there's a current blocker and, and on the downstream side, if you're going to mark fish, and sometimes they're even inactive, they're just sitting with their bottom lip basically right up against that thing and just hovering in place. It's pretty cool. 
Hey, look at this. Congratulations, Ryan. Ryan got himself a winter flathead. Ryan boards blue collar fish in the office. Kayak. Nice, 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 nice. Very good. I love to hear that. You know, the fishing situation, I used to hate winter before I got on YouTube because I know what our winter is right now, but I can live vicariously through other people catching great fish, you know, all over the country. It's, it's great. Look at that. I would do, oh my gosh. That I know is, I'm seeing that. I've got such a great blue cat population down there. It is just. That's crazy. Let's take a closer look at that. Look at all those fish. That makes me happy. Mark, when, when that's on fire, that has got to be incredible. When now, you see how some of them, obviously, over uh, the the bottoms loaded up with them. Yes. But you got those ones that are mid-column. What what what, yep. what do you feel is going on there? I think those are fish that have gotten up and moved. The other ones are located, and they're just sort of resting. Those are what I would call more active position fish. I think I saw one on that that was actually nose down, tail up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I can't tell from his electronics. Yeah, well, no, I didn't see that. But on my electronics, those fish that are kind of up off the bottom about four or five feet, well, see, that, see that one larger one? It's kind of an arch mode. Uh -huh. But those, those look, those on mine would translate. See how, see how they're a little bit longer and thinner. They would translate right. more to like 24 to 30 inch fish. Okay. Now, once they become beefier in the middle and about an inch long like that, they translate to 40 to 50 Bigger, pounds bigger air bladders, correct? That's yes, yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. More mass. Tim, analyze this situation. They're yep. active opening locks right in front of us. Yep. Are you okay. guys safe? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. We're yeah. fine. We're perfectly right. safe. Yep. yep. Uh, it could it could fire the bite up. I'm not sure about your waters. I'd have to kind of spend some time on it because sometimes they'll duck and cover in the beginning, or they'll just go on an active feed. It just depends. What's your experience with that? Well, to be honest, this is this is a first for me at this spot. I've had them do the opposite. I've had them turn the gates off. Yeah fishing this far away we were catching a fish kind of far out when the gates were on but then yep. when they turned them off we lost the bite got yep. close to the locks and found them again so maybe there you I'm go and, and that's called cool. that's called that's called going to the current because yep. once you lose current you usually lose the bite once you increase current it can it can go one of two ways it can the bite can go south with increasing current where you're at you might have to move to lesser current or you could stay there and the bite might actually fire up uh, and, and I have more anecdotal evidence of that because I don't fish areas that have like a big, you know, a huge amount of water that's going to be pushed through these dams like you do on the TVA and all those sirens yeah. and stuff like that. It's either going to rise or it's going to fall and they don't really warn you. So it's, it's kind of hard to notice it, especially if you're farther downstream. I don't know. We're going uh, we, to give it a shot. We're going to see. Well, we're going to find out. All right, well, I think it's my turn to take take that nature call break. So, there you uh, go. Creo, if you want to keep talking to Tim, that'd be yep. awesome, buddy. Yeah, and I can actually see chat on my big screen right here, so I can even pop Excellent. Cool. I can't pop up some questions, but chat. I can talk about it. See if somebody else wants to come in. Uh, maybe Lyle wants to come in. We'll see. Okay. I'm putting bait on this one. All I know, Mark, is uh, I'm, I'm excited for Creel because he's got some really cool things coming up. I feel it in my bones. Ever since I started talking to him, I'm like, dude, you've got a situation. You're on that lower Mississippi, and everybody knows that our big blues that come clear up here are actually from down there. I don't okay. know if they're completely all the way down to Louisiana, but they're highly mobile. And if you were to tag those big blues that I catch clear up there, I will almost guarantee that their little pink line would go all the way down to his and all the way. And, and sometimes it'd be beeline fashion. They'd go from his area all the way up to mine and then back. It's really a kind of a cool thing. Yeah, Tim, I always tell Jeremy, and he, he has some too. I've got personal friends I went to high school with that commercial fish these waters. Okay. Yeah. I have seen with my eyes the fish that live in these waters. Yeah. I've seen with my eyes state records multiple times. They were just caught in a hoop net. Yeah. Um, by a lot. 
scary sized fish. Yeah. And I know guys that have caught them on rod and reel, but the guys down here are very old country superstition. Yeah. Our state records on the website are very incorrect because nobody reports down here. Okay. Okay. Um, so are you talking, are you talking eighties, a hundreds, or are you talking all the way up to 150 or bigger? Uh, blues. They weren't weighing the giant ones cause they didn't taste as good, but I've seen some one twenties, one forties. Yep. 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 So it, it would, it head. wouldn't surprise me if anywhere on the planet besides these big lakes like Kerr, Bugs Island, you know, all those, you know, th those no North Carolina big lakes that just had them introduced in the last 25 years for a natural river situation. I believe that that area from basically the mouth where it empties into the ocean all, you know, up through like mid South's area where he, that could have some 140s, 150s and probably blow your mind a little bit on maybe 160, 70 or 180. That would be my logical guess, but I think it's such a small percentage of the population, and I think those fish are going to uh, be really difficult to land. I, I think some people have honestly locked into some fish that were way bigger than what they thought. They ended up losing them, and they, they're thinking, you know, okay, maybe it was a 100-pound fish or maybe it was an 80. but it could have been 170 because really the wavelength of a fish – that's that big isn't that different once you get over five foot long. And I've had, I've caught a lot of fish that would register flatheads and blues over five foot, five, five and a half foot, stuff like that. And that wavelength, it's that long, steady, hard pressure. And you guys saw it on, on my, my last big fish oh. thing where you can tell that bite, it's a big fish, but how much over a hundred, you can't tell. You know, I was first guessing that fish at 80, and then I'm like, yes, it's over 100 because I, I could feel that wavelength of that swimming, you know, how, how it moves and how much pressure it's got. Mm -hmm. But ha have I uh, have I hooked any fish that I've lost, possibly, and especially some that I didn't actually hook up with? All right, I'm going to take that break real quick. This is Chadwick yeah. Fields. Chad, this is Tim hey, Scott. Chad. Introduce Damn you guys. Deal, Chad's going to sit in for a few minutes while I take a break, and uh, uh, I'm leaving you in good hands, guys. <laughs> I, I see Chad's got one of those cool hats, too. They do. You can awesome. explain to him about those hats. <laughs> oh, sorry, I mic'd it too soon. All right, I'll be back with you. All right, buddy. All right. So how you doing, Chad? I'm doing pretty well. Waiting on the, the wife. We were getting ready to head out. We just lost huh? Jeremy. So where, I guess where it's just you and me. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, where are you from, Chad? Uh, I live just south of Cincinnati. I'm in northern Kentucky. I fish okay. the Ohio River quite a bit up here. Okay. So Now, you do know that us catfishermen 25 years ago used to include Kentucky on what we used to call the evil axis. And the evil axis to us was the, the states that had great fish, but they did not really care about them at the time. Missouri was one, Kentucky and Tennessee. Now, Missouri and Tennessee have come way forward now as far as catfish, but Kentucky yep. seems to be lagging still. I would 100% agree with you, and there are a lot of advocates up here that are wanting and trying to get that changed. Um, I do a lot of the local club tournaments up this way, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of guys that, you know, we talk about the CPR uh, yep. a lot on the YouTube world, but the guys that do these tournaments and stuff up here are really talking with the DNR guys and seeing what Good. we can do to you know, the commercial fishing <clears throat> is outrageous. It is pretty um, outrageous. And you know why? Because Kentucky, it used to be outrageous throughout all three States, actually four, mine too. So Illinois used to belong to the evil axis. Only we would have had to add another one. So you've seen what devastating effects is the result of running multiple hoop nets. I've seen hoop nets done by the DNR that had every flathead in the entire wintering area inside those nets. And I had surveyed these things with underwater cameras back in the day. And, and I'm telling you, they are absolutely devastating. Yep. The problem is enforcement. You can put any sort of regulation you want, <laughs> but if you're in an area where the what everybody calls the possum cops do not believe that there should be regulation. They just hold a blind eye. And so then you've got a situation where they're hauling out the biggest fish 
for pay ponds. And it's, it, you know, back in the day, they at least wanted fish that were, you know, table fare. But now with the advent of nets being illegal in all the states around you, except for Illinois and Kentucky, they will focus on that and really dramatically affect your trophy population. Right. Well, that, and that's what well, you were just saying, you know, now we have the trophy ponds. They're, it's no longer the farm farm raised fish that they're putting in them in them ponds right. so these guys that are going out and even though kentucky actually has some regulations and ohio has res regulations and stuff mm -hmm. you know maybe maybe say they're allowed we'll, we'll say ten thousand pounds the problem is they're going and taking 15 20 000 pounds with two trucks instead of one and right they're not like you said when it comes to the enforcement of it yes yeah you yeah know, you can have all the laws in the world but if nobody really pays they, attention that I mean, if, if you never got a ticket for running a, st a red, you know, like a stop sign in the country, everybody would run them. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you exactly. Um, so I remember how difficult it was back, you know, 25, 30 years ago to be on the ground floor of CPR. That was one of the things that my group or our group did. And, and that is to try to promote catch release. And it was really difficult in those days because... You know, everybody was still of the opinion. I mean, that was just just when people figured out that the bass guys were doing it right. That's the only thing that catfish guys actually agreed with bass guys on, yep. is that you know we instead of keeping the big fish, letting the little ones go, we need to let the big ones go and keep the little ones. That was a really hard mindset, and I think it's come a long way. It really has. You're you're starting to see the numbers in the pools up here. Um, yeah, it's nothing for us to go out and catch those five to fifteen pounders. Um, but the 20, you know, the 20 and 30 pounders, even in, in this pool that I'm in, it's the, uh, Markland pool. Okay. I catch mainly the Markland and the, um, the Meldal pools, but you're starting have, to see. I have some friends that fish those pools <clears throat> and yep. they tell me basically the same thing. Did you see the, uh, epic giant video with Aaron Gibbons mm -hmm. in it that I put out? Yep. Okay. So he caught an 80 in my boat and the explosion of pure emotion was so huge because he has been fishing those same pools that you are talking about and a 50 is a giant there he's been working his butt off and i mean he's a great fisherman he works hard and he fishes a lot he's he, he fishes like hooked and all those guys and so he can come down and fish with me and he has several times in that same pool at my giant catfish waters but he explains to me that that situation in those same pools, and it's pretty darn depressing, actually, with the pay ponds and the commercial fishing and all that stuff and how much you have to work at a true giant. And you may never catch one down there. Exactly. They may not really exist. <clears throat> well, you know, I'm kind of in the same, same uh, situation up here that Creole has as far as only being a boat owner for – about a year and a half. Okay. I fished from the bank my entire life. I fished yeah. in other people's boats here and there. Yeah. But I got into the tournament fishing last year uh, because of a buddy of mine. And, um, you know, the, like you're saying, the 20s and 30s around here, you're starting to see them. Anything mm -hmm. bigger is very far and few between. And you're talking about guys that fish it every week, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, I caught a 33-pounder a couple of weeks ago out of here. And I'm going to be honest, that is the biggest fish that I have caught out of yeah. the Ohio river period. Now I should remind people because Thomas little page just brought something up. He said he still managed to catch a 57 pounder and I'm not, we're, neither one of us are saying that they don't exist, exist. We're right. saying that the population is low. And when you're talking about tournament fishing, tournament guys are going to fish differently than monster yeah. hunters. Okay. Now, just because there's a few people that are like either inclined to go monster hunting and that's what they do, but still those, the tournament guys should be able to pick up some of those bigger fish. And that will tell you when, when you go to like an area that has, okay, let's just say the Tennessee river situation. If, if you go to uh, one of those big lakes that we just fished, some of those tournaments, they were, I mean, they were bringing multiple 80s to 100s for two days. 
to the weigh-in. Now that doesn't happen on the Mississippi as much, it because it's a different whole fishing game as far as you know tournament anglers go. And uh, uh, definitely, you don't see that on the Ohio River system, even though the Ohio River system has some great fishermen on it. They really do. And and I've talked to those Ohio River guys, and I've been on the Ohio myself, and and, and I I realize that it is not an easy situation. It, it's a fairly subtle river. It's fairly slow most of the time. The, uh, the there isn't a lot of epic spots, so you're going to have to do a lot of that dragging. You're going to have to do a lot of drifting. You're going to have to do a lot of that stuff. Yep. Well, How's it going, I want to come back to that, but I want to see what's going on with Mister Creole there. Yeah. How's, How's it going, Creole? What's up, buddy? We're we're hanging out. Oh, uh, they're they're still kind of moving the lock gates around uh, a little bit, so we're gonna kind of let things settle down with that. I I got my rods out the back, marked up. Marked a few things on the sonar, not too much, but I'm I'm basically waiting on to, to uh, quit adjusting the dam, so I can uh, reposition the boat. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Well, if you need to interrupt us, go like this. Yeah, sir. Wait yes. or something. We'll get us just our start attention. Yelling. Just start just yelling. Tell, just tell me. Real just unit. tell me to 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 be quiet. I'll be more than happy to listen. Whatever you got to say, Jeremy. You're the man. I've been quiet today. I've been having my face today. You're in deep thought, I can tell, which is where I'm usually at when I'm fishing. So, I got, I got the, I got the skunk out the boat finally, so I'm, I kind of relaxed a little bit. Good, good, go. good. It was. I had all the faith in you, my brother. I had no doubt that Me you too. would get, get on those fish. So, you know, get just get real back to this real quick, and then I'm going to jump off after this conversation and get leave it to you, to you guys to it. But I had a conversation, um, you know. I finally started getting into, you know, why CPR was very important and stuff like that. But about a month or two ago, I had a conversation with a good buddy of mine that fishes the Ohio River a lot in our area. And when he began tournament fishing, I think he said it was about 15 years ago. They would bring, it was nothing to bring in a hundred to a, you know, you could bring in a hundred pounds and not place top you know, and the money on in a tournament, you know, you, you, a yep. hundred pounds wasn't safe. You needed more of 140, 150, 150 pounds, good, a bunch of good overs and, and a good over under to really think you had a chance at winning it. So you fast forward to now, after all these years of the hoop nets and uh, the yeah. lines that they're running and stuff to take these fish out, you're lucky on most of our tournaments if you break 35 pounds, you're probably in the money because all you're fish. catching with five fish, because the majority of what you are catching is that five to 10 pound range. You're, okay, you're yeah. you get one or two bigger fish and that's what's propelling people into that money. So the, the overall weight difference is just amazing mm. of what has happened to the system up here. You guys are a product of, believe it or not, good regulations going on in uh, in the states around you. So what's happened is that it used to be spread out more, and then all of a sudden Missouri and Tennessee enact the 36-inch limit and a regulation on commercial fishing, blah, blah, blah. So that gravitated all those fish walks right into your Kentucky waters. Unfortunate for you, Great for Tennessee and great for Missouri, but completely bad for the Ohio River where you're at. Yeah, we you know, we we have the the inch limit, but again, it's when they're taking there. I, I don't know if there's no inch limit or what with when it comes to commercial fishing, as long as you have that license or whatever. But they're obviously taking just whatever they can get a hold of and taking them out of. Well, it. and there's a lot of illegal stuff going on. I've got there a couple is. friends that they are. They have pictures. I don't know. These guys post what, and they actually go on Facebook and say, we're coming after your flatheads. And they have, in their boat, they have giant flatheads everywhere. They, they might go up a tributary, you know, associated with the Ohio and net at the right time. And th their boat is just loaded down. They'll, they'll show piles of them that they get out of the truck. And th they're like uh, four and a half, four foot. Some of them are even super monsters that they have netted and sold to these pay ponds yep and that's got to be some that has there's got to be something done about that really 
because it's a shared natural resource. Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't be be able to go in there. That'd be like if I could go cut every tree down in the state forest with a $35 license just because I have the time to do it. Nobody would ever stand (laughs) for that because you can't see fish. Only the fishermen know if they're there or not. There's There's naysayers that say, oh, you're just not a good fisherman. That's the problem heard it i've heard it before i've heard others oh, there's, there's yeah. plenty of them out there you just got to find them well you would think as much as a lot of us fish we would stumble across some of them 60 70 80 pounders that are that used yeah. to be pretty more relevant you know than yeah. they are now yeah. so it's when you get excited about a mid 30 size fish as a big fish in your area you can tell that it's kind of down Yeah. And, you know, I've stayed away from the Ohio River because of that reason. I I really have. I've stayed away from it. I've fished it uh, twice and I didn't really love the situation and I didn't love the size of the fish, even though we were very successful when we went there. The Mississippi was flooded. We ended up driving halfway across the state, blah, blah, blah. We ended up staying in a hotel. We, we fished a pool, caught the skipjacks, no big deal underneath the dam. And then we started fishing and the, the, the volume of water was so kind of depressed that we ended up dr- basically what we used to call drifting in those days. And it, it wasn't a controlled drag. It was basically throw your three ounce egg sinkers out on the bottom and just drag. And we caught some nice 15 to 20, 25 pound fish. We caught quite a few, but I didn't see a situation and I didn't mark what I felt was big fish below the dam, even to five miles down. I, did not I could not put that pattern together like I can on the Mississippi almost anywhere I fish it. Yeah. yeah I, I would love to see it happen, and I, you know I'll, I'll continue to try to do my part and educate those that are willing to listen. So. And but you know what? Tim, We're all behind you, buddy. Amen. Yep. We're all Tim, thank that. you, uh, and Mark, hey. for letting me come in here and hang out hey, with you for a few minutes. For the, thanks for the break. Thanks for hanging out, Chad. You're always hey, welcome. No I'll keep you on the phone, Mark, but we're getting ready to head out for the day. You guys take care. All All right. right, Have a good one. Have fun. Good luck, Creole. All right, Chad. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah, and I also want to say, uh, you know, the uh, people out there, Chad, um, you know, there's reasons why big fish are disappearing, but don't let that discourage you from catching the big fish in your body of water because there's a lot of bodies of water out there that just that aren't commercially fished that just don't hold the big ones. Be proud of that 10, 15 pounder if that's the the, the big target fish in your area. So I, I can't stress that enough. I want to keep people involved in the sport and be proud of what they're catching. So Thomas Littlepage asks, how do lakes versus rivers differ when it comes to catfishing? Uh, he doesn't fish lakes. All right. So Thomas asked a, a very simple question that is probably one of the most difficult, long-winded answers a guy would ever have to give if you want to talk about all the situations. But the main difference, that root main difference between lakes and rivers that I know of is that in that catfish equation that I keep talking about, that big catfish location equation, you got to take the current out of that situation. So when I'm in a river, I go current first, Depth second, cover third when I'm talking about blues. When I'm talking about flatheads, is I go current first, the right current, cover second, and depth third. So it's it's a it's a, it's an equation, but current is almost always first. But once you take current out of that equation, then what you have left is you have cover first when it's talking about flatheads, and then blues, you talk about depth. So once you start fishing lakes, there's also another thing you have to insert into that equation, and that is likelihood of bait fish. Not not necessarily that you have to be on the bait fish all the time, but you have to be in a situation that bait fish frequent because there's no current now. So take the current out, then that, that actually uh, widens their habitat. They could lay anywhere, go anywhere. So now you have to concentrate on those, sorry, those other two things. And that is a little bit more uh, difficult. You have to spend a lot more time on a lake to figure out their habits than you do on a river, although there are different challenges. Hopefully that's a good enough answer. It yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. So how you talk doing all over there, Creole? 
Ah, uh, we're doing good. I'm just moving a little bit. They finally quit moving the gates around, so I want to see if I can kind of creep creep to a spot where I think I can get on some fish. So explain to us how that works, Creo. When they when the alarms turn off, that means they're done letting water through. No, no. When the 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 alarm sounds, whenever they're moving the the gates, like whenever they're opening, closing, anything like that, and basically the alarm sounds for I guess it I guess if you're close to get out of the way. But we're not going to go too too much closer than what we are right here. And what kind of effect did it have? What what did they do? Did they open or did they close gates? They opened them. They open them, and what kind of effect did it have on the current? What are we seeing? Uh, it had a pretty good effect. We got a good current now. Okay. Did that change the location of your fish, or were you able to mark those same fish and set up on them? Well, I, that's what that's what I'm doing now. I'm kind of passing over the area to see if I can figure out where they're at. I'm pretty sure I know where the fish are. They okay. should be right about in this area. Now, it looked like to me the big pile of fish that you went over would be fairly sheltered from whatever current that dam throws at them. But yeah. it would be interesting to know if you moved into that same area, if that big pile of fish, which looked like 50 to 80 fish to me, shifted over, shifted up, or shifted back. That would be the interesting scientific point. Of yeah. view. Would they so get washed out of there, you think, if they stuff. did move, or do you think it would have been voluntary? I think, uh, uh, oh, are you asking Jeremy or me? Uh, either of you. <laughs> I mean, personally. Go ahead, Jeremy. When we, when we fished here in the past, whenever they turn the gates on like that, I, I find that where the fish are is in relation to how strong the current is. The stronger the current, the further back they are. That's, that goes for here. And I've also found that at that uh, hydro dam, it's the same thing. When the current's ripping really, really, really hard, we don't bother going much closer. We stay back and still get on the fish. We, we mark more fish further back. And, Tim, I know you fish in some pretty strong currents, at least from your videos, I, I, I can tell that. Yeah. Um, do, do, do you find that the big, the, even though the smaller fish might move out, the bigger ones will stay in a stronger current? I don't think it has anything to do with the angle that we're discussing. Okay. I think the situations that I'm fishing are more for stable conditions because I do not find, when the water comes up drastically, I do not find big fish in my epic spots like, mm -hmm. like what we're discussing. But if that water stays stable, even though it's the strongest current you can find in 40 miles, I, those fish will frequent that and they'll mostly frequent that when they're there to feed. They don't rest where I go usually on in, in the videos that I've put out so far. Mm -hmm. Usually those are the, it's the pin, pinnacle of activity in which at some point somewhere down there, they're resting. If I throw into the resting area, it's a lackadaisical bite. It's not really that great. I could mark lots of fish. But I have to <clears throat> I have to actually position in that active situation to get fish that are active enough to pull my rods down. <clears throat> and I, I don't think that has anything to do with the rise or the lower. I think it has to do with everything as far as stable, stable conditions to get active fish. And I, I intercept active fish on their way from their sedentary spot to once they get active onto the feeding zones. And so once it's the feeding zone. I can, uh, you know, they're, they're pulling rods down and, you know, acting like sharks. And that's what I love. Now, if I have to, I'll go down to the spots like what Jeremy is talking about, where when they raise this, they move into those more sedentary spots. Because if they're moving out of those fast water epic spots, I'll have to chase them down river and I'll have to get on that. And it doesn't matter if it's summer, spring, winter, or fall. There's always a bite window when it comes to big fish always they're not always on sometimes it lasts for uh an hour a day sometimes it lasts for two hours a day sometimes it lasts for two days and then it'll be off for three so anytime i've got a situation where i think the the bite is prime for that i'm going to get off my experimental anchors because you know every anchor is an experiment but when when i'm not seeing active fish 
positioning in these more epic spots, I will chase them down river. But most of the time, it's I'm going to deal with this, yeah, or no bites at all. You know, we could put mm-hmm. it in their face and they're not doing anything. And then I go, okay, I've had enough. Let's go to this spot, this spot, this spot, or this spot. You know, and, it, and it, you know, it could be the spots we filmed, or it's other ones that I haven't filmed yet. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's all kinds of locations that I catch big fish in. But it just so happened you caught, you know, when I started YouTube, I got right on that time period in that water level because the water level was low and the time period just made it so I had to kind of keep going back to that same area time and time again because Downriver wasn't doing anything, nothing. I mean, zilch. And so um, hopefully next year, uh, Downriver will be doing way better because I'll be able to visit spots that are not so cookie cutter. Now, let me ask you this. What comes to mind is we keep talking about whether the bite is turned on or whether the bite turns off. What do you think drives that in a fish? Um, We talk about them being, you know, creatures of, of habit and, you know, instinct, instinct. Exactly. That's what I was looking for. Is it because they're full? Is there some other reason the bite turns off? Do they start biting once they realize, say, Hey, I could eat. You know what I mean? Uh, That is the billion dollar question mark. That is the billion dollar question because I have some anecdotal evidence that fish they blood. are somehow, I wouldn't say hive minded, but they are hive minded. I've seen it where I haven't fed a flathead in a tank, which that is an artificial situation. The pH hasn't changed. There's no water rising. There's no water dropping. But yet I will not feed a flathead for seven full days. I will introduce his easy to eat bait fish right in his little jail cell and he will still not eat for two more days. And then all of a sudden, or one day, or maybe he'll eat right away. But a lot of times, I th- I'm really looking forward to this because I think this flathead is ready to eat. Whatever, I put the bait fish in there. He lets him swim all over his lips for two days and then all of a sudden, one hour, he eats every bait fish in the tank. Why does that happen? I mean, I'd like to be able to say that he was hungry, but he was already hungry two days ago. I, I That is one mystery that I do not know. I, I know mm-hmm. some circumstances that I could bet on, but it's never a guarantee. I mean, I've been to places where, okay, it's stable water, it's stable pH, it's stable water, you know, and we fishermen don't talk about pH much. pH really does affect fish pretty hard, especially with new rains, how much uh, acidity or how much alkali the water is at the time. We'll either shut them off or open them up. It just doesn't, it depends. Uh, They're better at close to, I think it's a a little less than seven. It's like 6.8 because seven being the the even between the alkali Mm -hmm. and the uh, acidic. Right. Uh, But there is a lot of, there's actually, some pretty good scientific studies that says if you could if you throw in too much acid or too much alkali it will actually shut their behavior down that's let's not even go there because that's, that's that's like that's, a whole other uh, that's like quantum physics stuff. yeah it's a whole other animal so <laughs> as nearly as i can tell from 30 years of going after big fish the best conditions are always for me it seems like stable that. conditions stable high stable low stable medium if Best weather conditions, stable, right behind stable, you. stable, you know, except for you get that short window of time with that dropping barometer and the storms coming in, then all hell breaks loose yep. for an hour or an hour and a half. And then a lot of times the bite's done for two or three days, you know, because I've had it happen at the beginning of a trip. I've had it happen at the end of a trip. So I might go for five days and the fishing's horrible. And, to, and the water level didn't change. Nothing changed. The temperature didn't change. The only thing that changed was that barometer dropping or getting ready for storms. And all of a sudden, all the big fish are eating all at once. And then they're done for two or three more days because I've had it happen in the middle or beginning. So I'm like, sometimes I could almost set my watch by it. I could almost go, oh, well, let's see. We had an awesome bite on big fish on Wednesday. It's probably not going to happen again. Even though we're going to be here until Saturday, I still push through and still go. And most time it proves me right. Not always. Not always. Every once in a while you can eke out a big fish. 
Oh, it looks like Jeremy. It looks like the birds are moved back in, or the pelicans, right, Jeremy? Oh yeah, they're all over the place. Are they feeding, or are they just swimming around over there? Can you see them? There are some that are feeding. Yeah, they're there, but they're they're hunting around. They're looking. Are those pelican saw. eating moon eye, Jeremy? What's that? Those pelican eating moon eye. I imagine they eat about anything they can catch. I I, I never asked the ones to see them. Pel <clears throat> Pelicans will eat any <laughs> mouth, which includes a lot. Yeah, that's what I would. They'll well, eat they will. Yeah, they will. Joe eat those one and a half to two pound Asian carp. I've actually oh, stolen them from pelican when bait's hard to get. Really? You see them dipping. You know that they're going to go. I rush my boat at them. They drop it, and I just dip net. Dip net. So, yeah, it's kind of. What's that? Yeah. Thomas got another What's question. What makes bigger fish feed differently uh, than smaller ones? Thomas Littlepage has got a lot of good questions. I'm not exactly sure, except for the fact that big fish seem to be able to throw their weight around and eat at will, where little fish have no choice but to uh, kind of lay around in the or, or, or feed in different situations. They also can't get their mouth around. Uh, they can't. But like a big fish can eat one of those Asian carp, a big flathead. I mean, I've had many flatheads, you know, puke up carp in my net or, you know, in the boat on you. And, mm -hmm. dude, I mean, it's a a 36-inch flathead and he throws up a 24-inch, uh, uh, you know, uh, golden sucker or, you know, uh, uh, whatever. I, I think that big – and for some reason, big fish are the first ones to shut off. Anybody notice that? I, I don't particularly, but I, I've heard this theory from another uh, YouTuber uh, a while back about fishing the same spot for extended periods of time. I'm not talking about hours. I'm talking about days, if not weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, okay. and, and, and the reason behind that is, let's say you got a big flathead in the area and he eats a two, three pound carp, right? Yeah. His, his reasoning is they're not going to be hungry for until they're hungry again. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that whole line of thought? I, I think that is a good line of thought because I have I have some other evidence myself because once uh, once the pre-spawn starts on the Mississippi, you will have some of the biggest flatheads control small pieces of cover in the depth and the right current. And once that spawns over, I have evidence because I've caught the same fish in like month or month and a half stretches and i've caught no other fish there i put it on my milk run i hit it every day uh -huh. for 26 days and i caught the fish three times of fishing and you know it was an obvious same fish i mean there's not too many fish that are like 70 pounds and have desert storm looking color to them and like yep. missing half of a whatever but i did catch that fish three times and i caught him on the same piece of cover and obviously if a big flathead wants to be there, a lot of other flatheads want to be there. So he, they protect that zone. Now, um, blues, I think, are more migratory than that because uh, it doesn't – I catch the same blue less than I do flatheads. You know, I, I have caught the same one before that I've caught the day before or a day, you know, two days before that. Uh, but I think it is a little, well, uh, fishing magician just went through that. He caught one. I mean, a few days before it had a certain yep. markings and he caught that fish again, but that's in those bigger basin hole type situations. Mm -hmm. He's fishing the 80 spot. Those fish are going to stay more, even though blues have that tendency to be more migratory. I mean, I've heard reports of the DNR, uh, radio tagging fish below St. Louis that have went up the Missouri 400 miles in just a week. That's just crazy. pretty crazy. You know, it's like, you know, they, they've got those tagging studies from uh, walleyes and all that stuff that mm -hmm. go huge distances. There are blues are a lot like that where flatheads will do it in a short amount of time, but they'll do it in that pre-spawn and then just sort of settle in. I've caught the same flathead in an hour. Nice. Smaller fish, though. It was 34 pounds. Decent, not wow. tiny, not monster, but yeah. the same no, fish. No, that's, that that's a, you know, 
that is pretty rare. I've out of all my flathead guys that I talk to, they don't report that on bigger fish. I've done it myself with smaller fish, like 15 pounds and under. The same one I caught him a hundred, you know, because obviously I just caught him. Here's the here's the thing, but yeah, I think there were reaction no, bites both cool. times because they were two things. It was at the top. It was it was in the hole, and it was exactly. green sunfish each time. And both times it was it was a one of them pick up and drop kind of scenarios, but with a yeah. with you know like a cigarette pack sized green sunfish with yeah. an eight out circle hook up in the shoulders. For some reason, that seems to do it when they're when they're spitting the hook, at least for me, it does. So I, uh, I was surprised. I got to tell, tell you a story. Uh, so I'm fishing the Caskia River below the Shelbyville Dam, about three miles down. I'm in a, okay. in a basic riffle, but it dumps down into a good hole. And the riffle is about three and a half, four feet. And it's clear water because it's summertime. It's not, it's actually after summertime. It's a little bit into the fall. So the plankton count was way down. I caught seven flatheads in this tiny little hole all the way up to 52 pounds. When That's I crazy. let them go, all they did was go down and sit there. And mm -hmm. I'm not, and you could see the bottom and those flatheads were there three hours there. later. It was the, one of the, they eventually ended up disappearing. But as I caught them, as I let them go, they got gone straight down and sat there. Sat there. The next one sat next to the first one. The third one sits next to the first two. It's crazy. And then I started letting them go on this side of the boat, and they did nothing. It's almost like they get uh, a little bit, and it took them about an hour, hour and a half to where they're, I don't know if they were frozen or they, they were in shock. I don't Resting know Resting maybe. I don't know. I, I've experienced that same scenario. Yes. Not and, with and, as and many let's fish. Think about this. Yep. And that was that was the uh, – the pinnacle that was the, the big one i mean i've had it a couple times with a couple other ones but to have that many fish just go and sit on the bottom like this and especially in that kind of faster water because mm -hmm. they could have went down in that hole but they didn't it was just like this and it took them about an hour hour and a half and pretty soon you'd see one go then you'd see the other one go it was kind of interesting and that kind of told me why a guy doesn't catch the same fish if he's fishing even a small hole for flatheads uh -huh. because how long are you really going to sit on it unless you sit on it for a long time i think you could if i would have sat on it for another day or you know whatever because they weren't going down because it's shallow water again because it was shallow deep shallow just one big pool mm -hmm. so it's not that they were trapped they can go anywhere they want but they're most comfortable in a little bit deeper water so yeah that, that kind of got me thinking that you know, maybe these flatheads get a little shocked, or maybe blues do, and you just don't catch them right away. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's enough time in between when you fish that again that they moved or, you know, whatever. But pretty interesting if, stuff. When I'm anchored up and I'll catch a flathead, I always release them on the same side of the boat, right by the transducer, because I've noticed okay. that they go straight to the bottom and they stay there. Yeah. I noticed that and time and time again. I noticed that after a couple times, and I made a habit out of doing it, letting them go on that yeah. side of the boat under the transducer, yeah. and I can see them come down, literally see them on the transducer, come down, and that lump starts stays on the bottom, and that's where they stay. And that's I couldn't awesome. figure that, out why, but it's something I've noticed. Yes, that that is uh, it's it's pretty pretty darn crazy. And also that fish that I caught that, that I caught twice in an hour was in the exact same position where I casted my bait. Isn't that interesting? So, interesting. I don't know what to make of it. Those are just my experiences, and that's what I've noticed. Even if you look at my PB flathead one, you'll see I, I pointed out in the video where you can see the flathead diving right towards the bottom at the end of the video, and that's what I notice every time. Nice. That's why I pointed that out. So. Nice. Yeah, you know, the, the Fox River is kind of a gem, really, where it is. It's kind of an amazing little river. I, I love it. In the middle of, you know, as populated of an area, it's what ha what I have. It's it's specific, you know. It 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 took me a, yeah. it took me like a whole season before I found my first flathead. But once I did, uh, that was it. I didn't give up. I kept looking for them and yeah. used all the resources at my disposal. And finally, we got on them. And, awesome. and now I do okay. Awesome. I had a little better year than this one, but this year with the um, quarant not quarantine, but with COVID and the pandemic and everything, yeah. that's had a an effect on my business, so I haven't been able to put the time in, but but it's there. Yeah. So, how's everything going, Jeremy? Ah, uh, it's going. We moved just a little bit closer. I'm actually sitting in a little uh, 
you can almost call it a current seam, like between the flow of two of the gates. Okay. Uh, Mark marked a few fish right here, so I figured we'd give it a few minutes and see if we can't pick up one. All right. Well, if you don't mind, you can keep talking while I go exchange some Red Bull. There you go. Yeah, go we, ahead. we got it covered. <laughs> so, how you feeling, Jeremy? I'm 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 feeling all right. I mean, the bike was a little slow today. Um, but you know, I said we picked picked up a couple of couple of good quality fish. Um, I'm just like I'm I'm now already thinking about my next move. Like if we don't pick up anything here, uh, do I completely pick up and go elsewhere, or kind of kind of making a decision on what I want to do? Always thinking about your next move. That's why I like you. Oh yeah, because being being the river is is high, and the, all this fast current is ripping like it is. It I don't think it's a good idea to go to some of the spots that I normally catch fishing. So I'm kind of having to rethink a few things and, and kind of uh -huh. in my head decide where there might be a few fish. You know, we could always go try to bump for the last hour in that cold, that cold water. Uh, yeah, that might. You got the current. I don't see why you wouldn't try that. Uh, it's The water's so cold, though. That's That's the bad part. You know, at, at you know, with the water temperature being forty-five degrees. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've I've caught, I caught two fish on it last time like that, but it's, I don't know. The water's also extremely fast the we only... Well, you got what three fish in the boat? I don't. Know, what did we have? Three or four? Three. We got. I thought it was four. Four. I think you're right. I'm getting so uh, uh, wrapped up in the conversation here. Uh, yeah, make sure you're. you're I you're... think we got four. Feel free always to interrupt any of this. So, oh, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm, I'm just enjoying being out here. I wish I was out there. I ain't gonna lie. Well, I tell you what, you'd be, you'd be enjoying the temperature right now. It's uh, probably low fifties now. Nah, it's, oh, it feels great. Yeah. yeah, it's good now. Look like, look like the rain stopped. I think, I think we're good now. So how you doing on bait? You still got a lot of bait left? Oh yeah, I got a tremendous amount of bait. When'd you go and pick all of that stuff up? Uh, actually, there's a uh, like the same commercial fisherman that fish in this area here. I picked it up at his place uh, late yesterday afternoon. I had called him during the day and asked him to keep me about two dozen, you know, big shad, about twelve inches or over on ice, and that's. What uh -huh. I uh, hold on a second. You guys hearing Coco snoring in the background there? Hey, no, I, I can't hear it. All right. <laughs> I just want to make sure. <laughs> the, water, the, the, the sound of the rushing water behind my head is so loud. I, I can't hear any of that. Hmm. But, yeah, I mean, Tim, Tim's right. You know, it, it's, it's not exactly the best conditions to be out of here. I mean, the Mississippi is on a really hard rise right now. Because of that, everything else is on a rise. Uh, we just had some some weather come through, some rainy weather yesterday. So we're kind of we're kind of in that post front situation. Mm -hmm. I said not not ideal conditions, but uh, how, how does Richard Jean say that? You go fishing when you can. Go fishing when you can. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And look, Whole... we didn't, didn't skunk, so I ain't gonna complain. Hey, when you when you got to work for a living, you go fishing when you can on the weekends, right? Yeah, that's it. I mean, it doesn't matter what, you know, if I think they're going to bite or not. Shoot, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to give it a shot. Mark, I say every time we go, my worst day fishing is better than my best day at work. Yep. You, you ain't kidding. Amen to that. Hey, uh, I've, I've got all the apps on my phone that show, like, the fishing forecast and all this stuff. But, look, I've, I've we've slammed the fish when it said we had a 10% chance of catching and we've skunked when it was a 95% chance. So you, you just never know sometimes. You know, all my big fish came on the days they told me I shouldn't be fishing. I, you know what? Um, I'm pretty certain that's the case for us, too. In fact, it, you know, the vast majority of them. Yep. So tell me about that, that that PB you caught just not too long ago. Let's hear about that. Oh, that's that one. Uh, oh, yeah, the one, <laughs> the one I caught bumping on that piece of chicken. Yes, sir. In fact, that was that was in the same stretch of water that we were fishing um, this morning. You know where, where that strong current was, uh -huh. and we were we were actually in this same spot that day. Didn't pick up nothing over here. You know, not nothing good. 
didn't pick up nothing at another spot. And the whole point was I wanted to go over there in that fast current. I really wanted to practice a different method of controlling my boat in the current. Uh huh. The reason I went there because the current was so strong, my trolling motor couldn't keep up. So, so what I did, I went over there, cranked my big old motor up, put it in idle, and then used my trolling motor for the rest. I just wanted to practice doing it before actually going out and fishing. Mm -hmm. So I get out there, stick the boat in the current, turn the big motor on, get it all set up, and everything's going like really, really good. Boat control is cool. So I said, huh. Let me, let me practice bumping with this really, really big weight. I want to see how it feels behind the boat. And I said, well, I ain't going to put an empty hook in the water. But all I had was that chicken. I said, man, I hate to – I know I ain't going to catch nothing on that chicken, but, look, I ain't putting an empty hook. So I put two big old pieces on the hook and put it down there. And I bet we didn't go 500 feet and uh, that big sun gun slammed that rod. Man, I was I – was, I don't know who was more surprised, me or the fish. <laughs> and then we caught a uh 20 something pounder after that one. i mean the only, the only thing i can see is that i literally hit him in the lips with that piece of chicken and i think i made him mad and he bit it we'll hey, never hey, really jeremy. Know. yeah jeremy i don't want to lead you down the wrong road with this statement but i am going to make this on the record go ahead i believe that some of the biggest fish in the river, and that's whether it's my area in between or down where you're at, live and feed and haunt areas that are very difficult to fish. Oh, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. All right. So with these new bumping techniques and these new uh, trolling motor situations where you can spot lock on that crazy weird current and that super deep, cavernous water and maybe you've got some snags and maybe whatever i think the the chances are increased the more areas a guy fishes those nearly impossible frustrating big deep holes that these big fish are living in and i'm about ready to uh start kind of going to some of those a little bit more because in one of the videos i talk about a spot i call the the uh uh, Lewis and Clark spot, and it's actually right across from where Lewis and Clark camped, right there, uh, right there at Alton. And they used to have a, a building there until it got wiped out in the flood of '93. But there's a spot in the middle of the river where there's a short closing dike, and this thing is like 35 to 40 feet of water, and it's almost impossible to anchor. Now I visited last time, and I didn't mark any fish in it, but I had been there in the past where I marked some mega giants. But I could not get on those fish to save my life because I'm anchored. So all of a sudden, we got current going this way. And then 20 minutes later, it's going actually the opposite way. So I'm dragging, I mean, getting all snagged up and really frustrated. But I wasn't prepared in those days. I was throwing I was throwing this. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Not this. Not so that, right? I am yeah. going to work on that a little bit. Now, I'm not going to go on like such a monster hunt that it takes me a month to go catch a fish, but I am going to take some time and, and fish some of those 80, 90, 100 foot spots that are swirling current and it's some of the craziest stuff ever, especially now since I have uh, Sean that is, you know, he's skilled enough if we get in a bad situation. He's on it. I mean, he's he's really a great guy to have with you. You know, if, mm -hmm. if, if you're taking clients, I can't I can't take clients into in the water like, like that. I can't take yeah. regular fishermen that haven't haven't you know basically been on that river for two or three years to have enough you know wherewithal to get you out of a crappy situation. And and a lot of these places that I'm going to try to fish are it's right in the barge lane. So, I mean, if you were to anchor in that you march, gotta move, you've got to move. Yeah, I mean, yep, you really yep. got to have your, your wits about you. But it's looking like Jeremy has got some situations like that, and he probably knows where some of those spots are. Oh, yeah. If he were to work on that, it's possible, you know, spend an hour or two trying to figure that out. And you might get into that same situation where your PB jumps from 62 to freaking 122. I mean, anything can happen. Yeah, and, and in fact, one of those one of those spots, exactly like you're talking about, is the place we were describing earlier with that big footing that sticks out at the uh, at the hydro. It's, yeah. it, 
I, I would have to practice quite a bit putting my boat in there to see how I'd have to do it to, to control the boat. You know, may, yeah. I may have to put out with the big motor just so my spot lock will hold. And if that's the case, that's fine. That big four stroke will run forever. Well, and, and I've started running an anchor ball. And really what I did, instead of getting an anchor ball, I got a five gallon gas can. And uh -huh. I hooked a, a clevis hook on it. Uh -huh. So I can, th and, and on my boat, I've got just a snap clevis on there too. So I can literally unsnap that, put that gas can on, and the barge can run over that all they want, just not running over me. So, I mean, I did mm -hmm. make that uh, decision this time. And part of the reason I did is because uh, some of those epic spots, if, if I literally ran into a 150 or 180 pound fish, I might have to up anchor anyway. And it's yeah. impossible in that kind of current to up anchor with a fish on. It really yeah. is. It's almost impossible to do it without a fish on sometimes. You know, I got to put the, I got to wrap the thing and put it under power and rip that anchor off there. And yeah, that's uh, pretty crazy stuff. Well, that, that's the, that's the advantage of, is of having that spot lock trolling mode. Like, like in a place yeah. like, I would never throw my anchor right here. There's no yeah. way. I can roll up real quick, spot lock it. If I don't like where I'm at, I can hit, I can hit one button. And every button I touch moves me five feet in whatever direction I want, you know? Nice. So I can just kind of, I can, and that's a lot of times what I'll do in these bigger holes in these eddies where you don't want to anchor because it'll want to spin your boat around. Yeah. I'll, I'll spot lock, I'll suspend the baits, and I'll literally jog myself around suspended five feet at a time and kind of cover that hole un, until one uh, buries the rod. And luckily, blues, you can do that with blues. I would not try to do that with flatheads, but then again, flatheads don't really haunt those big, super deep swirling. No. So, I mean, yes. little ones do, and they're hanging around the fringe, but at least, you know, a blue will hit something that's suspended and on the move a lot more than a flathead will. So I think that's fantastic. You guys are convincing me to get a spot lock, you know, and I'm really old school. Boy, I love anchor. I love my positioning, but... Uh, you guys are really convincing me on that spot lock stuff. The, the only thing I'm going to have a problem with is I do not like trolling motors because I get my net caught in them. I have to learn how to throw my net like everybody else. You cast it, yeah. I, I have had that happen twice to me already, get my cast net hung in my mouth. Now, luckily, these new trolling motors, they must have some kind of sensor on them. Whenever they get in the bind, the motor cuts off. So really? It, really? It, just, it won't wrap your net up in a complete mess. Nice. In fact, I've, had, yeah. I've done it twice. And it has not damaged my net either time. That's good. That's it good. Just back, you know, back off the motor one or two rounds, and it's out. Nice. Lyle approves a spot lock. I agree. It's pretty good. It's not the it's not the the cure all, but it's nice to have in many situations. So. Oh, I, I, I tell you now. Ever since I got that spot lock, it is it's it's changed a lot of how we fish because. There was spot because I, I had this boat for about six weeks, six or eight weeks before I ever put the trolling motor on it. And it completely changed how we fish when I finally got it. And, and it, it, it's amazing. You know, and well, we, um, Jeremy, I could see I could see spot lock being a game changer for me on fast water <laughs> situations, just net and bait because I could put that spot lock just far enough away from those barges and be able to throw multiple times instead of throwing once back it off and having a motor back up. And I have to have somebody else on the, on the, on the, on the thing. Exactly. You have to remember I'm, I'm fishing in slower currents. I'd be a little worried in fast current with spot lock because that boat will start to sway sometimes if it's trying to keep okay. up. So uh, you, you want to be mindful of that. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to, to throw that disclaimer in because I've had times where I've been yeah. in some current when I was down in the Mississippi and, and you know, we were in like eight mile an hour currents and, and that thing struggling to keep up and that boat yeah. just started swinging. So that was kind of spooky. Well, yeah. I would have to get the biggest, most expensive spot yeah. locking thing. Yeah. I mean, if, they, if, if they had a 150 pound thrust, I would need one of those. I mean, I would get one. But I mean, I don't think they can make them that much. That, 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 I've, that I've no, I have no clue. Mine's, yet. I have a small boat, so but I have an oversized one. I still run into that. I'll run eight mile. I'll run eight to, eight to nine miles an hour with my nine ten in my little sixteen foot boat. Yeah. So yeah, sixteen foot boats. I'm, I mean, they're really versatile and all that mm -hmm. stuff. 
I opted for the big version because I fish those crazy waters where I have hit rocks. I've smacked rocks pretty good. And with a six, I've, I've owned 16 foot jumbos before one hit mm -hmm. off a rock like that at whatever. And you're sinking. And yeah. I put a dent in the corner of my old sea arc boat that you could uh -huh. throw a must melon in and it didn't leak. I couldn't believe it. It was right wow. in the corner. I hit a limestone rock that was sticking up because I had to mm -hmm. go through a, like a seven foot pass on my eight, my my john boat's eight foot wide so mm -hmm. i had to get it up on tilt like this and then run around like that and uh the problem going up it's not a problem going up river it's down river because you got that current going and you got to turn Pushing into you. that a lot faster well i kind of waited a little too long and hit one and uh yeah that was a that was a monster dent monster dent and and i i thought it was going to have a, a hole and because when you exit this rock pass there's a 30 foot swirling hole right below it. And I thought we were going to end up in the bottom of that, but I felt for it. And I'm like, it wasn't leaking. I was like amazed. I haven't done that in a long time. I, I you're running figured out. We started to get some rods get hit. Uh Oh, do we have a ended rod was getting messed with. And then I got one of my spinning rod too. That's, that's kind of, that's starting to play again. Nice. See something, see something hit that suspended rod on the way up because all of a sudden the rod was just straight. No no bend in it at all. Hmm. See, they'll, they'll do that sometimes on a suspended rod. They'll hit it coming up and they'll take the weight off of it and all of a sudden your rod will be just, just go straight out like it ain't got no weight on it. Yep. And the next thing you want to see, you want to see the rod go up or you want to see it go down. Go down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, exactly, down. that's what I love. Mm. I like it, especially that one right there, that Silver Cat Elite. I like it when it's buried and you can't see the white on the rod anymore. Yes. That last, that last about 15 inches is white. I don't even want to see that anymore. Just get that down in the water. That so you're running, you're running a flat bottom boat, correct, Tim? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually sitting... running a tunnel hole. Oh, you so are. So the hole okay. is flat. And then the tunnel goes up like this, and it actually goes up into the boat so that the water hole. can come up through that tunnel so that my jet foot is not below the boat. It's actually higher than the bottom because I have literally boat. jumped rocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if, if you don't, you'll just ruin, uh, you know, an expensive motor. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. I've looked in a jet boat know, for a while. Yeah. If, if I only fished summer, you know, like the – post spawn period like a lot of guys do i would have a, a prop because i don't i wouldn't need a jet because i wouldn't have to mm -hmm. run up shallow rivers because you know the bigger fish will run up the shallow rivers that are connected to the main stem and then they'll come back out by about june one and they're back to the main river but i do a lot of you know late april to uh june one fishing and that that kind of makes it necessary because the jet's really expensive to run it's definitely it's, a uh, purpose-built purpose-built boat oh, right yeah, it is. And I wouldn't need it on the main river of the Mississippi, but there is benefits to it. Like I was saying, you know, you, you could run pretty close to the bank. Like if, it, if the wind gets real bad up river and the waves are real high in the center and it's white caps and it'll beat you to mm -hmm. death, I can run almost on the bank. And that that's kind of a fun thing. I can think of a couple spots here on the Fox where a jet had come in handy where I don't take my boat. It is, my draft's pretty shallow too, so... <laughs> Couple of yeah. spots I like to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Are you getting hits on that, Jeremy? Or am well, I just they, something still uh, messing with it? I, he don't he don't want to commit to it, but he keeps uh he keeps jerking on it here and there, just enough to keep my attention. I saw Mark, it too, one so thing it's about it. Oh, one thing about a jet, you got to run it like you stole it, because up on plane you're about three inches in the water half on plane you're just plowing water so uh -huh. i mean you cannot get through those areas like on the fox or on the vermilion or on a lot of the, the merrimack the you know the wapsie the skunk the cedar all those rivers mm -hmm. have those crazy riffles and stuff and um yeah it, it's a fine line because you know when when you run a a, a regular prop it's better to go slow and hit things gently so then you got to transform yourself into evil Knievel mm -hmm. and you got to read through this stuff like this. And sometimes it, you know, it's going sideways and the, 
you know, you're you're sliding around and doing all that stuff, and you're turning into things. It, it's uh, it's. Quite I'm getting fun. I'm getting too old for that myself, Tim. I hate to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I I'm still an adrenaline junkie, of course. There you, you know, go. I, I love that, that crazy <laughs> stuff. But yeah, the older I get, the less I want to push hard, hard all the time. Like I, you know. There was times when I used to love to walk all the way back to power to carry all my stuff and oh, like you ain't us. No, I, I don't even like that walk anymore. I mean, no, I'm mean, good enough we could do it, but man, when when it, when that road gets soggy, oh, oh it's horrible to walk, to walk on, and you're you know We're dragging gonna, look a at this. wagon. Look at this. We got. We what got, we got? Some, hold on. I saw that. Definitely something biting on that one. There it is. Hold your far. <laughs> I love, I love how the stops every time a rod twitches. Yeah. Well, that was a little more than a twitch. Oh, yeah, that one was more than a twitch. <laughs> What's going on, Jason? How are you, bud? Speaking of bites, well, I'll, I'll ask you, what's your opinion? One's biting like that for a while, and then all of a sudden the whole rod's in the water. Is it one or two of big fish that was chewing on it and tasting it and decided he was hungry? Or does a little fish play with it for a while, and then the big fish come scare him off to come see because he was curious and wanted to know what was happening? I think both things happen. I think uh, – I think – I, I know for a fact I've had some big fish, you know, tap it around, tap it around. You think they're kind of small. Uh, there was one uh, in that I showed on, on film. I didn't show the initial tap, but I talked about it because the one Garrett caught, my oldest son, that thing tapped on it forever like this. Probably five minutes. And, fine, and, and there was no stop in, the, in any of that. And then it just went you know, down. And it was 45 pounds. But I do think that little fish, while attacking, can get a big fish that comes in and basically steals that bait and takes it down. I, I think I, both happen. I, I agree with that 100%. Actually, one of my flathead tactics is to get the channel cats all riled up. And the big, sometimes if there's a flathead anywhere near, they'll come looking to see what's going on. Yeah. Get interested. <laughs> Yeah, that's what it is. It happens to me. That's how I get a lot of my daytime flatheads. That seems to work well for me, too, as a tactic. I'm talking two in the afternoon outside of a busy bar on the Fox. I've done that a couple of times with 30 people. I know where watching. that spot is. It is a good flathead spot. <laughs> yeah, no it doubt. is. And there's nothing there. There's no drops. There's no anything. There's a little bit of, of timber on the side. And Wait, wait. It's all about current and depth. I want to go to a solo layout, but for some reason I feel that I might be jinxing. What about uh, superstitions, that. Tim? Do you have any? I've got a bunch of superstitions. I try not to talk about them, but yeah, I got a bunch. Okay. A bunch. My main one like, is oh, no, don't, don't do that. <laughs> My main one is don't fill the bait bucket before you catch your first piece of bait. <laughs> That's the biggest one of mine. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Okay. If we don't do, if I, I fill it before say. that, I don't get any bait. I remember fishing with Chris Harris one time and we had uh, another guy that went with us and we weren't doing too good. It was, the bite was off. You know, we were on the James River. We're fishing those epic holes. He likes to fish. We're doing too good. And the guy that he brought gets in his lunch box cooler and he pulls out a banana and Chris went kind of ballistic. He's like, you did what? You brought what? a banana on my boat? No wonder we're doing terrible. He reaches <laughs> over, it was his friend, grabs that banana and throws it in the water. For the guy, you could even eat it. That was funny. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of superstitions like that. You know, I was, one, I was, of mine, one of mine is shining light on the water. That That's one of mine. Except for if I'm in deep, turbid water, I don't mind. But if uh, I'm fishing for flatheads, I don't want any light on that water. Not yeah, until heard, we have a fish on. On? Okay. I've heard yeah, both... Yeah. Both scenarios. I, I know a gentleman, um, David Martin, who catches a lot of flatheads, and he lights his boat up like it's a stadium, and he still right, does but, all right. But is, but is there light on the water? There is light on the water. He's got overhead lights that he lights up okay. his whole boat with, and it looks like stadium lighting in his boat. 
And, and he'll catch crappie the whole time he's flathead fishing. He does fantastic what, what job. What situation is he flathead fishing? Okay. Um, you know what? I think he's fishing in bays and stuff. It's a lake. Um, he's on okay. Wiley, I believe. Um, yep. I don't know if you, you know Wiley, if you're there. Where does David Martin fish? Is it Wiley? That, that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It, no, it seems for some reason that lakes, especially southern lakes, will mm -hmm. a light will. It'll cause a buzz in the bait fish, you know, because plankton's form and you've got stuff running around. It'll gather shad. It'll start, you know, throwing a bunch of vibration into the water. And flatheads and lakes, if they're going to eat, they can't always rely on food coming to them. They have to get up and go. Get and up so and it, go. it kind of uh, creates creates a dichotomy between rivers and then lakes. Like the, the, the question, what's the difference between a lake and a river? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's like the... That's like a 10 hour conversation right there. And I don't think a guy could cover it all, but that is one situation where lights probably wouldn't bother me on like a crappie lake or, you know, a flathead mm -hmm. lake or something like that, because I, I've done that to where I've got a crappie light out. And all of a sudden I start catching catfish just outside, just outside the light. You know, you're catching bass or white bass or crappie or whatever, you know, back in a right. cove fairly clear water it's at night you got gar hitting the top of the water because all the bait fish are surrounded and then they start going in a big circle and pretty soon you're catching catfish i didn't catch flatheads doing this but i i, I did i started catching uh, uh channel cats and i had a i had a long handled uh, bait net basically that I, that i use in my bait tank mm -hmm. and so i just started scooping up shad about yay big putting them on the hook on a slip up and just started throwing them out so i'm catching gar catfish largemouth, smallmouth, you know, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it gets that bait fish buzz going, but I've never been able to do it on a river. You know, I'm, when I'm fishing for flathead on my river, I got my lights off for a different reason because it's so heavily populated. I got yeah. the minimal lights on to, to mark me, and other than that, until I get hooked up, I lay as low as possible. So I don't and think there's know, anybody as, that would as, disagree with that. As little as I've fished on the fox at night, I've almost had big boats run me over, even with my yeah. lights. I'm like, hey, 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 hello, hello. And then they def barely just didn't hit me a couple times. I was like, man, this is not worth fishing at night. And, and you should see with the onset of wake boats. Oh, my goodness, it's been bad out here. I almost got killed by one this summer, but that's another story. Uh, you got the bar up on Pistake Lake, then they, oh, they last – trip through the lock is at midnight by the time they get down to where i'm fishing it's 40 minutes later they come ripping around those turns and stuff it gets pretty spooky so you know half of them had already had about 12 beers at some point oh, they're, think? they're oh playing their God. music loud they, they i mean they're talking so loud you can hear what they're saying before they get to you and it's just yep. a mess a mess yeah so be careful on the water that's all i want to say everybody out there yeah, that, oh, that, wow, that slower water, heavy population of people you have up there and all those pleasure boats on that tiny little river, I don't like yeah. it for yeah. myself. It's what I have, combat fishing. It's kind of like uh, uh, opening day of trout fishing every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you about that, yes. Tim. What do you fish? Do you fish for anything besides catfish? I know you did the one video with Jonathan where you went sturgeon fishing. But other than that, is there anything else that you yeah. enjoy to do or interests you as far as fishing goes? I love all fishing. I really do. I mean, I love bait fishing. I love bluegill fishing. Uh, but if I'm going to target other like fish to just go specifically target, I have two favorites. And one is smallmouth. Love smallmouth. And I mm -hmm. love giant northern pike. Everybody else can have the muskie. I like the northern pike because there is a certain monster hunting principle to it where, you know, you got muskie guys. It's not really all that uh, – it's pretty frowned upon to fish the way I fish for big pike for muskies, like taking large suckers and, you know, bluegill mm -hmm. where it's legal and stuff like that. To tar but I do, I'll, I'll target big pike yep. in the season, even in the summer in 20, 25 feet of water. And I'll use the trolling motor and I will use an egg sinker like this. And a, I, I catch all my big pike on circle hooks, basically the same stuff as I use catfishing, only I downsize my rod and reel. 
I might use super line. I might, use, you know, I'm going to use a lot of uh, mm -hmm. spinning gear, but I will actually go along islands up there, you know, where the drop off is 20 foot deep. And then, then it levels off like that when the pike are deep and I will just bump that bottom real slow like this. And you feel that bite. And then all of a sudden, and then and there it goes down. And I, I might have there a 36 go. inch pike. I might have a 40, inch pike, I might have a 25 inch pike. But it's, it's pretty good. Uh, oh, so we got a fish on. Act a lot. Got him. I got him. He's on. Got him. Got him. Go. Yes. Way to go. All right. That one has been messing with it this whole time, huh? Uh, yeah, he's been playing with it. He's playing with it. Finally got it. Finally stuck a hook in him. Hey, he's not tiny either. <laughs> oh, nice no, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, Lynn Leaper, I see your, your question up there. Oh, nice fish. Uh huh. Now, now that's a slow bike. <laughs> oh yeah. Way to go, Jeremy. Uh, where yeah. you stand? Nice. Looks like that pelican was waiting for a handout. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I hit the phone. Oh god. Did we lose stream? No, we're still good. Okay. I was waiting for somebody to say something. <laughs> Perfect. Another fish on a boat on the deck. We were literally really up to move to jog over a few feet. Yeah. And he was just on there. Interesting. So you were going to answer Lynn's question about uh, the yep. eggs and the flatheads? Matter of fact, that is so true that big flatheads will have twice and three times that many eggs. And that has been reported to me by, because uh, I had the same question of a lot of DNR buyers. Some of them didn't know, but there was other ones that did because they had went through their college studies and actually read that. You know, they did counts on eggs between 50 pounders and then like, say, 25 pounders. And it's quite a, quite a difference. You know, 225,000 eggs sounds like a lot of eggs. And it is. And I actually, I actually was fishing in an area from a closing dike, the mouth of the Rock River one time snagged a, a stick that had flathead eggs on it, and it was pretty uh -huh. incredible. They even had the little embryo on it. In it. Hey, Tim. The, it was, they were all hatch. Yes. Me. Tim, what's up? What's up? Congratulations, guys. Some little sores. It almost feels like acne bumps on his skin. Almost feels like acne. They're little bumps. Yeah. It's actually a bacterial infection, and the bacterial infection is, is actually closely related to a, uh, there's like a protozoan that lives in the water, and then you get a certain fish that are, are stressed or predisposed to it, and they will have that. Channel cats are especially vulnerable to it. Huh. Same thing. I always thought that those were, uh, not not bugs, but what am I thinking of? Some sort of, uh, um, I didn't realize parasite. it was a bacteria. That, par I thought it was a parasite. I didn't realize that it was a bacterial infection. It, it, it is. And, and I talked about when, when I first started that, I was thinking it was a different thing, but I kind of switched it back around to a protozoan, which a protozoan mm -hmm. is not a bacteria. It is a parasite. And it okay. will bury itself under the skin and do, do a whole bunch of things. And uh, uh, as long as we're talking about it, let's talk about the thing in the middle of catfish's heads. Everybody that's a catfisherman has caught a catfish with some sort of sore right in the head, right on top, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people think that that is because they root under stuff or, or they're fighting or whatever. It's not. It's actually a bacterial skin infection called enteric sepsemia. And I okay. know that's, that's kind of, of a weird thing. But I, had, I was really interested because uh, it's, it's also in the aquarium trade known as hole in the head. Okay. Oh, all right. So when I was learning all my aquarium stuff, I extrapolated that and then did a little bit more research of, you know, how you can get that. And it's actually due to heavy nitrates in the water, especially at a certain time of year. Like you won't see a lot of hole in the head in the winter, but you will see it in the late summer more than you will anything else because that back, you know, that, that, that hole in that, that stuff is flourishing. And for some reason it will attack fish right on the, top of their head it's really kind of a weird thing hmm. now now you mentioned that you see that more in the summer how come i'm seeing more of the bumps in the winter is that normal or well, am you i see just the bumps but 
No, you, it, it's correct because uh, uh, the winter time is sort of a in the preservator period for that type of uh, what you said earlier. It's it's more of a uh, uh, parasite. A parasite. Uh -huh. So evidently, the favorable conditions are better in the winter for that parasite, whereas the hole in the head for that bacteria, the certain temperature nitrates build up just to where they're susceptible to it. Now, I've actually now, do had they... uh, fish in tank, uh, actually develop that and then be able to change water enough and change the temperature enough that it, it'll it actually heal. Oh, okay. Quickly. That, would, that was my next question, if they heal themselves, because I'm not finding that parasite in the summer at all, to be honest yeah. with you. I don't recall finding them, at least in the waters here, so... Very cool. Catfish I was wondering about that. Poor water Catfish with poor water quality are very susceptible to certain diseases. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, catfish, they have a very result. They're very, very good at healing. They heal about three or four times faster than we do. It's pretty darn incredible. You, you know, I've caught fish. And in their lip, they've got a hole that you can put your finger through. And in three days, it's gone. It's one really? of the most incredible things I have ever seen. I, I did not expect it. I did not expect it at all. And it's not just happened once. It has happened plenty of times. You know, when you catch a small flathead right in the corner of the mouth, they end up ripping kind of a little hole, in, especially yeah. back in the days when we used to set the hook on fish. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I thought, oh, my gosh, this this thing is in bad. That's one of the reasons why I actually took it home to my, my big fish tank because I wanted to see how long this thing languished there. And, Two or three days, it's gone. Almost uh, not even noticeable in four. But they yeah. they will get ick pretty easy. They will mm -hmm. develop certain uh, things. They'll start showing their parasites that they get. Uh, have you? Obviously, you've seen these creatures because you fish the fox. So you catch a flathead, and then on their skin, there's a little kind of a see through little uh, flat. It looks kind of like almost a spider on the fish. Have you seen those? I, I have not. I haven't. Okay. So if you fish a little bit slower water, next time you're flathead fishing, mm -hmm. check up underneath the gill plate and look on the surface because okay. these little things, they're, they're actually called fish lice, and they're okay. very prevalent on flatheads because flatheads don't move a lot. Right. Okay? They're laying so around. I have to be really careful when I bring them into my artificial stuff because I, I brought a flathead to my big tank one time, and he mm -hmm. evidently I didn't see it. Had some fish lice on them, and in like a week, there was like a hundred thousand of those things. They really, egg everywhere. I had to salt bath the fish because he had them. He he was getting covered with them, and he just wasn't doing too good. He was about forty pounds, so I had to uh, basically salt bath him so that they come off. Then I had to put him in a quarantine tank, get him back to health, and let him go right away because I had to drain my thousand gallon tank dry and let it wow. set for two weeks because those little eggs can just stay. I mean, they're they're pretty resilient. Hmm. That's pretty cool. I'm going to have to take a closer look at that. Usually uh, when I'm catching them, I'm ca I ain't even going to kid you. I'm too excited. I'm looking at the patterns and stuff and looking for spawn marks and yeah. seeing if it's been yeah, caught yeah. another time. Uh, just another thing to look for. So uh, I'll make sure yeah. to do that. Now, let me ask you about this. I heard a, a couple of discussions. Um, t flatheads or catfish in general, let's, let's say flatheads. I know I'm being self-serving here. 10 pounds and less. What are the chances of them turning into a monster fish? Well, first of all, we have to ask a question. We have to say what genetic heritage are they? Are they main river Mississippi river fish or have they been sectioned off for a long time? That's the first thing. Okay. Because I believe I am a firm believer in that uh, if you are to take a population of anything and you start artificially removing the big people or the big fish out of it, what you have left is fish that don't really either grow as fast before they mm -hmm. hit sexual maturity. They're slower growers. Right, Maybe let, they let, don't have they they might not even have the ability to get big enough. Uh -huh. Because let's think think about this: if you have a thousand people. And you put them in one location and you start dispatching everybody over five and a half feet. And then you do that for a hundred years. 
Yeah, you're still going to have a few throwbacks, but you're going to have a population of people that don't get very tall. And I think that can happen with fish as well, especially fish that are sectioned off dam-wise, like the fox, Mm -hmm. things like that. I think it takes a long time to get those few fish that have the genetics to go fast, grow fast enough before sexual maturity so that they can Mm -hmm. actually get big. Because I've, I've been involved in those uh, growth study things where I've seen the slides of the otoliths, I've seen the reports, and I've seen some growth rates that are off the charts for a few, a small percentage of the flathead population. And then I've seen the other where uh, the growth rings say that this fish is incredibly old for as big as he is, and then some are incredibly young for as big as that one is. But you've got that medium, which is most, it's like 80% of the population. So you've got 10 under, 10 over. Mm -hmm. But that other is just normal growth rate. So if you start eliminating the bigger aggressive fish that have that that penchant for growing very fast before sexual maturity, then they already have a head start to be able to get to be 48, 49, 50, 51, 55 inches long. How many Fox River flatheads do you see that are 55 inches long? Almost none. Probably no, no. not too many. How, many. how many have I caught in my lifetime on at, at 55 inches? I've caught plenty of them on the Mississippi River, even though they're mm-hmm. very small percentage of the population. But you get into the Rock River out of, out of uh, uh, let me see if I can re- recall the data from 25 years ago or 20 years ago anyway. The data was they caught in hoop nets in the winter transition period, that is, the fall transition, when they're going to their wintering holes, they caught something in the territory of 3,900 flatheads. Okay, so the reason why that is, is because there's only so many known wintering holes. And a lot of the fish off that shallower stuff transfer themselves right down to those wintering holes. So they caught 3,900 fish. Guess how many were over 50 pounds? Take one guess. A I don't know, maybe. Guess. A logical guess. Uh, maybe 1%. Two percent point point zero zero one point zero zero one. That's how that is one tenth of one per, or one one hundredth. There was actually one hundredth of, of one percent. Uh-huh. So if you were to do that on the Mississippi, I believe that your percentage would be like you guessed somewhere to be one to two percent. But since the Rock River is not a transient population anymore from the Mississippi River. And there is a lot Uh of trot line and there is a lot of bank pulling and there is a lot of, you know, harvest on these fish. I believe that the bigger aggressive fish can be actually caught first and eliminated out of the gene pool because I think they make themselves available to it. Mm -hmm. You know, robust, big, moving around fish that, you know, right. Yeah. I mean, they're the high energy fish the ones that grow fast they need more food they're making themselves available to fishermen more quicker sooner and they're the first ones to get cold out Mm -hmm. so then what you're when you say cold we're talking about predation right whether it's disease or or being consumed or or by accident or anglers correct i I think i think uh, uh, almost like the people if you are an energetic really aggressive fish I think your odds at survival are actually less in some cases because you're going to make yourself available to getting targeted by other big fish. You're going to make yourself targeted to storks. I mean, I've caught pretty big fish with stork marks right in their back. I mean, and if mm-hmm. all they would have had to do is get hit right in the upper rib cage and they're dead, done. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of reaching here in this conversation, mm-hmm. but I, I think, you know, if, if I thought it was a, uh, you know, a standard known thing, I would say, yes, there's evidence. I don't have any evidence. This is just my feeling on the genetic pool. You know, when you section off a population, okay, from the main stem. You're you're looking more and more potential rather than percentage wise right now, right? Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't have the hard data on the Mississippi, but I do mm-hmm. know fishing results. I fished the Rock River a long time, and there, there is some fish over 50 pounds. But I, you know, as long as I fish the Rock and as long as I fish the Mississippi, I've caught a lot more fish over 60, 70, 80 pounds of the Mississippi than I have the Rock. Even though the Rock is a prolific fishery, it's probably one of the better uh, flathead rivers in the state of Illinois. But as far as being able to target big fish, as soon as I started fishing the Mississippi and having success there, I've never been back to the rock. 
What's going on, Creo? How you doing, my friend? Oh, not too bad. We made one more little move. I moved to the to the kind of other side of the dam from where I was at. Marked a few more fish right here, and we'll uh, sit here a few minutes, and guess we'll see what happens. Sweet. Looks like we got some new people in chat. Well, or new people watching. Welcome. Hey, Stan. What's going on? Hope you had a lot of luck today. Uh, I see Lynn say congratulations to One Ton Fishing Club. If you guys are listening or watching, congratulations, guys. Uh, yeah, Creole's at four four fish or five fish now, right, Creole? Uh, we got five now. Five fish now. Five fish on the deck, so he's doing pretty good. Uh, Michael Mor Morello, I said hello. Uh, we had a bunch of good questions. We're coming on uh, uh, five and a half hours. How you feeling, Tim? How you feeling, uh, Jeremy? I feel great. We're still fishing. I don't know. I can talk about fishing almost as long as I can fish. And that's a long time. <laughs> that's a long time. You know, I'm one of them guys that if I'm going to go out and fish, it's going to be for a while. And that kind of thins the herd out a little bit amongst my friends who go a second time fishing with me. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I always say this. We're usually the last one to leave. It's very rare that I get to a boat ramp and there's anyone left. left. Doesn't matter if if I'm in St. Louis or I'm in Buck Island or if I'm you know north or I'm on whatever. It's almost always, and I have to make sure that my boat is top notch because if my boat is not top notch, if if I get stuck on the river, there's no one to help me usually because yeah. it might be three o'clock in the morning. It might be you know. It might be midnight on a Sunday, and the last person left the river by three o'clock in the afternoon. You know, especially the guys that aren't targeting catfish, even the ones that are. I mean, holy moly! It's very rare yep. that we see a boat left. You can ask uh, you, you can ask let, Heroes that. He's like, yeah. uh -huh. Let's talk about safety a little bit. Do you have one of those Garmin yeah. devices, those satellite devices? You do. I think that's a very wise no. decision. Oh, you don't have, or I you don't. do? Okay. Me. Uh huh. Or, or Jeremy. Or do you have one? I do not. Okay. I am I'm so I am like Gilligan's Island old school. I don't even have a radio. I've no. got a cell phone. That that's uh -huh. that's one thing. But I mean I'm a self I have literally <laughs> I ran out of gas one time five miles from the boat ramp downstream. So there was no uh -huh. floating back. It's midnight on a Sunday, and I literally had to walk through the Mississippi swamp five miles one way and then carry a five-gallon gas can on my shoulder like this up to this much water. <laughs> because if I didn't do that, I would have had to walk the long way, and the long way is about nine miles. So I said, okay. So I got all bit up. I'm you know, coming back. But that was in my younger days when uh, uh, I was a lot tougher than now. So I think I, think I am going to go the route of safety now that I'm kind of, like my kids say, kind of like a boomer now. Yeah, you're, you you gotta you gotta make it home to your family and stuff. Up, oh, do we got I'm one? That's right. Up, oh. uh, just a decent move. Oh, okay. I saw you get up and rush there. I got all excited. Garmin sells those little in-reach devices. I believe it's like fifteen dollars a month. If you're out on the Mississippi, you're out in the uh, the backwoods. I think they're a wise investment. So if you guys can afford it and you're spending a lot of time outside, away from people, and you're doing like Probably I do. Good. Launching, launching. Your, so it's like I launch my boat at midnight, and I'm coming in at ten o'clock. It, it, it's good because I'm in cell signal. But if I wasn't, if I was fishing in some of the areas you yeah. guys fish, I would be a little concerned. Yeah. So, so, and I haven't thought in those terms because I used to be the guy doing the rescuing. I've mm -hmm. never needed rescue one time. You know, I've uh, I've been on the water so much. I've seen it where you know. Uh, literally, I've rescued people from below low head dams. I've helped the fire and rescue do stuff. I've dropped people off on shore and then got them back to their boat launch. I've drug in many boats that were, you know, just not operable. Uh -huh. Sean and I just did one not too long ago where there was a couple guys we just thought they were drift fishing. We went to go get uh, skipjack and from a long way away, we just barely saw this, and we 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 yeah, we had to tow them back to the to the boat launch, and you know, it just it, that's what we do. We're cat fishermen. We uh, we help people. You, you know, I never used to wear a a life jacket until I started. Well, until I had my kayak, and then once I did that, I yeah. started wearing it. I kind of got used to it. I got one of those inflatable ones, which I'm trying to wear a little more. I'm not going to lie and say I wear it all the time, but I'm getting better at it. 
I think it's pretty important, yeah. you know, to do. Um, I'm also from I'm that back. old school where I'm I back. always think I'm. I'm sorry. Yeah, back back 20 years ago, and, and I put out what what was that uh, epic adventure on Scary River? Back then, I yeah, that was one of water. my favorites. I could, I was very, very, you know, whatever. Yeah, and so you know, I wasn't worried about falling anywhere. You know, I could swim like a freaking dolphin. But now that I'm older, kind of fatter. I'm like, hmm, I don't know. So I started wearing my life jacket more too, especially when I'm in the epic crazy water. I mean, yeah, there definitely. are some spots that he, there are some spots you just make sure you do not fall out of the boat because life jacket or not, you have a large possibility of dying. No, absolutely, you don't. Matter of fact, that one where I caught the super monster, if you fall in there, you will end up right in where the barges come through, and they will not see you. You will get run over by a hundred yard long march three wide <laughs> you will it's just i mean if if that happens yeah you're done if you can get across before a barge comes through and get to the slower water i think you could survive but that stuff is not survivable so it's quite know, the, i don't even really yeah, yeah. Oh, crazy stuff so what's going on creo did you not have one on that corner I was starting to think that's the lucky side of the boat. Isn't it funny how that happens, Mark? You get that hot, I was, hot rod, hot side of the boat. You got nine rods out, and one catches every fish in the whole trip. It's just the goofiest me, thing ever. Oh yeah, and, me and Jonathan were on Mendota a few months ago, and uh, we he worked his butt off. I was like on a guided tour. He busted his hump to to find those fish. The wind was howling. It was cold out. And once we got on a spot, we got that anchor actually set. One rod on his side of the boat got all the fish. And that's just the way it was. Tried to get yeah. over a little bit, couldn't do that, but that was just the nature of the beast. It was still fun. Do you fish for Channel Cat at all still? Yeah. yeah I do. You do? I do. Very cool. Yeah. I, I will be filming some big Channel Cats come this spring. I think Jeremy has something he wants to say. I'm going to actually oh, not interrupt people. What, me? Yeah, what happened? What happened? You hung up? Oh, I thought I thought you had something you wanted to say. I don't know. No, no, no. I'm just I'm just watching the watching my brother. He uh hung the rod up. Ah. One of the conferences. But yes, Mark. Uh, you did. Channel cats. I still like them, and especially uh, in my region because the blue cat population doesn't really get here until later part of the year, and it never gets up to in August. What's that? What do you consider an epic channel cat? What size? Anything. Uh, okay, so an epic. It, it has less to do with size and more to do with where it's caught. Because I really start. I like a channel cat that's over five pounds, obviously. <laughs> but if I'm catching them in slow water, eh, not so epic. But if 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 I catch them in that shallow, fast water, cool, crazy stuff, and they're folding rods over like this. And you're setting the hook on one, setting the hook on the other, handing with your buddy, and you're cranking these things in. That's pretty epic. So eight to fifteen pounds is my general average. No, sorry, it's it's not my general. It's my average bigger fish. I will catch quite a few that are four, five, six pounds, but I don't sneeze at any of them, especially in those awesome situations. Very cool. Now, if I had blues up here, like within an hour of my house. I'd probably probably not fish for channel cats as much, but I don't. So I can drive an hour, go to crazy cool channel cat waters, and do a really cool trip. Uh, and blues, I'd be hard pressed to find any up here, you know, within my range because Keokuk is actually the the highest point on the Mississippi you can expect to catch a blue catch cat. blues. Okay. Yeah, that's two and a half hours south of me, probably four and a half hours south of you. I've heard a lot of good things about Kia Cut from some friends, so uh, yeah. that would be a cool place to go. Uh, Thomas Little Page says, will catfish grow larger within a larger river system? Just, uh, just pop. I would have to say that yes and no, because I've got some evidence mm -hmm. that Catfish will still go grow, grow large in a very small situation. And being from <laughs> Illinois, you have heard about the Hennepin Canal, right? About the what? Hennepin Canal. 
I'm, I'm sorry. Which canal you, you broke up? The, the Hennepin Canal. The Hennepin? No, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Okay, so we live not too far. It's about 20 miles Hennepin Canal. And the canal was actually built to, it, it extends from the Rock River to the Illinois River and also to the Mississippi River. But the okay. fish is not a transient population because they have locks at the ends of mm -hmm. each one in which the water just falls over. They can't swim through. But there is a population of flatheads in that river, in that man-made canal, which the average is four foot deep, nothing. It's not burned. You can almost cast across it. But yet there is a decent population of some very big flatheads in it. So that kind of flies in the face of the old in fisherman adage that they used to talk about. Well, if you want big fish, you have to go to these big, wide, diverse, deep rivers. Now your mm -hmm. your 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 chances are better, I would say, than going to the average small river and catching a huge catfish. But there is evidence of if it has the right dynamics even a small body of water can have big fish. The problem is with these small bodies of water, fish have a migratory thing built into them. So as the spring gets there, they start traveling up these tributary rivers, but once their spawning is done, they travel back to the main rivers to overwinter. Some of them will stay, but the population is very small after the spawn. It's fairly big before the spawn, usually before anybody really starts fishing for catfish. I used to have guys at Star Rock, at, at, you know, at th those areas tell me, oh, you're way too early. You know, it's like April 25th, and I'm just putting a whooping on big channel cats. But they go by me in their little bass boats and go, man, you're too early for that. They think, you know, they've listened to the magazines and everybody telling you, you got to go after July 4th. And I'm like, no, this is, yeah. the, this is the time. I mean, I just... I just caught 50 fish between eight o'clock this morning and noon, and I'm going to catch another 50 before I leave here. And, and they're all shocked to hear that. And I'm like, just hang out for a minute. If you want to see what happens, because I'm getting ready to go in a new spot. I already caught four fish here, I'm getting ready to go up here. And I'm going to tackle it. There was a, 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 uh, like an old paddle wheel boat that they give tours on when I was guiding down there at star rock. And they would load it up with people. And usually the first trip came out about nine o'clock and I would be fishing around Plum Island with my customers. And that riverboat captain, he started to notice when I was fishing that he needed to come up close and he would get on his loudspeaker. And almost inevitably, we would always be landing fish and holding them up and everybody's taking pictures on the thing, cheering and clapping. They know nothing about catfish, but they're like, oh my gosh, there's fish that big in here? We're like, oh yeah. You know, I used to love yeah. it when people brought kids because kids get so excited about, you know, fish like oh, yeah. this. And they're like, oh my God, because it's humongous to a little kid. You know, so oh, yeah, yeah. We, we had a great time doing that. Always real interesting. Hey, real quick, I want to make sure that everybody goes down in the description and clicks on Epic Slinks, Epic Catfish, mm -hmm. clicks on Creole Catfish link. Make sure you subscribe. Great channels. I want to make sure that uh, if you're not subscribed, that you go and do so. Uh, we got some new people in here. I want to make sure to send them your way if they haven't already been there. Um, oh. Very cool. How are you hanging in there, Creole? Uh, hanging in. We still getting a few bites. Very cool. How That's are you doing? Time you need a break? Uh, I could use one. Uh, Why don't you go ahead and take a break? All right. Buddy. We'll see you in a few minutes. It's just me and you, Creo. How you doing, brother? Hey, no problem, brother. Mark, why you never ask how I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> We're going out five hours and forty-two minutes. You're still going strong, my friend. chat how many people we've had come in and out uh we we're, we've been steady around 30 we're at 28 now so it's pretty good there's a bunch of other live streamers that are out there again uh that are still out there which is expected on a saturday uh it's always good to see them uh i think uh looks like mr melhorn's on there so you guys are doing great we're having a good conversation this will be out there for everybody to look at after the after the fact, which is always good. 
I got to spend time with you and, and Tim, which is always fun. Oh, yeah, you better believe it. <clears throat> I'm going to get back down off the back deck of the boat and quit watching that rod, because the more I watch it, the more it bugs me. <laughs> so I'm just going to come back down here. Thanks, Ryan. Congrats on Ryan got a flathead. Did you hear when I mentioned that earlier? Oh, no, I didn't hear that. Yeah, he got a flathead. Wow. Uh, I've, winter flathead. I, I thought the water would have been way too cold for that. Shoot, that's awesome. Creel, you know what I get to do after I'm done with you? Go take a nap? No, I get to shovel snow. Shovel snow? Oh, Lord. You know what snow is? I, I've heard of it. <laughs> I've heard of it. Well, like I said, we don't get we don't get real snow down here. When it when it snows, it's it's more like a slush, you know. My first real snow that stuck to the ground. We had about two or three inches because I was about an hour north of where we li actually live. Uh huh. College. I had a, a roommate from college, and he was from Oklahoma. I was 26 years old. I made him go outside and teach me how to make a snowball. It was my first one. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? I'm like, I'm dead serious. Put your shoes on. But did you make a snow angel? Uh, I think I was, I was, I didn't want to get wet. <laughs> I don't, but I made a tiny snowman and threw a snowball at him. Just don't eat the yellow snow if you guys don't know what that is. Oh, no, 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 no. Definitely don't eat the yellow snow. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not a good idea. Uh, and while I was talking to you, I just got a notification saying that there's a uh, snow will begin shortly. <laughs> uh, that's, uh. Now, they are talking about some really, really cold weather. Well, at least for my area next week. They're talking about being down in the low 20s. which what? that's Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you got I'm milk and bread for all that? You know they're going to empty the stores out when that happens, right? Oh, I'm sure. But no, nah, it, it'll it'll be fine. <laughs> I know whenever we get a notice of a big storm coming over here, even though we're used to it, man, those stores sells out of everything. But it's like that around here for hurricane season. Oh, I imagine. Even oh, worse. When a storm enters the Gulf, you can pretty much forget about finding, like, you know, bottled water, cold water. Mm -hmm. Sandwich meat, bread, like all the essential stuff, that, that's, that's all gone. Everybody stocks up on all of that. I find it funny, though. Everybody, is it the same for the snow weather? Everybody takes all of the bread. It's completely sold out. Still ain't touched the flour tortillas. I know, right? No, they they, they take all of they They pick up all of that stuff here. So <laughs> storm supplies are storm supplies. So well, That's what I do. I go to making burritos for a week, and it's yeah. fine. Ain't nothing wrong with that. So I leave for a minute, and you guys are talking about burritos. We were talking about snow for a minute there, because I just got some warnings that say I, I got it. After we're done with this, I got snow to shovel still left over from yesterday. I was letting uh, Creel know how lucky he's out fishing, and, and uh, he could be up here north shoveling snow. So, Well, Catfish Heroes was going to make a surprise visit and get on the show with us for a little bit, and okay. he got stuck in his, in his own driveway. <laughs> so he's waiting for somebody to come pull him out. <laughs> well, then we'll come visit you when the heat index here is 120. Yeah. Okay. There, there you go. Come on up. I know if it's 120, I ain't coming to visit you. No offense, guys. With, I'll stay up here. With 100% humidity, don't forget. <gasps> All right, this is yeah, that can be rough, too, because I do find that when the water temperature gets above about 87, 88, it seems to shut fish off, too. Huh? Got I uh, got another accidental fish. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Was he on there the whole time? Just hanging on, not pulling the rod down. Yeah, the, the bait was under the boat, so he went to check it. Oh. Number six. The same size. Hey, Carl. Hey, I'm in a live chat right now. I'm on Catfish and Cry. He's a cute little fishy. Yep. That's about right. The cheapest rod I own, that's the one that's catching all the fish. <laughs> 
That's where you're getting all the fish. That's the way it works. Every time. The cheapest rod with the lightest line. All right, Tim, I just muted you for a second, so you had a little yeah, privacy. That was, com um, that, was, that was old Combat Carl. I guess Catfish oh, okay. Brewing Trophy Catfish. You know? Yep. He probably went, had some. Hey, look at that. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Probably had a fishing report for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. How's he doing? Good, good, good. He's going through the same thing everybody else is. I mean, it's, you know, you move on to some fish. Uh, the smaller ones are active. The bigger ones are aren't a lot of times and you know that's what you deal with in the winter you, you got to hit it right at that right moment when they're right going to eat and that's uh that's one of the most frustrating things that i've found i i actually opened up my show for uh one of my videos on a we went to a power plant lake and they weren't pumping water so it's cold water and i said really mm -hmm. it's not locate it's not usually getting the bait it's not usually anything of that it's just getting them to pull the rods down and really, if you can get on to, uh, if you can move enough, just like Jeremy's doing right there, if you can move enough and you can get on a few active fish, that is better than trying to wait out a monster that may or may not bite for three days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you just kind of take catfish by attrition. And I look at fishing a little bit differently than a lot of people because I'm that's a like great, a that's a great word right there. Catfish by what? attrition. Yeah. Catfish it, it, by it, attrition. It, I like that a lot. So, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, even when I used to guide, I'm, I, I would uh, go through what's going to happen with my customers as they're getting in the boat. They're like, well, how's it going? I said, well, it's anything like yesterday. We're going to have to catch big fish by attrition. And it's, they're like, hmm, what does that mean? I said, well, we're, we're going to visit a lot of areas and we're going to catch some smaller fish. But who no I'm not exactly sure if we're going to be able to catch big fish. We're just going to catch them not by targeting specifically big fish we're going to catch them by attrition because otherwise we're going to be waiting a long time being fishless and there's no longer face than a than a guide trip with no fish fish yeah that's a bad thing <laughs> you know i mean it can be a beautiful day it's great scenery it's all that stuff but if you're not getting that you know that that stuff on the end of your rod that you know pull downs and nice fish and whatever i i it, it's just not great i mean i can handle it because i've been fishing so long i can go and go and go and go but to take somebody else with me? No, I got to put people on fish. <laughs> What's going on, Jeremy? Uh, just, uh, I thought I had a rod hung up from recasting. Okay. See, we I heard, heard a little bit of excitement. Uh, yep, a little excitement. Back to business. Ooh. Oh. Well, not a not a, not a terrible day of fishing. I've had better, but I've sure had a lot worse. Oh, Five fish isn't had. bad at all. Yep. Nope. Nope. Oh, Especially with those conditions. Man, five or six. We're at six now. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we're at six now. Nice. I keep oh, turning away to try and wake my bulldog up, keep her from snoring too loud, poor thing. I we, can't we get can't her to move off the cut. Okay, if you can't hear her, then we're good. Nope. <laughs> I thought it was great when you when you moved, and there was your bulldog right there. That was yeah, great. She is. She's like, here yeah. with Mama. She oh, is. look at that! <laughs> She's old. That's She's awesome. about twelve years old. So uh, I don't I don't move her. That's her spot. Let her have yep. it. So yep. The right. time she gets up is to eat and bite somebody, pretty much. So <laughs> that's great. Mm. Boy, oh man. man. And then every now and then something nips at that donkey bait. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm still holding out hope that something will slam it. Well, every, every time a little fish comes up and bites that donkey bait, more scent goes down. So hopefully you will be able to track a big one if that happens. That'd be great. But that's, you know, we'll, we'll get into areas. We'll get into areas where the bite's kind of slow. I've already marked fish. But uh -huh. if they're not moving around, I'll actually reel especially in those bigger basin holes yep. with a little slower current than what Jeremy's fishing. Even this, I'll even lift the rod and hop that stuff, reel in and set it. And, you know, oh, if I'm not getting, you know, bites, 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 and I'll believe this or not, I'll do it with, with flatheads too, Mark. Because I really? believe if, get get that, that, if you get that bait to hop, whether you're using cut bait or whether you're using live baits, if you get that bait to hop around, it will attract the attention of them. And, and it pays off a lot, a lot, a lot. 
but you usually have to be on pretty good numbers to do it. Numbers of fish that aren't willing to move around because it's not necessary if they will move around. You'll know that mm-hmm. if you throw your rods out, you get bit pretty pretty quick. And then you throw your rods out again, you get bit pretty quick. Or if they sit there for 20 minutes, there's not a wiggle going on. But yet you lift one and move it, and pretty soon, and you leave everything else, and that one gets hit. And then you do it again, this one over here. Then I start moving them all, and then pretty soon it's musical rods again. You know, or or you just get lucky enough and and get that within its strike zone and strike zone. Just detection zone. Yeah, so it's almost like bass fishing or crappie fishing mm-hmm. or anything else. And it can it can be a, a present big the bait thing. to more fish. That was the best advice I ever got from a bass fisherman in, in my What's life. That? Present the bait to more fish was the best advice I got from yeah. a bass fisherman ever. So yep. that makes yep. a lot yep. of sense to me. More opportunity, make your opportunities and go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna have to watch more people's videos because I'm I'm still uh, when I when I talk to people they they talk in more of the new age cat fisherman stuff and and I like seeing that when when they you know guys like you that have been fishing a long time and you've actually you know because if you think about it when you and I started fishing it was basically sitting with yeah sitting absolutely. Wing. And, and, you know, there's guys that would go on to a spot that they did well July 2nd, five years ago, and they go back to that same spot and they throw out baits and they sit and wait. And they might get a flurry of activity right there before dark or right after dark. But that would, I mean, a lot of times that, mm-hmm. that's done. But now you see people move and move in their baits, doing things that they didn't usually do. And it, it's, it's resulting in bigger and more fish coming to the boat. That's what it's all about. More active. Definitely. Yeah, there's a big difference between the way my grandfather taught me how to fish and how I do it now. So, Yeah, huge, huge. It's a good thing. Yeah. So, Creo, how you doing, bud? Ah, uh, we still, uh, we still watching rods. That's how I'm, I'm, I'm watching that, uh, it, it's got to be a small one. I'm still watching him play with that donkey bait every now and then. Ryan's still giving it heck. He's dragging baits in 40 degree water. See, see that's that's what's that's what's funny. Their water is not that much colder than what my water is now, but the temperatures are so different. Yeah, because all of our cold water is just piping straight down to you. I was sending mm-hmm. all that cold water to me when we fished uh last weekend when I went to Red River, which you know which comes out of Oklahoma and Texas, it was ten degrees warmer than what this water is right now. Yep. Because you have water that's coming off of, you know, all the way up by Minnesota, Canada, yep. Canadian borders coming down to you. You know, now it warms as it comes because we have smaller rivers that aren't all the way up in that super frigid. Mm-hmm. But now, now our region is frigid all the way. I mean, all oh, the way down. This. We're out oh, on fish, 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 fish. Fish. That was a good one. Easy now. Pretty good takedown on that one. That was a fun one to watch. A good, slow, suspended takedown. I like that. Jeremy, I'm loving that wall. <laughs> That's why I moved close to it. Nice. 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 All right, let's see here. I see flatheads on that wall in the summer. That's a decent fish, isn't it? Or you you want to let him come back here? Excellent. Sorry I'm, so, sorry, I'm so quiet, Tim. I'm, I'm baited breath. I'm kind of looking forward to seeing this fish. That's all right. I'm a talker, so I'm going to be like, yeah, that's awesome, <laughs> blah, 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 you know. <laughs> you know how many times I've done that where I've had a hard time or slow going on one side of a river, and I've just moved right across the other side, and what yes. a difference. Yep. I, same I think- depth. Same think, river channel, just yep. on the opposite side, made all yep. the difference. I, th- I think I think a lot of us cat fishermen have, you know, to where you're just not quite on the mark, and then you I, shift I, I, over, and you're on that mark. Mm-hmm. Nice fish. Nice yes. Fish. Yes. Woo. Look who catches the big one. All right. Let's get a good look at that one. Oh, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. Congratulations, guys. 
Wait, give me that grabber. You on? I will let them get stuff worked out. We'll go back. Oh, he's wait. getting ready. He's getting ready. Oh, I think they got another one on. Got that another awesome. one? <laughs> Here we go. Now that's that's how to do it. That's how to do it, Creel. Creel's got him dialed in. There's that bite window. Or location window. <laughs> that too. Uh, do we need a weight on this? I don't think he's that impressive. And that's on the opposite side of the boat this time, right, Creole? Different rods? Yep, he was getting them on the left. Now he's getting them on the right. Uh, we might be right at 30. Do you want to weigh in? Sure, we why don't need not? to weigh we'll in. Just, just hold it. Or, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's got just... a scale in his hand. We'll get that weight for the people at home. Yeah. Is it set right? Tim, people love to know what they weigh when they're watching. Yeah, I guess they do. Let's just set it. And really, in the cold water period, you can have those fish out of the water quite a while. They don't really, they don't really go down as far as uh, you know, like they do in the summer. Uh -huh. The oxygen content, they don't so, get wore out as much. They don't fight as hard. They do a lot of curling. Can you? So, what's the longest you recommend a fish stay out of water? Well, it depends. Uh, I actually recommend as little time as possible, but you do have more leeway in the cold water. There's no doubt. You know, I, I would say, you know, four, five, six minutes with 70 degrees, uh, less okay. than that with, uh-oh. Uh oh, we lost him. Did he come off? Yeah, all right, he, I was I was fixing to get him out of the water. He came off. He was, he was about I, eight, he wasn't a big one. Okay. It was another clone. I, I got to look at him, actually. He was at the surface. It was the early release. There you go. To get back to, you know, out of the water, they can stay out of the water probably twice as long in the cold water. You know, anything under mm -hmm. 50 degrees, anything around 70 degrees. Depends on how you fight them. If it's, if it's a monumental fight, you want to get them back in the water faster. Um, but if if that water is like high 70s, I try to, you know, a couple minutes. I mean, unless it's a flat. Flatheads are actually more resilient to that because they don't like, they'll fight hard, but they don't fight to the death yeah. death. They're pretty resilient. Those mm -hmm. blues can pretty much go belly up if you do, like, if, if I'm into a 45-minute fight and do an epic spot, I definitely want to keep that fish wet. I don't want him to spend more than about five minutes in the boat. Two or three minutes is even better. You know, it's it's just, and it's kind of a discretion thing. If you catch them out of a lake, it's not, it's probably not as uh important as it is a river because they will exhaust themselves more depending on how you fight them now if you trick them to the boat and then you pump them up you can keep them in the boat longer if they fight you at the surface of the water 100 yards back and do all this other crazy stuff mm -hmm. and it's like this monumental you know dolphin fight uh yeah you need to get them back in the water how much energy they've exerted and exactly exactly yeah, that makes but sense. you know a good rule of thumb is three to five minutes on a bigger and I'm fish. sure the smaller the fish, if you, if you got like a five pound channel out of water, I'm sure they'd last a hell of a lot longer than a big fish would. So they do, they do, and it's the you know, and once those channels get big, though, it is kind of uh, it's kind of imperative to keep them in well oxygenated water because I I when I first started taking big channel cats back to my house to my tank, some of them would decide that they were going to not be able to write themselves and that that is in the cooler with an aerator cool uh -huh. water like else. but for some reason you get some of them they just want to give up so i would take them down to my local river which is connected to the illinois river which is the mother river which i kept them out of and i, I would uh -huh. wait down there until they decided they were going to write themselves but okay. for some reason they'll get a little stressy unless they're mm -hmm. back in natural situation and for whatever reason they want to go belly up I, I had a couple of them die on me and that that was pretty uh disappointing to me so i i, I kind of learned how to do it uh, if i'm going to take fish home that's interesting that's good to know Ooh, all right so we're at six hours guys creole he's still catching fish he's still what? catching fish a little bit out of time but we still catching fish yeah, are you uh 
you want to go a little longer? What's going on, man? I'm gonna let you make the call. You're the one on the river. I'm uh, I'm already out here. We can go a little more. Sounds good to me, man. You guys uh, in chat want to hang around? We're down to 27 people. We're still getting uh, people in and out, which is kind of cool to see. Uh, how are you doing, Tim? You hanging in there all right? I'm a trooper. I'm fine. All right. I'm going to take a quick break, if that's okay. Yeah, that's uh, great. Jeremy, will you talk to Tim for a little while? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. All right, excellent. I'll be back in, I don't know, three minutes. Yeah, that'll work. So, Jeremy. Yes, sir. Did you did I miss when you guys held that fish up for the camera? Uh, yeah, had, we had him in the camera. You might have missed it. He was uh thirty one pounds. Okay, nice, nice fish, great fish. Yeah. And I tell you that that's almost every time we come fishing, it's the same story. We always seem to catch a nice fish in the middle of the day. Yeah, uh, the middle of the day can be really good. It really can. I mean, even in the summertime, I always. Not always. When those fish are, are showing a penchant for, you know, biting right before dark to after dark and it's super hot out, yeah, I'll, I'll go a little bit late, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But I'm very glad that a lot of times I'll get out there early because I think that especially big fish like that uh, super monster that I put up on YouTube, if I hadn't have been fishing during the day, I probably wouldn't have caught that fish because that fish was active. He was in an active position and ended up catching that fish, and that's how it, that's how it went. And that that was middle of the day. Yeah, there, there's been and and really all all times a year. There's been many times we've gone out catch 10, 20, even thirty pound fish, and then and then you know later on in the day the bite kind of slows down, but that's when we yep. catch fifty pounders. Okay. Okay. It, it, Very interesting. I, I think your whole fishing situation down there is is completely interesting. It's got a wide variability. It's got a lot of different current. It's got you know what we talked about on the phone. It, you know, there's a lot of fingers and a lot of and, and, and we actually talked about a spot where the water actually runs in reverse. It comes off of the Mississippi, which all of our stuff. There's nothing up here or even from the tip of Illinois all the way up that actually comes out of the Mississippi River. That's really cool. Yeah, and 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 that's that's exactly where we are right now. What I'm fishing is water that's coming out of the Mississippi going into the Atchafalaya River. Okay. Now, let me ask you this one. Do you ever fish above the dam on the other side? I have never fished above the dam. It's extremely extremely dangerous. Okay. That dam. Okay. Is it uh, is it extremely uh, dangerous because of what situation? Because of the suction pulling in. Okay, and as true with most dams, but if you watch the Catfish Brothers, there will be uh, a situation where you can feel comfortable enough to anchor above the dam and throw in enough that uh, I would feel I feel comfortable doing it, and especially okay. if I'm going to be running a, a trolling motor. Now, if it's if it's got that much water pouring through it, and you know it's all crazy current up there, yeah, I'd probably either back off from it or whatever. But what yeah. I'm saying, uh, when the water's coming off, what's that? Probably sits about, I'll say, half a mile back off the river down the channel. The, the dam okay. isn't, let's say, right on the bank. The, the okay. inlet channel about half a mile long. Then, okay. then the dam is there, and then it's uh, I'm gonna say four or five miles down the channel till it gets to the Chafalaya River. Okay. Now, let me ask you this one. So you've got water pouring off of the Mississippi going through this hydroelectric dam, and then I see down river, it's basically a channel. Where does it, does it enter back into the main Mississippi? No, no, it, it, it goes into the Chafalaya River. Okay, so the Chafalaya, then the Chafalaya ends up going out to... Gulf of Mexico. Does it... It goes out to the Gulf of Mexico, so that's that's interesting. Yeah, it goes to the Gulf. So how far from the Gulf are you? If you were to go on the Atchafalaya and get – how far do you get into brackish water? Uh, I know I know what, what the, the, the line where you leave the Atchafalaya River and enter the bay in the Gulf is 172 miles. Okay, so that's quite a way. So you yeah. are uh, better off not, not chasing fish down in that tidal water. Yeah. The, I know one thing, as far as blues goes, 
they can tolerate quite a bit of salinity and they will start, uh, you know, proliferating in that, uh, that brackish water. They'll feed on crabs and mullet and all kinds of crazy stuff. And there's some really big fish on the Mississippi, I believe, down in almost the brackish water area. There is, uh, on the James, any of those rivers that empty into the ocean that has blues. It's a uh, it's, it's pretty cool thing. Yeah, there's, there's really, really, really big blues. Uh, I got a good friend of mine. Uh, they go fishing a lot down what's called the Bayou Manchac. Uh, okay. Like the, pretty much due south of here. Almost due south of here, almost right on the Gulf. And yeah. They go, they go catch them on really, really big shrimp. And he swears there's big blues down there than there is around here. Could be. Could be. Because uh, for some reason, I mean, just like uh, I think Two Stands is in the chat right now. And uh -huh. he fishes more of the upper third of the James. The James isn't all that long. And I can't remember yeah, exactly yeah. how many miles it is, 25, 30 miles. But uh, there was guys even, you know, 15 years ago do going all the way down to the brackish water stuff. I've got a couple other friends that fish on rivers that end up in the ocean. And that brackish yeah. water stuff, it, it ends up holding bigger blues. Blues, to me, migrate downstream better than they migrate upstream. It's like there's a short amount of time that they migrate upstream and then they kind of travel back. Okay. And so I've always been of the opinion that if I was on one of those tidal rivers that I would want to concentrate on the tidal section more than I would the upper section for a lot of part of the year. Okay. I got you. They're, they're, they're just going to stay further south, let's say longer than they will coming up north. Yes, but they'll still come up north because they're highly, highly mo mobile, you know, yeah. and, and it's I've got evidence of that because I live on the farthest pinnacle, you know, the farthest reach of your river you're fishing on right now yeah. is that the big fish come up there uh, once that water gets low and stabilized. But before that, there's not a big population of big fish up there. And then once that water starts cooling, my population of big fish drops to about 10% for that last month or so. And then they're gone almost all together. And not only is there evidence from what I've been doing, but also tournaments that they have run at certain times a year do completely terrible after uh, 50 degrees, after that water drops to 50 degrees or before it gets to 65, 70. And, you know, higher water, the poorer the uh, uh, population is up here. So, I'm really getting that idea that the blue cat's penchant isn't like a channel cat and a flathead. A channel cat and a flathead gets high water and it wants to go upstream. I think high water blues stay or migrate downstream. They like to move on that level, that level, nice medium stuff. And I knew some tournament guys that were probably some of the best in the nation at the time. They were really good at blue cats and they used to fish below dams like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to throw even giant johnson silver minnows up into the mississippi river dams 25 yeah. 30 foot of fast water and they were catching 30 and 40 pound blues as fast as you could do it but wow. they did that so much they knew when those blues and they would use bait as well moon eye skipjack stuff like that they knew when those blues were there and when they weren't and and mark uh farrow you might have even heard of him if you've been in the catfish long enough mm. uh mark uh this guy, he really knew when those populations were below these dams because he, he would fish like five of them from Keokuk all the way down past uh, uh, St. Louis, basically, Quincy. He would do the same thing in Quincy, do the same thing in other things. And, and he knew when that population was not upstream, they were downstream because all they'd have to do is go in there and see if that pattern worked. And you see, some, some of the fellas that kind of, you know, helped us out when we first started, you know, letting us know what the fish do around here. It's the same thing. They've been doing it for so long that they've got it patterned. They know what time of year yep. to be there, know what the water's doing, what what bias that the water's coming out of into the river. They just they just know. You know, they know when to be there. Yep. Success versus failure makes smart men of all of us. Yeah, exactly. And the best way to that is time on the water, correct, gentlemen? It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> The only you can you can that. you can learn a lot more these days by not even being on the water. You can be an armchair cat fisherman now and be pretty close. But time on the water, there's no substitute for that. I mean, yeah, you can, I, because you have to develop your instincts as well. I mean, it, yeah, absolutely. It, I'm so grateful for those opportunities now, especially like I mentioned earlier with the pandemic and stuff, and yeah. the way it's been affecting our business. I've still been able to stay active in the catfishing world through YouTube 
through my live shows and stuff. I'm grateful for everybody that tunes in. Uh, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity, which we wouldn't have it. Back in the day, you'd just go crack a book like a in fisherman with a, or an epic catfishing book. Yeah. Yep. Couple of those good old books. I got them here somewhere in my desk. I used to have them over there. The wife put them away somewhere, though. God bless her soul. But uh, uh, there's a lot of resources out there online and and on YouTube, and and you guys are both great resources. I'm I'm glad to to spend some time with you guys. I'm honored. So, well, we're we're happy. I am. I can always. I'm happy to share, and I'm happy to learn from everybody else because I mean, there's things that I will never get to in my lifetime that are cool and neat and interesting you know i love i love watching that stuff where you know there, there's guys like jeremy and there's guys you know out on the east coast and they're doing all this really cool crazy stuff i mean i've just now run into a few other catfish sites that are really good they do a really good job they're not they weren't in my feed before but now they are it's, re it's really nice uh you know and and they're, they're i mean there's some guys using you know, blue crabs for bait and catching giant blues. There's guys out there, you know, using all kinds of crazy stuff. Catfish like to eat. They do. They do. <laughs> kind of like cat fishermen. Yeah, I kind of like to eat too. That was my next. That was my next line going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> Just like cat fishermen, they like to eat, and sometimes like cat fishermen, they ain't real picky about what they're going to eat either. Yep, that's right. Mm. That is right. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, man, where does time go? We're already at six and a quarter hours. Oh, we'll oh. hang out for another 15 minutes. What do you say, Jeremy? That, that works for me. 15 minutes. That's perfect. I don't want to wear out my welcome with you guys. I hey, love you talking to you. Welcome with me. You ain't going to worry about that. <laughs> uh, I got some stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, me and Jeremy got some plans. Hopefully, they'll come to fruition. Hopefully, yeah. we'll get that Hagen versus Jeremy back on soon. Uh, I'd spoken to him a little while ago about that. We're looking forward to that with the one versus one. Uh, what do you got going on? on uh, what do you have coming up with your channel, Tim? Oh, my. Well, I am about ready to release a video that took me about 25 hours to do. And believe wow. it or not, it is a it is a sinker porn video. And it's 25 minutes long. Really? Kind of, you know, I watched a, a lot of sinker porn videos and various things and whatever, you know. And of course, the sinker porn video is kind of done in the epic style. So get uh -huh. ready for a few laughs and a few, you know, stuff, but also to learn a few things, especially about, and what it is, is it's, I had to separate it because I, I, we actually, Sean and I actually filmed pouring these and these the same day. Mm -hmm. But it's more about getting, you know, using old school stuff to pour big honking sinkers and cool. big sinkers are harder than little sinkers little sinkers you get your thing heated up you throw it no big deal but these things here there, there's a little bit to, of an art to it and okay. uh, we we show you know getting the stuff out and we show doing the you know getting it poured and then you know all the stuff that goes along with it so I, that's pretty exciting because i really haven't done any uh gear or you know hacks or you know any of that stuff uh type video so that was our first one so I, i'm getting ready to release that right after this it took 11 hours on my uh internet to upload that upload it wow it, it was crazy crazy stuff. <laughs> you I filming in 1080p or have you tried 4k 1080p uh, I, actually actually i do form it uh uh my black is at 1440 and my silver is at 1080 because okay. silver doesn't have an option to go to 1440. Mm -hmm. i could throw my black down to uh 1080 but it seems to want to every time the battery runs out it wants to uh which i'm no camera expert yet i say yet but uh it, it wants to default back to 1440 anyway and I had a problem the last time I went to the Tennessee River. I ended up touching the screen on my silver because it was the takedown camera. Uh -huh. And I accidentally hit the 4K button. Well, the 4K button ran me out of, of, uh, of space on my giant card in like an hour. And in so no I, time, yeah. All that stuff. So, yeah, I'm still figuring that stuff out. Yeah, and, then, and also YouTube, if you're just filming for that, it downverts it until you get a whole bunch of... I, I think the more uh, subscribers you get, the more views you get, they, they, they give you a better compression ratio, but oh. that's just me suspect. Laura DeFore has a message for you, Jeremy. I don't know if you want to look at the screen or not. Yep. 
Phil needs to come home and help build my chicken coop. <laughs> Is that where you're getting your bait for the rest of the summer, straight from the coop? Ah, man, you, man, don't say that to her. She's going to be protecting until she... Oh, Lord. How about you, Jeremy? What do you got coming up on your channel? Well, I got a lot more people that's going to come fish with me, a lot more family members, uh, hopefully a few uh, a few guest stars. If if half the people show up that say they're coming, I'm going to have some good videos, that's for sure. Heck, uh, if, if I was closer, I'd be down there just to eat with you, my man. Uh, and, well, and we will do more uh, cooking stuff. Uh, very soon, I will be doing a live crawfish boil for everybody. Nice. That's been requested nice. times. Uh, and and you know a little bit of different types of fishing. I mean, of course, the main meat of the channel will always be catfish. But hey, we go noodling for alligator gar. We uh, fish for uh, you know brim, sackle, a little, little bit of everything. So we we we're gonna show everybody everything of what we do down here. That's fantastic. And 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 with that stuff coming up, I want I want to segue into asking everybody to make sure if you're not subscribed to these two gentlemen's channels links are in the description please do so you will not be disappointed i guarantee you'll be entertained uh from here on out so uh make sure you give them a subscribe i'm sure they'll appreciate it and while you're here if you give me a like if you're not subscribed to my channel please subscribe we appreciate it very much so uh if you're interested in uh uh, the hats I got left, which is the one I'm wearing on my head. I think that's all I got left. I got some pink beanies left. You can always message me through one of my social media. Uh, I can tell you how to pick one of them up. Uh, there are no more black beanies. Uh, I think those are sold out for the year. Uh, hopefully, we don't get enough weather to to to, <laughs> to, to make it needed. Uh, but I think we're uh, we're on the downward uh, uh, side of the 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 winter weather so I'm, I'm looking forward to better weather hey ryan's in the house ryan what's going on my friend ryan from uh setting hooks and crossing eyes red beard i'm sure you've heard of him right yep sure have. Yep. fishes with jonathan he's a good guy i got to meet him for the first time uh what was it last week ryan he picked up one of the last couple of beanies it was great to see him um he really likes fishing floats do you do any fishing under bobbers and stuff for big catfish Tim, talk to me. Uh, you yeah. know, I used to. I used to do a lot of it, uh, especially in situations with a little bit slower water. I definitely uh, used to. I keep balloons. Every once in a while, I'll go to a power plant lake. I'll always mm -hmm. throw out a big slip float around. Uh, Sean does a lot more of it on the Hennepin Canal for flatheads, and he has great success on that slower water with flatheads and floats, especially mm -hmm. uh, you know the bigger bobbers and stuff like that. Uh, I wanted to say something earlier about what I'm going to do. He asked about my channel, what I have coming okay. up. I Please am do. Going, if you looked at my channel right now, you would think I'm just a blue cat fisherman. But uh, my main thing is actually flatheads. It's just I didn't get any. I didn't get any film of any flatheads of any note because I kind of started a little bit late. Sean finally convinced mm -hmm. me that flathead season's almost over where we're at. So um, I'm going to. Concentrate on flatheads, but before that, I'm going to concentrate on some channel cat slash flathead type stuff up here in the north region. And then by somewhere around the first weekend of August, I'm going to transfer back over to blues. So it'll be channel cats, flatheads, then blues. And we're going to do some crazy stuff a lot of people have never seen. I got some really cool ideas about as far as uh, filming and some, you know, it's not like I'm going to go out and get a, a drone or anything, but. I am going to use some pretty cool stuff. You know what's the best thing about, well, I wouldn't recommend getting a drone. I would recommend getting a friend who has a drone. Yeah. Yes. I would. I was, give, I was given some drone footage for some of my ice fishing videos that I'm waiting for the opportune time to, oh, to use that yeah. stuff. And, and, and some of that B-roll does look really good. And I was fortunate enough to the, that the person that got this stuff for me was a, actually a professional photographer. So man, she made me look a hell of a lot better than I do in real life. I got to tell you that. So God bless her little heart. <laughs> so, so Redbeard just said on there, he's got to film me pulling a 70 pound flathead. I am a little apprehensive about filming flatheads because most of my big ones, once you're past about June one, you know, it's basically going to be at night and I'm not a huge fan of, 
you know, mm-hmm. filming at night. So I'm going to have to work a little bit on my lighting. I'm going to have to work a little bit on yep. my cameras to work a little bit on there because there was a lot of night fish that I couldn't even show because it's just a mess. I mean, especially when I first started filming. So I, I got a little better idea how to do it and how to set that up. But, you know, if you pull up onto a spot at night, it's really hard to show anybody. It's just, it's just blackness. So, you know, you can describe what you're fishing, but it's really difficult to tell. Yeah, and also, and if you do get the light, it doesn't look very good unless you... Right, right. You got to do a lot of experimenting. I mean, yeah. it took me a while to get all that down. I have I have megabytes, megabytes of night fishing stuff that it, uh, yeah, it's just it's terrible. garbage. Can't even yeah, use that, it. That, that was the Try. biggest thing that I needed to overcome. I got a lot of footage. It just doesn't doesn't look good. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, the stuff you film in really looks stupendous. I, I don't know how else to say it. It really looks fantastic. Where did you learn to do that stuff? Uh, is it something that comes natural? Uh, how is the learning curve and so on? Anything you can help yeah. us out with that? I've always been a kind of creative person. That's, mm-hmm. you know, my, my job, I'm a furniture designer, uh, you know, and that it, I, I don't know how to explain it, but a straight white male doesn't usually end up being a furniture designer. Just okay. to say that. It, people are surprised when I go to the places that sell my furniture. They're not. A, they're expecting somebody off of Bravo Channel, not me. Mm-hmm. And they're like, really? You know. But anyways, uh, I've always been kind of that artistic person. I, I did a, a lot of that stuff, so I kind of know what I like to see. It's just fast-forwarding my mentality with the with the stuff, you know, because I, I got really good at photography and I used to take a lot of pictures that got put in a lot of magazines, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen some somewhere, you know, the, the North American fishermen. I, and I used to do the, the, the drawings on the computer that went with my North American fishermen articles, you know, uh-huh. you know, even the underwater stuff. So I got into the higher quality type stuff and it's basically, I just film stuff like I want to see it, I guess. Okay. You know, as far as quality goes, as far as whatever. And I'm still learning because there's some things I'm really not happy with, but I'm my biggest critic. You know, when, when I don't get the right shot or, you know, I don't get the right, you know, and, and the, the especially at night, because a lot of times in your camera or with your eyes, it seems like there's a lot more light than what the, what the camera can see because it doesn't mm-hmm. have the ability like your eyeballs do. So I'm thinking I'm getting great footage and it's terrible. And, and so now we're starting to, you know, get that light, you know, even uh, with a, a, let's just say there's a sunset and you're juxtaposed on that sunset. It looks beautiful, but there's so much shit. So we've started to turn the lights on, even when you don't think you need them. Mm-hmm. The other thing about uh, photo stuff versus the regular GoPros or whatever. Mm-hmm. With my program, I am unable to adjust the contrast and the light very well. So it's kind of, it is what it is. Maybe I'll have to graduate to a better editing software so I can actually right. kind of lighten things up or darken things down, but mm-hmm. I don't really have a lot of options. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is, it is more difficult. The learning curve is kind of huge because the GoPros are kind of finicky. They'll overheat really easily. But I've they been getting will. a lot of advice from like uh, like Flint Hill. Flint Hill is like kind of a master in all that stuff. So I talked to him on the phone. And he's telling me what I need to get. Now I just need mm-hmm. to have the time and the inclination and, and to be able to actually afford it. <laughs> you know, because yeah. some stuff's pretty darn expensive. Uh-huh. I would love to shoot videos like John B. does. Honestly, absolutely. But holy moly, that is a whole nother animal. I mean, you know, there, there's a, a couple of young guys in England that are carp fishermen. Yes. I think it's Alex and Carl. Carl and Alex. I watch their stuff all the time, and I am. I I, I love their 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 work. You know, it might not be my type of. Well, actually, it is kind of. My, I like all sorts of fishing, sure. but they do a really good job. At, at the way they film and stuff so real yeah. happy with what they do and gene what is it jay simmons siemens they do a fantastic job filming stuff yeah. up north um yeah. so yeah there's there's a lot of examples out there but your stuff stands out very much so so i just wanted to make sure that i let you know that so with North, northwoods angling does a great job too i don't, Absolutely. I don't know if you mentioned them but i mean i i was impressed when when i saw that and i'm like wow that's 
really some pretty great photography, great editing. I know how much work is involved. I know mm -hmm. all that stuff. There's a lot of same with Dieter. Oh, jeez, Dieter's got her down to a science. I yeah. think he could go shoot a video, edit it, and put it out the same day. There's no yeah. way I can do that. Not yeah, even he's, close. He's quite the machine. It takes me a while to get stuff done. It takes me a day to edit and another day to get a thumbnail and my all the other work that's 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 involved. Luckily, in making luckily I got good with Photoshop when I used to do advertising shots for the company. Mm -hmm work for and so i can make a thumbnail i mean i'm not saying it doesn't take me any time but i can make really cool thumbnails i don't need to uh rely on someone else or someone else mm -hmm. with a program or whatever because if i didn't have photoshop already that's expensive it holy, sure is holy. i mean my version of, it, of that was basically purchased when i was in the business of that and thousand dollars and oh my gosh if I have a computer that goes down and I'm out of Photoshop, I'll have to buy one because, you know, I, I, I don't know what I do with a regular and even though Jonathan seems to do good with just his phone and the just WTF yeah. <laughs> and, and the red yeah. arrow that goes, it's, it's, it's they, they, uh, there, there's some programs out there that do a lot of the work. Then the, the, they they call it AI, but it actually isn't. But there's a lot of programs out there that can manage a lot of that stuff for you yeah. and automate it. So, which helps. I use a program called GIMP for my photo stuff. I'm right. not really the greatest. One of the reasons I got into this was to try and be a little more artistic. I'm like the furthest from it. So, uh, it's been a cheap, uh, a steep learning curve for me, definitely. But uh, I'm telling you, it, my stuff looks a hell of a lot better than it did a year ago, and that's not saying much but it's saying a lot at the same time so yeah i've come a little way since my first couple you know i'm, I'm getting better my music i i'm you know uh, flint hill shared with me a good site that i could go get better music than what i had you know because mm -hmm. i either had this just the terrible i movie stuff the really cheesy stuff or i had like this epic orchestra music that's all i had that's all i had to pick from. yeah so now I, I've got a little bit of banjo stuff. I've got a friend of mine who actually wrote a few, you know, jingles and he recorded them and sent it to me. So I, I'm, I'm really happy with that because, I mean, after you know, it, it's a viewing experience as well as an informational thing. So if a guy can put and I'm not the guy to do like strict information, um, you know, like I don't want to stare into the camera and go, OK, guys, this is what you got to do. This is what I do. You got to set up this rig like this, and, and this is my rod, and this is my reel. I want to leave little tidbits of information along the whole length of that. And if people want to pay attention and get that, they don't have mm -hmm. to have the geese, you know, basically staring them down, saying, "Okay, this is this is the rod." And you know, I, I don't in myself. I don't enjoy watching videos that are strictly uh, gear stuff. So I kind of shy away from it a little bit. Not, I mean, there's guys that love gear stuff. They do. They they they, they really do gear stuff, and they want to know what you know rod and reel reels using. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I, I'm more of let me put that thing in my hand. If it feels balanced, if it feels good, I'm gonna use. But I don't. I don't really remember all. That I, I consider yeah. myself a hybrid of it all. I, I from my technical background and stuff, I can't help but being a gear fanatic. So yeah, there's yeah. that part of that, and there's always the adventure part of me that wants to go out and find those fish and and put some put them on the deck. Uh, so that's yeah. that's kind of where I stand. I consider myself a hybrid of the two, but I get what no, you're that's saying. That's a good place to be. It really is because I mean, somebody that's skilled at a lot of things can do a lot of things. You know, if if you're uh, if you're just a science guy but can't do math, well, you're in trouble. You know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just how it is. Word. And a well, lot of us artistic people are terrible at math, but we're good at And there's very rare, rare science guys uh, that are also good at art. It's usually language and Hello. Art, but they're really good at things. So I kind of got mm -hmm. a hybrid of all that. So, you know, I'm good with my hands. I can build furniture. I can do all that stuff. But I also am artistic in the way that when I was in college, I used to paint pictures uh, actual landscapes big ones on canvas and i used to sell them and it helped put me through college very cool yeah so you are very artistic let's check in with jeremy one last time yeah. um hey palmetto what's going on hey mike turner what's going on buckeye catfishing we got a resurgence of people in here uh what's going on guys we're getting ready to call it for the day i want to check in with jeremy jeremy how you doing bud uh, we're uh we're still here i had a uh, i had something messing with the donkey bait again but it's i guess i'm just feeding them all right, let's, let's go to, we're going to go to a, here, why don't you get in front of the camera? We'll go to a solo so we can 
check in with you and you can say hello to everybody. Which, uh, give me a second. Let me switch my cameras up. All right. Sounds good, my friend. <clears throat> Done. There he is. There it is. Make sure I don't hit the wrong buttons. There uh, he is, suntan and all. I was gonna say because that, that's, that's wind burn today. Wind burn we're today. Pale, pale. <laughs> up here. That is that is wind burn. Uh, my friend, it was fun fishing with you today. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely, man. It was good hanging out. Got a whole lot of whole lot of good information today. You know, kind of with what Tim was talking about. It kind of guided a little bit of what we were doing and kind of let me know that we're doing the right thing. So that's always good to know. Very cool. I know I had fun talking with you both. I know me and Tim kind of dominated the conversation today, but you were concentrating on that fishing, which is good. And I have to admit, you do look good in that hat. It keeps stealing the, the picture away. Like that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to get Tim one of them, too, if you'll wear a hat. You wear hats, oh, Tim? I, I do occasionally, yeah. All right. We'll get you one of them. We'll take care of you. Speak, speaking of hats, uh, if I can get a chance next week, um, dropping off some hats to somebody local. We're going to have some Creole catfishing hats in not too long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that right. looks delicious. I'm going to okay. have to get me one of them. That looks delicious for catfishing, that's for yeah, sure. That's right. I'm uh, not. Look at that glowing eye. That's very cool. Glowing, big honking eye. That's great. Man. All right, guys. Well, I want to thank you guys for being on the show. I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, it's been a great day of fishing. I learned a lot. I hope everybody else did. Uh, make sure you uh, subscribe to my guest channels, Creole Catfishing, uh, Epic Catfish. Links are in the description. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Uh, stay warm if you're in the north. I'm going to try. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Hey, Jeremy. <laughs>